Okay, folks, it is uh, 6.03, and uh, we have a long evening ahead of us, so I think we'll get started. Uh, Mr. Deputy Clerk, do we have a quorum? Mayor Patterson, we do have quorum. Uh, in attendance, in addition to yourself tonight, are uh, Councillor Hutchison, Councillor Holland, Council or Deputy Mayor Hill, Councillor Kiley, Councillor McLaren, Councillor Neal, Councillor Oosterhoff, Councillor Osanek, and from staff in attendance, is Lanny Hurdle, Chief Administrative Officer, Paige Agnew, Commissioner, Community Services, Brad Joyce, Commissioner, Transportation and Public Works, John Bolognone, City Clerk, Lana Folds, Director, Financial Services, Jenna Morley, Director, Legal Services and City Solicitor, Ruth Nordegraff, Director, Housing and Social Services, Scarlett Isles, Manager, Financial Planning, Heather Scranage, Manager, Housing and Homelessness. Our meeting host tonight is Elizabeth Fawcett. I'm Derek O'Shea, the Acting Deputy City Clerk. Our technology associate is Colin Taylor. Other staff in attendance include Joanne Boris, Housing Program Administrator, and Curtis Smith, Director of Licensing and Enforcement. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we were not meeting committee the whole closed meeting. Uh, so we'll move to approve of the adds. There are four sets of adds that we'll look to approve together. There are a number of additional delegations, communications, there's a, a supplemental report, uh, a motion to resolve into the committee of the whole after the delegations are over. Uh, can I have a mover and a seconder for the uh, added? It's moved by Councilor Neal, second by Councilor Osanek. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, and that's carried, thank you. Are there any disclosures of potential pecuniary interest? <coughs> okay. Uh, seeing none, we have no presentations tonight, so we will move to delegations. I will just make a, a couple of comments first before we begin. Um, my hope is to be able to get through everything tonight. That being said, we have 19 delegations, a staff presentation, and then deliberations. So if we get to the point where it's very clear there's nowhere, we're, we're not going to make it until really, really, really late into the evening, then I will recess and reconvene at 6 p.m. tomorrow. It's a long weekend. I prefer not to do that, but we may have to. Okay? So with that, we'll move right to, uh, to delegations. Uh, first up, we'll invite uh, Megan Knott, Executive Director of Tourism Kingston, who will appear before Council to speak to Clause 1B of Report 66 from the CAO and with respect to the encampment, pilot project, and homelessness services options. Uh, just a note to all of our delegations this evening that you have up to five minutes. Uh, and then I will open up the floor to questions from members of council. Ms. Knott, welcome, and you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor Patterson and members of council. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> I'm here tonight to um, speak on behalf of Tourism Kingston and in discussion and consultation with members of the community and our board, Tourism Kingston is very aware that there's no simple solution for the report and the content that we're talking about this evening. The supply of housing, mental health issues, and addictions, they're all part of what we know to be a complex problem. <clears throat> Tourism Kingston, however, wants to continue and collaborate to support community uh, colleagues and help find solutions for our most vulnerable community members. We know the growing issue across the province and quite frankly across Canada suggests there's gaps in community service. We want to be clear at tonight's delegation that we're here to support the work of the many professionals involved who are trying to address the crisis and we hope to use our voice to advocate for those that need us to increase funding and support from all levels of government. Next slide, please. Tonight I wanted to present to you the common um, themes, questions, uh, feedback we get. Of course, we manage uh, the social media sites and platforms for Visit Kingston. Visit Kingston is not uh, necessarily a tourism platform. It's also a, a member of our community, members of our community. It's a resident platform as well. I have two slides with very high level and what I would say very common uh, responses, especially regarding the downtown core. I won't read them all because we don't have time, but essentially um, it encapsulates the the thought process that whether it's a resident or whether it's a tourist, there is uh, an acute awareness that our downtown needs some support, that there is uh, community awareness that safety is an issue, that the, cleansing, that the cleanliness of our downtown is at a pivotal state, and that perception is that 
you know, that what we used to have and oftentimes labeled as pre-pandemic needs to come back, that we, ha we don't have what we had pre-pandemic. Uh, one quote in particular um, is that, it come view our homeless city and, um, you know, so, so sad. We have nothing to really offer in the downtown anymore. And the rebuttals to that are pretty, um, you know, hard to really rebrand or turn the conversation uh, in a way that suggests that we are an inviting, safe and um, inclusive city. And we're really looking for direction tonight. I had to re-navigate and reposition um, the comments online to be more inviting uh, and safe downtown experience. We really only see this specific to the downtown, not citywide. Next slide, please. Not only do we hear from, next slide, please. Not only do we hear from <clears throat> uh, visitors and residents, we also hear from downtown business owners. These are often um, you know, partners of a lot of community uh, organizations that you're going to hear tonight, we we share the, the same stakeholders, quite frankly. But whether it's local downtown business owners, whether it's visitor service employees at Two and Nine Ontario, whether it's local attraction owners, the commonality is that sometimes um, business owners have had to been forced to lock their doors. Sometimes it's that we are oftentimes actually uh, we're reaching out to community supports, i.e. 911, because uh, staff have been threatened. Um, oftentimes, there is aggressive and violent behavior, there's illicit drug use, uh, there's death threats, and that's a common theme that we hear time and time and time again. Next slide, please. Community safety is a pivotal point in the downtown core. Um, we know that um, in, in the vicinity of just the tourism visitor center, which again is at 209 Ontario Street specifically, there is uh, oftentimes use of drugs, drugs trafficked right at, sort of in broad daylight, often pushed on visitors. There is an increased amount of theft. There's an increased amount of altercations uh, and the health and safety of all members of our community. I'm not just suggesting that this is the health and safety of a certain um, area of community, including vulnerable populations uh, we wanna recognize uh, needs to be addressed because it's a real concern. Next 30, slide, please. 30 seconds. Sure. Um, actually, we can go all the way down to uh, slide 13. So we recognize that um, a lot of uh, organizations are uh, bringing industry-wide concerns. What I'll leave you with tonight is that the business community, as you'll hear in the next delegations, has gathered to call for immediate action from the province and support the city of Kingston to enact bylaws, as well as long-term compassionate solutions that'll assist in making our streets safe. Okay. Thank you. But thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions from council? Uh, if I could just see the Zoom screen, unless there's someone um, online. Yes, Councillor Sanek. Uh, through your worship, thanks so much for all this information. I wasn't aware of um, uh, all those uh, postings um, that Tourism Kingston is receiving about our downtown. I know that City Council, we have received some emails um, directly from tourists. I, I just wondered... Um, talking to the other cities, um, if they're experiencing the same with their downtown uh, post-pandemic, especially the other cities um, around us that um, have a really strong tourist tourism um, industry like Kingston. Yeah, through you, Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Sanic. That's a great question. Absolutely. So the Ontario mayors of big cities, as well as the Ontario Downtown Business Improvement Area, as well as TIO, so the Tourism Industry of Ontario, they've all come together to recognize um, the severity of the vulnerable population problem. And it really has um, made it very... Um, difficult on many communities and yes tourism driven communities especially it seems but probably because we're networked enough that we talk to one another um, and those are the daily conversations we're having with each other but certainly i think there is a really strong dialogue between those types of associations to try to leverage our power in voice and number to try to have the right conversations with the right 
uh, levels of government at the right time to ask for the correct support. So to answer your point, yes, uh, we're not in this alone. Uh, the online comments you see are oftentimes, you know, repeatable in other um, major cities that have a strong tourism entity, but it's the residents, interestingly enough, uh, that comment more on our social channels, and it's the tourists we hear of uh, or from after their experience. Okay, there are no other questions. Ms. Not, thank you very much. Uh, so our next delegation is Mary Jo Currier, Executive Director of Downtown Kingston BIA. Uh, who will again appear to speak uh, to Council with respect to the encampment pilot project and homelessness services options. Ms. Currier, welcome, and you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor Patterson and Council. Um, in 2022, COVID-19 left downtown streets across North America abandoned for an ex extended period of time, allowing for unsafe and unwelcome behavior to take over with little to no consequences. We're on the cusp of the first summer at full capacity since 2019. Securing the streets of downtown Kingston is a priority, making it safe, clean, welcoming, and inviting for everyone. Over the past year, I've fielded numerous calls, emails, texts, and visits from property and business owners, locals, and visitors, varying from genuine concern to anger and frustration. I'm here tonight representing the downtown business and property owners that want to see improvements in the safety and security of downtown for the enjoyment of their families, their employees, their customers, and themselves. Incidents linked to men mental health issues or drug use, often involving aggressive and threatening behavior, have sharply increased and continue to increase in downtown Kingston. To be very clear, I'm not talking about a population of people, but rather the behavior of a few. There are many individuals who are part of the fabric of our community who would be considered vulnerable that are approachable and amicable. When I'm alerted to or encounter issues that require attention, my response is to attend myself and to see if I can help, to call outreach and or bylaw, and in some cases call or report to the police. Many incidences do not need police attendance. Even with these resources at my fingertips, there are frequent challenges, many that span over several days. Increasingly, downtown business owners, their employees, residents, and visitors are left to fend for themselves in precarious and unsafe situations involving individuals who are presenting as unpredictable and requiring a level of support that is far beyond the capabilities of our downtown business and residential community. We at the BIA, along with our members, try to provide everyone with a fair and equitable access to a wide range of locations and services in a welcoming environment that's free from discrimination and harassment. As the downtown business community continues to recover from the devastating effects of COVID-19, they need to be able to confidently offer a safe, enjoyable experience for everyone without threatening, abusive, discriminatory, or harassing language, damage, misuse, or theft of materials, equipment, and property, disruptive or intrusive behavior, open use of selling of illegal drugs, open use or uh, selling of illegal drugs, Individuals entering businesses or service areas while intoxicated or under the influence of an illegal substance, garbage strewn on the sidewalks after the departure of an individual or group, shopping carts and pallets made into mini encampments for days outside of business locations, individuals passed out from drug use on the sidewalk or in flower beds, defecating and urinating in flower beds, store entrances, carriageways and alleyways, unmonitored, unmonitored health mental health issues such as auditory delusions and hallucinations, which can be disruptive and distressing for most members of the public. Unpredictable drug-induced behavior such as yelling, delusions, weapons, and death threats. Compassionate, respectful, appropriate care of the vulnerable in our streets is important to our community members and to me personally. The safety and security of our property business owners and their staff, residents, and visitors to downtown Kingston are just as important. What I've highlighted above is increasingly disruptive behavior that degrades the quality of life for all downtown community members and visitors. I think we can all agree that there's a complex crisis across North America regarding mental health, addictions, and access to affordable housing that will not be solved overnight. 
We also recognize that this challenge is not unique to the city of Kingston. As Megan mentioned, OBIA, a network of over 225 BIAs across Ontario, has partnered with Ontario's big city mayors in calling for an emergency meeting with the province to address the chronic homelessness, mental health, safety, and addictions crisis overwhelming our communities. I'm here tonight, along with our partners, to highlight the seriousness of the situation we're facing downtown in the core of our city and the lack of resources to help manage what we all agree is a complex issue. Although many items brought forward will 30 seconds. To address some of the foundational challenges, we need immediate, significant investment, 24 seven social programs, police presence and other social infrastructure to help reduce the frequency and escalation of incidences involving individuals in need. Please carefully consider all staff recommendations tonight as we work together to manage this complex challenge. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any questions from Council? Council Neal? Yes, thank you very much. I understand from talking to a couple of your, uh, of, of people in, in the downtown core that there is a committee that was established that uh, includes many business people, the chair of your board, and other people, um, and that there are a couple of, as I understand it, a couple of, uh, of uh, public uh, assistance people that have been hired to work the core. Is, is that accurate? Um, answer to the first question is we have what's called a vulnerable advisory working group. We've met, I think, three times and then a round table started that conversation with a very small number of our, uh, of our um, community. We have 700 members and there were, the, the round table probably had close to 20. The uh, subsequent meetings had under 10. And we did talk extensively about some of the challenges and uh, and the fact that we we want to be um, sensitive to the needs of the vulnerable population. In answer to the second question, we March first, council approved um, the downtown improvement plan, which also included two the hiring of two street outreach individuals that uh, have been hired by home base. Um, we are working hard with home base as well as police as well as bylaw to try and come up with a protocol that is actually successful in uh, a, a, on a regular basis and it's it's not there yet. I appreciate that. My final question is that um, I understand that there was a phone number that was uh, made available uh, and that phone number hasn't been distributed yet for uh, in order for businesses who have an immediate issue to call and have one of those two street workers help you. Yeah, the, the phone number is, uh, is Street Outreach. You can look it up online, but it is also on our member website for everybody to find. It was supposed to be launched to our members today, but they're, I'm not confident in the process and I don't want our members to have a negative experience or an experience that doesn't bring results and safety um, as quickly as possible. So I've delayed it, but it is on our site for everybody to find and it is a public number. But you will make okay. that number available. So, Councillor Neal, uh, two questions, two questions. Thank you. Any other questions from Council? Uh, Councillor Holland. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and through you. So you indicated at the end of the presentation, well, and throughout that you had uh, meetings arranged or in, were in the, prospect, in the process of arranging um, a conversation with the province to ensure that they understood the severity of the issues uh, that, that you as an organization and businesses are experiencing and that uh, individuals living in Kingston are experiencing, essentially. Uh, so I'm just curious, do, do those meetings involve specific asks for funding? Because you, you also suggested that 24-hour policing was something that would be on the agenda. And as you know, I'm sure that, that part of, a significant part of that funding is municipal funding. So just curious to know as to what the asks will be financially. Thank you, and uh, through you, Chair, it, it is, isn't actually me who's dealing directly with um, the 
the advocacy to the Ontario government. It's OBIA, which is a organization that we belong to, as well as 225 other BIAs just like ours across Ontario. So I don't know uh, what their asks are going to be. They do often advocate for us uh, on a provincial and federal level. Um, so that's that's that question. And what was the second one? Well, oh, again, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, just uh, curious about the amounts, if you had amounts of funding that you'd, if you'd had that information, but if, if not, that's, I totally understand if it's not your initiative, it's just, uh, yeah, more looking at, I mean, asking the province for things is one thing, but you also suggested by referencing policing that there would be a municipal cost, so that was this part I was asking for more information on. Right. So um, just to separate the two issues, so the Ontario government, as we all know, um, needs needs to be aware and step up to some of the on Ontario issues so that we can deal with some of the, the larger issues at hand that are not municipal. That's not going to happen overnight. I've got a problem. We've got a problem. The city's got a problem right now, downtown, right now, today, that needs help while the Ontario government, possibly the federal government, possibly the municipality figures out how to um, rectify the issue. We, we can't wait for the Ontario government to um, come up with solutions. We, we need help downtown now. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, Ms. Currier, thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move to our third delegation. We will invite Krista LeClaire uh, the Executive Director of Kingston Accommodation Partners to speak to Council. Ms. Clare, welcome, and you have the floor. Good evening, Mayor Patterson and members of Council. My name is Krista LeClaire, and I'm the Executive Director for Kingston Accommodation Partners. I represent the accommodation sector here in Kingston, including the many workers. Next slide, please. The tourism industry was facing a labor shortage before the pandemic began, and it's now worse than ever. In fact, the Conference Board of Canada reported that Kingston would be ranked fourth across the country for municipalities most at risk due to COVID-19's impact on the accommodation and food services sector, with 8.7% of jobs in the sector, higher if you include other sectors within the tourism industry, I'm reflecting today on, the large on a large portion of the population. I'm here tonight to reflect on the workers that remain and the impact the situation downtown involving the vulnerable population has had on these workers with empathy and compassion. I have surveyed the downtown properties and the unsafe situations staff have been found in is incredibly worrisome, making the impact on businesses very challenging, challenging to keep workers safe and challenging to attract and retain staff. Next slide, please. The following slides include testimonials highlighting situations that staff should not have found themselves in. Staff are concerned to walk home after their shift, they fear walking to and from work and encounter the stress every day as citizens of Kingston and employees of the downtown core. Managing, um, sorry, some managing uh, someone on crystal meth, fear of assault, and someone rolling out onto the street screaming and yelling. Next slide, please. Several incidents of petty theft, many negative reviews across various platforms and comments about Kingston being an unsafe destination, Bikes stolen, cars broken into. Uh, next slide, please. The impact on guests and staff is immeasurable. Folks camped out in lobby bathrooms, bathing in sinks, hiding in stairwells, attempting to spend the night. Next slide, please. Team members struggle to access waste collection compounds. Uh, they've been threatened verbally. Folks taking drugs, folks engaging in sex acts. Staff are dealing with the same offenses every shift, which is exhausting for them. Debris and needles are being left for staff to dispose of. Next slide, please. Um, individuals taking drugs, getting folks safely removed is always a challenge and the risk to us is very high. Find folks sleeping in meeting space and public areas of the property. Uh, minimal staff resources overnight. The situation becomes quite challenging to monitor and deal with. A personal locker of a cook was cleaned out. Next slide, please. A person set himself on fire and unfortunately uh, passed away. A night audit staff was alone dealing with the situation until emergency help arrived. Uh, folks have been doing drugs and defecating underneath hotels and on walkways around the properties. Drugs found in lobby washrooms, meeting room spaces, staircases. Next slide, please. Folks have force forcefully tried to enter guest rooms. Um, gardens have been torn apart, slept in, set on fire. Property has been thrown in the lake. 
Uh, staff do not feel safe walking downtown or in parking lots during late hours. Next slide, please. To wrap up, we do support the, the effort of further working groups, however, alongside resources that they need to do the work required of them. We continue to work with, the prop, with our provincial partners advocating for more resources for municipalities to address addiction and mental health services. Suggestions include more outreach workers, longer hours for outreach workers, and to have resources open when outreach is canvassing and available. It is my understanding that there is uh, little they can do, for example, on evenings and weekends, which, is a, which has a huge impact on tourism staff and guests. We are bringing these pieces to AMO in August as a delegation. It will be a priority issue for our meetings with MPPs. We encourage council to continue to put pressure on the province for more mental health and addiction services. Perhaps we need to declare this the epidemic it is for our communities. And finally, we need more tools now and support recommendations by those that know better what tools to use. As you're hearing, the business community has gathered together and are calling for immediate action by the province and the city of Kingston to enact bylaws, as well as longer term compassionate solutions that will assist in making our streets safer, including investing in added support networks for our most vulnerable population. As we slowly recover from the global pandemic, it is important that together we do all we can to ensure downtown Kingston returns to being a safe and vibrant destination for everyone. We are committed to supporting respectful and proactive solutions, working in collaboration with the city of Kingston. Thank you for your time and I welcome any questions. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions from council? Councillor Neal? One very quick question, if I could. Um, you mentioned about employees feeling unsafe, uh, especially those working late. Um, have you encouraged, uh, because many of them are minimum wage workers, have you encouraged employers to actually provide a taxi or Uber ride home for, for their employees? I think that would go a long way. Yeah, thank you very much for the question through you, Mayor Patterson. Um, employers are working on things like this. There are buddy systems, um, you know, workers are using Uber to go home, um, different rideshare programs. They're waiting for other staff to end their shift to drive together. Um, but what we've seen is that, you know, less people are walking to work, even if it's just a few blocks, less people are cycling. And I think these are, are you know, additional concerns. Okay, if there are no other questions, Ms. Claire, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we have a number of other delegations, so we will uh, quickly move through the votes to add those as well. So first, uh, moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor McLaren to add Bill Stewart, Policy Coordinator of the Greater Kingston Chamber of Commerce. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that we would add Peter Kingston from Speak Kingston. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, next, moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor McLaren, uh, to add Maggie McLaren as a delegation. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Next, moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor McLaren, to add uh, Bob Navarma, President and CEO from United Way, Kingston, Frontenac, Lennox, and Addington. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Next, move by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor McLaren, uh, to add Tammy Lunn as a delegation. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Move by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor McLaren, to add Robert McInnes as a delegation. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor McLaren uh, to add Carol Ravness, Executive Director of Addiction and Mental Health Services, KFLNA, and Zach Revel, Criminal Justice and Support Case Manager, uh, from also from Addiction and Mental Health Services, KFLNA. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor McLaren that we add Randy Casford as a delegation. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor McLaren. Um, oh, I'm so, way to allow. Okay, uh, so just to note that the one um, we voted on the delegation to allow Robert McInnes, but it will also include Vic Sahai. Can I just have the consent of council that that's reasonable? Okay. 
Uh, next, moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that um, Gilles Charette, Executive Director of Trellis HIV and Community Care, and Amanda Rogers, Manager of Harm Reduction Services, Trellis HIV and Community Care, be added as delegation. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that Matt Silburn be added as a delegation. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, Moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that uh, Sophie LaChapelle be added as a delegation. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that Susan Deschar be added as a delegation. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that Crystal Wilson be added as a delegation. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that Jamie Swift be added as a delegation. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that Sayida Jaffer be added as a delegation. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, and then finally, moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that Matthew Gaventer uh, be added as a delegation. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, so with that, we will move to delegation number four. At this time, I will invite Bill Stewart, policy co coordinator from the Greater Kingston Chamber of Commerce to appear before council. Mr. Stewart, welcome, and you have the floor. Thank you. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay from out here in the uh, countryside. <laughs> so uh, again, we want to re reiterate that we want to work with everybody involved tonight and that includes all the additional delegations too. Uh, so again, good evening, Mayor, Council, and staff, and thank you for hearing from us on this very important subject. I'm Bill Stewart, a Policy Coordinator at the Greater Kingston Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber is the voice of business, supporting over 600 local members, encompassing over 18,000 employees. And we support and lobby for our small business members and their interests to ensure they maximize their growth and potential. And we also strive to work collaboratively, including meaningful consultation and engagement to influence good policy. Through discussion, meeting, and understanding, we provide viable solutions and arguments to strengthen our city. Our vision includes that all businesses in the city and adheres to the vision of downtown Kingston and their mandate to create and maintain a vibrant, safe, and livable district. We work with our tourism, hospitality, and our retail partners to understand that a successful and safe space only works when local business groups alongside our nonprofit associations come together as one to provide a unified voice. We also stress the Chamber work with all levels of government as partners of the healthy, livable community process. The Chamber does this by forging positive dialogue with local MPPs, MPs, and our municipality. We understand the complex nature of the safety within our public and private spaces. It is vital that our organizations appear unified tonight to offer examples and assist on future solutions to those issues that have resulted in many businesses and areas that have become unsafe for residents, shopkeepers, operators, and tourists in our city. The multi-purpose of this evening's discussion is to hear an update from our members on options that have been and might be implemented. Your chamber knows that it is small business that drives our local economy, and it's why we keep our priorities in the spotlight. We've heard that public safety has both a direct and indirect impact, deterring customers and hindering the continued success of our business. The chamber is looking to provide a brokerage relationship whereby we can help to facilitate solutions to the topic we are looking at tonight. We can work together to listen, learn, and achieve a positive outcome. We welcome further collaboration and the resources that are dedicated to this ever-changing, challenging file. Moreover, we are slowly recovering from the last two years. 
and it's important that together we all can do together to ensure downtown Kingston and the city as a whole returns to being a safe and vibrant destination for everybody. We're committed to supporting respectful and proactive solutions, working in collaboration with all of our partners here tonight and the city as a whole. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any questions from council? Can I just see the, uh, the Zoom screen? Okay, if there are no questions, uh, Mr. Stewart, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll move to our next delegation and we will invite Peter Kingston from Speak Kingston to appear before council. Mr. Kingston, welcome and you have the floor. Uh, Mr. Kingston, there's a, a bit of a problem with your audio. We can't seem to hear you. Oh. Hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Patterson and Council, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity on behalf of Speak Kingston to present to you our thoughts, concerns, concerns, and some possible ideas to consider. First off, Speak Kingston stands for Social, Political, Economic Action Kingston. We are a group consisting of over 400 members from across our city. We have four tenants, and one of those tenants is to foster an attractive, vibrant, walkable, and safe urban core in neighborhoods. I think this tenant is very appropriate to the discussion we're having this evening. We fully recognize the challenges that the vulnerable and citizens without a home in our community are facing. In the last two plus years has made many of their situations worse. We acknowledge that much has been done to date and we support the efforts of over the 20 business associations, social service agencies, provincial program reps, police, and many city departments who are working together to support these folks. We understand the city has contributed significant financial resources as well. At the same time, we believe that the rights of all citizens, families, merchants, visitors, and tourists must be respected and protected. We believe that customers of our downtown businesses and services must have unencumbered and safe access. We also believe that citizens should have the right to use all city parks without any concerns about their safety. We don't feel these basic rights are being respected when encampments are allowed to locate in parks across the city, when people with loaded shopping carts are blocking sidewalks or impeding access to retail businesses, commercial and residential buildings, or leaving garbage and needles on the streets, in the parks, and in front of many downtown businesses and homes. Our downtown is one of the best and most vibrant in Canada and one I am very proud of. When you look at the tax base from the businesses, the landlords and the residents who reside in the downtown area, it is very, very significant. My guess is it would be in the many millions of dollars. We need these businesses to thrive to ensure our downtown continues to be vibrant and attractive not only to our residents, but also to the thousands of visitors that travel to Kingston every year from around the world. It is in everyone's interest that we work together to ensure our downtown returns to be a safe destination for everyone. We feel strongly because of the significant tax base from downtown that more resources have to be concentrated and allocated downtown. We think with the significant taxes generated, the downtown deserves more support. What we mean by this is the city should strongly consider having a retail storefront that would house a cross-section of supports such as police, bylaw enforcement, mental health workers, and drug addiction workers. By having these resources close at hand, the response time to complaints and concerns can be handled quickly and limit the potential for the problem to escalate. Everyone in our city deserves to be respected and treated fairly, and the rights of all citizens need to be taken as you move forward with solutions that are respectful and proactive. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions from council? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll move to our next delegation. We will invite Maggie McLaren, who will be speaking to council with respect to uh, report number 66 from the CAO with respect to 805 Ridley Drive, West Wing, Interim Use and Development Plan. Uh, Ms. McLaren, welcome, and you have the floor. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Patterson and members of council for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Uh, as you said, I am Megan McLaren and I'm the executive director of Don House and I've been listening to all of the delegations and I mean our delegation or my delegation this evening is also with respect to homelessness in Kingston and it, it is um, I think, you know, what we are talking about this evening is a, a good piece of news. So I'm, I'm just going to be very brief. In March 2020, just days before COVID-19 shut everything down, Don House Board of Directors held a strategic planning meeting. In that meeting, the board recognized that the number of homeless women in Kingston was on the rise and that Don House, the organization in Kingston that had been working with homeless women since 1986, needed to increase its capacity to provide housing options for women who found themselves homeless. In October of last year, we made well known that Don House is on a mission to help end women's homelessness in Kingston. Don House to be the operator of the East Wing. And we have continued to meet with city staff every two months emergency. Uh, Ms. McLaren, I'm just going to um, I'm just going to interrupt for a moment. Your your connection is very poor. Uh, what I was going to suggest, if it's possible, to turn your camera off. Uh, if you want to continue to your delegation, that might be best. She's dropped it. Okay. Okay. We'll see if she um, if she comes back in. Okay. At this point, then we will move ahead um, to our next delegation. We'll invite uh, Pavna Varma, President and CEO of United Way KFLNA. Uh, to uh, to speak to council, Ms. Farma, welcome, and you have the floor. Sorry, I wasn't. I was muted. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, members of council, city staff. I'd like to thank the city for the care and consideration of options for our fellow residents who are homeless, often facing addictions and mental health challenges. We know every individual who experiences homelessness or addictions or mental health has their own unique journey. This is complex and challenging work. The city staff report is very comprehensive and covers many initiatives. The recommendation for funding for additional stabilization beds is an important one and to be commended, as is the recommendation to increase beds across the city as and where they can be accommodated. Enhancing the street outreach program, the van is an important support. I would like, however, to offer council some thoughts about three other items for your consideration. Sanctions encampments are temporary and costly interventions that need to be appropriately resourced and staffed if they are to be successful. The proposed recommendation for low-cost solutions could potentially result in under-resourced encampments without adequate staffing and resources, which may give rise to unhealthy and unsafe conditions. It will also push the problem down the road and will still need a resolution in the fall as winter approaches. I'd like council to consider whether these funds could be better invested in additional safe, low barrier shelter beds using a harm reduction approach. We need to help people live with dignity and in safe environments rather than in makeshift temporary structures. If we are committed to finding solutions, then all of us need to find environments that are safe and stable, that allow people to thrive and not to languish. Anything less is abdicating our collective responsibility. I'd like council to consider whether these funds could be better invested in additional safe, low barrier shelter beds. We can all work together over the next three months if funding is approved for sheltering and housing the unhoused. The city, funders like the United Way, partners in health and social services can collaborate to find additional beds to serve people with challenges, moving them along the journey to housing. My next point for consideration by council is around a loitering bylaw. I understand CAO Hurdle has recommended a public nuisance bylaw instead, which may allay some of these concerns. Please consider the unintentional consequences that could result in harm and stigma against marginalized and racialized people for any bylaw that targets certain populations. If you were to consider a bylaw, a loitering bylaw, would a ticket be issued to someone like me who was seeking some space and decided to sit on a park bench for hours 
or would it only be for those who are homeless with nowhere to go? How will the city deal with people who are unhoused with no income and who cannot pay the fines or tickets? 80% of people who are homeless face mental health challenges. I'm sure council recognizes that people with mental health and substance use challenges need healthcare and social support rather than being fined or criminalized. Thirdly, the recommendation around banning cards is a complex one. Council may want to consider the impact on people who are homeless. For many, this is all they have in this world. It would be traumatizing to lose your belongings when you have so little to call your own in the first place. Confiscating belongings can cause fear and result in challenging behaviors. We'd also like you to consider the moral duress and impact this may have on bylaw officers who are trying to enforce this. Is it that the carts are the issue? Would it help if we provide a roll along suitcases for these belongings, similar to those of tourists and visitors? Before finalizing solutions, I'd suggest we need a better understanding of whether all acts of vandalism downtown are from the unhoused, whether it is being suggested that all people who are unhoused are violent and aggressive. How do we best understand the scope of this issue before making allegations against everyone who is homeless? Council approved a one-year downtown pilot project, which has just got underway. Would it make sense to build solutions into the outcomes of this newly created street outreach team to address these issues, creating clear outcomes and documenting learnings rather than adding blanket bans? We know people who are homeless, people with substance use and mental health challenges face stigma. I believe it's important for all of us to work against stigma as part of any solution. I hope council will avoid decisions that may contribute to stigma and discrimination against our most marginalized. I urge you to consider these points in your deliberations and when making your decisions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any questions from council? Councilor Kiley. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and through you, Ms. Varma, thank you for that very insightful presentation. I'm wondering if you could tell us, in your discussion with colleagues across the province, if you've heard of anything that works to address some of the concerns we've heard. And I'm putting you on the spot, so perhaps it's a conversation offline, but uh, we know that you're well connected and have many solutions and connections to other communities. Perhaps there's something you could offer from elsewhere. I would love to have a conversation at some point with you offline maybe, but um, certainly there are ways that we can move people along the journey, creating more shelter beds in the interim for now, and helping people move to housing is the most critical piece. That's what we should be focusing on for resources, for staffing, uh, for financial uh, commitments. Thank you. Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Ms. Verma. Um, on the topic of shelter beds, uh, you, you make a compelling point to uh, further investment in that. In the report, it speaks to current numbers, uh, and uh, it's my understanding, though I'm no expert, that there is often many vacancies in the shelter system. You talked about low barrier shelter beds. Maybe you could speak a bit more about how, it, how expanding the capacity of a system that's not fully utilized at the moment would uh, encourage people that are choosing to live uh, outside of uh, moving into shel shelter beds. So one of the first things that we acknowledge is that the system is broken. Uh, as Carol Radness, our colleague, has suggested, um, the system was created for a different time. We have different issues now. We really need to think about the needs and, and, and recognize that everyone's needs are individualized. So a general shelter cannot accommodate people necessarily who have really high needs. However, if you create a low barrier space with a harm reduction approach for some of the people who would benefit from that. So we need to have different solutions for different people. It's not that people are voluntarily staying outside. It's just that we don't have the solutions that would accommodate them uh, in a space that they can be comfortable and that our service providers can, can support them the best way they could. So just a follow up question on that low barrier, maybe for people with addictions and so on. So are you saying that the system does not uh, have beds like that at the moment, or th that those beds are fully occupied? Certainly some beds are fully occupied, but I'm not sure if you've seen the space at ICH. It's not really a shelter. It's a sleep. They're, those are sleeping spaces. We really need to help people with, live with dignity wherever they are. And that means creating beds that actually have spaces where, where people with different challenges and different health issues, different mental health issues, different substance use challenges need to be accommodated. It's not the same one size fits all anymore. Uh, thank you. Next is uh, Councillor Holland. 
Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Um, through you, so the, yeah, just picking up on the harm reduction, low barrier shelter um, idea, I'm thinking more about how that would operate in the longer term and uh, wondering, um, so, I mean, we, we are, we've seen some good examples already and the city's been involved in those, Integrated Care Hub being one. Um, the, the ongoing operating costs are something that are, uh, that of course, have to be managed, negotiated, secured, all of that. And I'm just wondering if you are aware of stable funding sources, what sort of model you have in mind when you talk about the funding of those um, low barrier beds. That's a great question. Um, so in the interim, right now we're in a bit of a crisis. So we really need to get shelter beds. Shelter beds are not the ultimate solution. They are just a pathway in to start helping people along their journey. So I think what I'm suggesting, shelter beds are expensive. They're not a permanent solution. But for now, we just need to get people off the streets, off encampments, into some sort of stability, helping them then find housing. And we have some incredible agencies who work together. I am not a direct service provider. But from what I understand, we've got a lot of people who are willing to work together and, and make this happen. So long term, we would find the funding for more permanent solutions. But for now, we just need to deal with this and continue this effort because we are facing not just a housing crisis, we are facing uh, a drug crisis, we are a poison, drug poisoning crisis. And we are facing, it's a combination of so many things coming together. And we really need to deal with this over the next six months, like a crisis situation, and then start stabilizing and, and really looking at how we can adapt the system. Thank you. Okay. If there are no other questions. Ms. Varma, thank you very much. Thank you. So before we go any further, uh, we will circle back. If, uh, if Ms. McLaren is back online, we will uh, try to resume her delegation. Okay, can you hear me? <laughs> uh, Ms. McLaren, we can we can hear you. Uh, we okay. had you we had you for about the first minute. So if you want to uh, to start partway into your delegation, uh, I can give you okay. another another four minutes. All right, thank you. Um, I'm just going to go back and start um, about halfway down the first page. So in October of last year, we made it well known that Don House is on a mission to help end women's homelessness in Kingston. In December of last year, Don House met with the city staff weekly to discuss whether Don House would be interested in operating the East Wing of 805 Ridley Drive. Council passed the recommendation for Don House to be the operator of the East Wing, and we've continued to meet with city staff every two weeks to finalize details for the East Wing to discuss emergency shelter for women and how best to move forward with the West Wing of Ridley Drive. From our perspective at Don House, it makes sense for the entire building to be turned into apartments that support women and women with children. Unfortunately, for that to happen, it will require a capital investment to renovate the rooms into apartments. We're working with city staff to address this, and if all goes according to plan, we hope to be able to begin renovations on the West Wing next year, most likely in the fall. Given the need to provide more shelter and transitional and supportive housing for women now, the lack of women's shelter spaces in September and the fall being only a few short months away, Don House believes that providing short-term emergency transitional housing in the West Wing would be a good use of the building and would provide vulnerable women in our community the opportunity to move out of encampments and unsafe situations. We're looking at this as a little bit of good news for women in our community who are, who are homeless. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions from Council? He's seeing none. Ms. McLaren, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll move to our next delegation. We will invite Tammy Lunn to speak to council. Ms. Lunn, welcome, and you have the floor. Thank you. I'll be quick. I'm here tonight to say that count, should council choose to vote in favor of the encampments in Bell Park area, security will be necessary for the safety and well-being of campers, neighbors, and local businesses. It is also requested the city provide neighbors and business owners with a contact list for law enforcement, fence issues, needle pickup. Uh, regardless of how council votes on the encampment pilot project motion, there are already significant issues and concerns in the Bell Park area. These issues and concerns must be addressed, respect, addressed respectfully 
effectively and collectively by staff, partnering agencies, various city of Kingston departments, support groups, opposition groups, neighbors, business owners, and campers. And this work has already begun through opening the lines of communication, identifying concerns, strategizing solutions, and implementing actions to, the, to fix the things that we can. There's so much work to be done and we need your help. Uh, we'd like to hold an open air meeting on July 21st, 2022, from six till 8 p.m. on the KMP trail at the corner of Montreal and Railway Streets for staff and neighbors of the ICH to gather and, and discuss solutions and develop a plan of action. Bring a lawn chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions from council? Okay, uh, Ms. Lund, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll move to our next delegation. We will invite uh, Robert McInnes and Vic Sahai to speak to council. Here we go, Mr. McInnes and uh, Mr. Sahai, welcome. And uh, I will hand the floor over to the two of you, whoever would like to, to begin. Thank you. Can you hear me? I guess we can. Okay. Thank you for this opportunity. Mayor, members of council, city staff and citizens listening in, thank you again for the opportunity to express our opinion on this critical subject. I, Robert McInnes, and my co-speaker, Vic Sahai, will take turns in making this presentation. We are here tonight to discuss the ongoing housing dilemma in Kingston. Many of the things we say tonight will be all too familiar to all of you, and we recognize that you are keen to alleviate the suffering of the homeless, but we fear the numbers of homeless people will grow rapidly in the near future. We therefore are very worried about the many near homeless, those who are facing homelessness because they can no longer afford their rent or are facing eviction through no fault of their own. New eviction notices seem to be growing rapidly. The N12 eviction notices, where an eviction can take place because the landlord wishes to make to move a renter out so that he can renovate or move a relative in, are increase, and are increasing in number, often because they allow landlords to dramatically increase rents. Those evicted are often playing, paying less than the market rent and have no way of paying more. In the current market, they often have no place to go. We have the second lowest vacancy rate in Ontario, making rental units very hard to find and way too expensive for poor people. Could you put up the slide, please? Uh, sir, it, the, the slide is up and we can see it. Thank you very much. We wish to present the case of our friends, neighbors, Ina and David Caddy, who are in this photograph, um, who are facing eviction and are extremely vulnerable. They would have liked to present their own case, but are not well enough to do so. So they've given us permission to speak on their behalf. David is 57 and has had Lou Gehrig's disease for approximately 40 years. He lives in the wheelchair and is fed, washed, and comforted day and night by his sister, Ina, who is 65 and in poor health. And has looked after him since he was diagnosed at 17. They have, given, they have been given an eviction notice because the landlord has been given permission to pull down the property they lived in for 43 years. In order to build a number of new units, as soon as none of these units will be wheelchair accessible nor affordable to them, they cannot hope to move back. Their home is hopelessly inadequate for someone living in a wheelchair, having no ramped uh, entrance and several changes of floor level and has been fully maintained over the years that they have been living there. Pixahai will continue from here, please. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Councillor. David and Ina have been facing evictions for over a year now, and the fear of not knowing where or when they're going to be is a constant uh, terrorizing. And um, it's really had an havoc on their mental and physical health. They've appealed to the housing tribunal, but this court is so overloaded that they might not even hear the case for months. They've appealed to the city housing units, and some of you are aware of the situation that they're in. Our question is, of course, what is to be done? They must not be turned away. When we walk down the streets and see a homeless person, we are filled with emotion, compassion, helplessness, anger, and fear. Many of us can see ourselves in that situation knowing that we are only a few paychecks away from being homeless as well. Hundreds of Kingstonians live with the fear of homelessness, and near homelessness is all around us. 30 the seconds. Catholics live with this all the time. We need, they need our compassion, but more importantly, they need your action. And they need um, to, for a, to fo find a home for David's physical needs. As an epidemiologist, I can tell you that it is far cheaper to prevent people from becoming homeless in the first place than providing accommodations after the fact. Okay. Helping the cats, cats and people like them not no. only make economic sense, but thank it you. is the humane way thank you. of dealing with homelessness. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Sai. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from council? If I can just see the screen. Uh, Councilor Hutchison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wondered if the presenters could tell us what they would expect the city to do. Bob? You're on mute, Bob. Um, yes, well, <laughs> we would very much like the city to uh, look at this situation as a test case for what is happening to so many people and will happen to so many people and see the process that has to go through and people have to go through in order to alleviate the situation. Clearly, they have enormous fears which they live with all of their days about what's going to happen to them. They need some reassurance from the city that they will be cared for. Okay. Yep, thank you. Uh, if there are no other questions, thank you both very much. With that, thank you. We'll, uh, thank you. We'll move to our next delegation now. We will invite uh, Carol Ravnus and Zach Ravel from Addiction and Mental Health Services to speak to council. Uh, Ms. Ravnus, uh, Mr. Ravel, welcome. And uh, I will hand the floor over to, uh, to the two of you. Thank you, Mayor Patterson and City Council for this opportunity to speak with you tonight. As you know, from the many hours of discussing and working on this and all tonight's delegations, the current homelessness problem is a very complex issue. It's been born from the injustice of society and other problems like the cost of living, the low uh, allowances for shelter within OW and ODSP, which does not match the true cost of housing, the lack of affordable housing stock, it's been made worse by the terrible toxic street drugs available, the stress and financial impacts of the pandemic, mental health issues and trauma in, for many of these individuals. It is a very wicked, thorny problem. And as you all know and have talked about um, at length, there isn't a simple solution or, or a, a quick fix to this problem. We need a continuum of options and supports. As stated earlier, needs are different. It is not a one size fits all. One of the recommendations in the city staff report of tonight is an overflow program, or what we at mental health and addictions are calling a stabilization program. 
So what is that? It's a place where people live and stabilize for a period of time in a temporary setting like a hotel with supports from addictions, mental health and other service providers. They receive care for their mental health and substance abuse, and they're not worried about where they're gonna sleep that night. They start to reacquaint themselves with the skills to live independently with success. Clients are supported and expected to maintain their unit, to engage in services, and to be an active participant in realizing their goals. Uh, support could include uh, activities of daily living, budgeting, connecting with help, that street health services, family doctor, income supports, a food bank, par parole and probation, court support, legal aid. It most certainly includes addiction, mental health help, psychiatry appointments, advocacy and compassion, harm reduction education. AMHS with the city support um, and partners have requested formal funding for this from the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care to provide this program permanently. And we are very hopeful that we will receive funding soon. Support from the city of Kingston to cover the hotel costs has helped us to start this program with existing staff. There's a request tonight for increased support, which will cover more rooms and help us to build the capacity. And this represents one part of the continuum of options that are required to help the homeless population. With me tonight is Zach Ravel. Zach's one of our AMHS staff, and he's working in this program, and he'll share an example of how this is helping. Good evening, Mayor Patterson and members of the council. Thank you for allowing us to speak at this event and thank you, Carol, for the introduction and the outline of the stabilization program. I would like to spend just a moment sharing a client's story to further discuss kind of what the program can offer. For the purpose of this client's story and for confidentiality purposes, the client will be identified as AB. AB was referred to the program in September of 2021. At the time of this referral, they were homeless, sleeping rough on the streets, actively using substances while accumulating police contact and legal matters in the community. Shortly before the referral, AB was also re received a ban from local shelter options. Staff provided the sort of outreach within the community to build therapeutic rapport and allow for discussions regarding the stability program to be provided. Following several meetings of identifying needs, goals, and potential barriers and risks, they were referred into the program. AB was able to begin reconnecting with services within the community, increasing their support network, and begin setting future-oriented goals. They expressed many times throughout the intake process satisfaction towards the program and feeling hope for positive change. The program provides AV with daily meals, creating independent living skills, such as accessing the food bank, budgeting for groceries, coping mechanisms, relapse prevention skills, and further supports as needed on a regular basis and very client-centered and individualized. Since completing the intake for the program, AB has, uh, AB has had regular engagement with her support team while displaying an increase in engagement with services within the community. AB identified substance use as being a primary concern. They shared that they have used daily for many years and that this is an area that they would like to address. 30 seconds. They share that their substance use has drastically decreased since participating in the program and have new goals of abstinence. They share that they have not had much family involvement in the past and identified this as an area to address. Since residing in the program, they have begun mending these relationships, spending holidays, birthdays, all together while having more regular and positive interactions with each other. AB has expressed many times being thankful for the program, shares feelings of safety, feeling supported, and are gaining valuable skills to live independently within the community. Thank okay. you for your time. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions from Council? Councillor Holland. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Uh, through you. So the... A while back, I'm guessing maybe like 10 years or so, there was a program quite similar, and I, excuse me if I'm not fully up to date, but it was a longer term housing, a sort of a transitional housing program that sounds similar to what you've described. I'm wondering though, if you could describe any differences between this program, like is, are we talking about relatively short term um, in stays? for example, within the hotel situation, or is that something that can um, be spread out, the state can be spread out depending on the needs of the individual, or I guess I'm just trying to figure out where this fits in in the continuum that, um, that Ms. Ramos mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. So thank you 
uh, for the question, and I'm not familiar with the program from 10 years ago, but what I can share about this is it really does vary depending on the person. Um, when we uh, did the application for these stabilization beds, um, four months was the minimum that we were looking at. Some people will stay less and some people will stay longer. And what we would hope to do, again, to that term stabilize, help them stabilize and move them to more secure housing so that they don't return to the street and to home hoping that helps answer this question. Yeah, that's great. I think the difference I was thinking of from uh, before was that AMHS owned the buildings, and now we're looking at a situation where it would be partnering with municipality for that space, um, but it sounds like otherwise it's similar. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Next is Councillor Osterhoff. Okay. There were no other, um, sorry, yeah, uh, Councillor Kiley, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. Um, thank you for your presentations. I'm wondering if either of you would speak to the impact of encampments on mental health and whether or not on the whole you would see that as part of this continuum or perhaps something that uh, we should think of other solutions for. So that's encampments on mental health. I'll, I'll start um, and Zach can chime in. Um, certainly uh, feeling like I'm not an expert in this topic, but the earlier conversation about um, worried about having no place to live is a real uh, fear for a lot of people. And so they're a, a temporary solution, but not a long-term solution. I was listening last night to a podcast on what Houston did with their homelessness um, program. And one of the things that they did was ensure that everybody had a house, everybody had a home, everybody had some place to live. And there were other pieces um, related to providers working in lockstep with each other and making sure that they, um, nothing was repeated, uh, people knew who did what. Um, and they also very much worked by the by names list and made sure that they were, were um, working on people identified on that list. So long answer, sorry. I, I think having a, a permanent home to stay in or a shelter or roof over your head um, is the ideal way to go. Zach, anything you'd add to that? Yeah, if I may, thank you, Carol, that was fantastic. Um, if I may add my own experience, I think that safety with shelter is essential for our clients. It's very difficult for them to gain that sense of stability, to stop substance use, or to try to achieve their goals if they don't have a safe place to lay their head at night. So I think that in terms of encampments with mental health, the difficulty is, is that there's maybe not be that wraparound support that's attached to that encampment. I think the stability program will do a, ver a very good job of having wraparound supports, identifying needs, making referrals as necessary, and ensuring a safe place for clients to be. Thank you. Okay, there are no other questions. Thank you both very much. With that, we'll move to our next delegation. We will invite, uh, well, I'm gonna ask uh, the deputy clerk, is Mr. Casford here? No, okay, so we will skip to our next delegation. Uh, next, we will invite Gilles Charette, Executive Director from Trellis HIV and Community Care, and also Amanda Rogers, Manager of Harm Reduction Services from Trellis HIV and Community Care. Uh, Mr. Charette, uh, welcome. I see you there. And if Ms. Rogers is there as well, I will hand the floor over to you both. <laughs> see your hand. Good evening, Your Worship, members of Council. Yes, Amanda is with me to help answer questions tonight. We can agree that the homeless challenge our community is faced with is a great one, one that's been exacerbated by COVID-19 and the drug poisoning crisis. In fact, during COVID-19, people experiencing homelessness were often left abandoned by services that they depended on. This is a challenge shared by many communities as we've been learning tonight and one without quick or simple solutions. In order to begin to fix the issue, we need to address the root causes and city staff have prepared a really thoughtful report and it appears that some care has been put into proposing practical steps that will help pre create pathways out of homelessness for people. We especially wanna highlight the recommended investment for additional stabilization beds and transitional housing units. Examples like these are exactly where we need to be focusing resources. But in addition to this, we need to look into creating low barrier, harm reduction focused supportive housing. There is yet to be an articulated strategy for safe and supportive housing options for people with significant mental health and substance use challenges. We need to look at evidence like the community needs assessment that was prepared by the ICH for a place for people from the ICH to graduate to. 
That being said, some of the beds proposed by city staff uh, can be online quite quickly, but until they are, people need to be able to decide what best meets their needs. They need to be able to choose whether to be close to where they can access supports or elsewhere where they can leave, live peacefully. Our position is that the resources outlined in this report would be better spent on increasing the number of long-term solutions for individuals than on the very minimal supports proposed for a sanctioned encampment. So we would propose a targeted pausing of the encampment protocol in specific areas, close to where individuals need access to supports and in areas where there is minimal impact to the surrounding community. In our opinion, by asking for recommendations to create a sanctioned encampment with low-cost supports, Council has given staff an impossible brief. Creating a sanctioned encampment, or even two, without the appropriate investment in supports has the potential for several unintended negative consequences. Staff's report makes clear that successful sanctioned encampments provide dedicated 24-7 staffing, security, showers, meals, dedicated programming. We could agree that this doesn't fit in the brief for low-cost services, and so they've been excluded from the recommendations. So a number of questions come up from this. Will individuals be forced to gather in one area because there may be one sanctioned encampment? There may be instances of individuals who are staying away from the proposed locations, perhaps because of a previous conflict with another citizen, or because being too close to active substance use is a risk to their journey of recovery, or because they just want to be left alone to live in peace. Have we considered the impact of this on conflict and safety? In this plan, no additional resources have been put into staffing to coordinate the activities on the site. As such, it's unclear who's ultimately accountable for the functioning of the encampment. While various organizations' outreach teams will no doubt provide a certain measure of support, these organizations are already stretched or under-resourced, so it would be dangerous to presume that agencies can take on more than they already do. At minimum, having overdose prevention workers on site as well as measures that would enhance safety would be crucial. So without the appropriate supports, having a single sanctioned encampment would place an even greater burden on the neighborhoods where these encampments are proposed. To conclude, we're concerned that in trying to solve a problem with a single sanctioned encampment or even two, that we're creating many others. Instead, pausing the protocol in specific areas until these new beds and spaces come online would allow people to make informed choices about their overall health, well-being, and ultimately their lives. This would provide a variety of options for individuals while providing specific areas for outreach teams to do their work in connecting individuals to services. Each of us wants to live in a, in a city where we feel safe and protected. This must include people who live in poverty, experience homelessness, or use substances. Some of the comments made this evening have demonstrated how important it is to provide more resources to support this community, including challenging pervasive stigma and discrimination, particularly during this drug poisoning crisis where failed drug policies continue to claim lives. We need to be careful that in trying to address one problem, we're not creating another, which in this case would be inadvertently creating bylaws that would result in criminalizing homelessness. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions from council? If I can just see the zoo, the um, grid screen. Uh, Councillor Hutchison. Thank you for quite a good presentation, although you had to race through it. The, um, so there's a, there's a, um, an aspect there which calls for um, um, people being given two, two hours notice to be moved along, whether we call that eviction or not. We can leave that up in the air for now. But um, so I'm wondering, I can guess what you would say, but I'd like to hear you say it. Please. Oh, around the notice? Yeah, no, clearly, to us, that's that's an eviction. Um, and, you know, we need to consider that this is a community of individuals who experienced a great deal of trauma and the interactions that they have with, you know, sometimes law enforcement, health care and whatnot serves to re-traumatize. And so, again, you know, I think the big issue we need to be wrestling with here is if, you know, if, if we're not, you know, providing space for people to, you know, to camp, however it is, you know, that that works, um, and we don't have alternatives for them. We're in a real quandary. And so I think, again, staff has made some really thoughtful suggestions around where resources can be deployed. Um, in our opinion, with the very, very, frankly, paltry resources um, that are being assigned to this idea of a sanctioned encampment, we'd rather see those funds allocated to more longer-term solutions. Okay. Um, one follow-up question. So 
we're both aware that there are problems in areas like around the ICH in terms of residential neighborhoods, and it's occurred in other neighborhoods to a lesser, considerably sometimes lesser extent. So what would you say to those residents as to what is a glimmer of hope out of this report, other than the aspects that are mid to long-term focus? I'm talking about immediate results. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's frankly, um, Councillor Hutchison. I think that's really the longer term things are the things that are the glimmer of hope in here. Um, I, I don't see a lot in what's being proposed with the sanctioned encampment that gives me you know great comfort aside from access to basic sanitation and um, you know and, and garbage disposal, frankly, which is something that you know would certainly be helpful. Um, you know what I would say is actually something that should provide a glimmer of hope is actually um, Tammy Lund's um, uh, delegation, the engagement that um, Tammy and some of the neighbors have been making with some of the staff, in particular the managers at, at the ICH, we're really turning a corner around um, you know collaborating more closely. And uh, you know Tammy we we accept the invitation, we're bringing our lawn chairs. And um, so I think, you know, when we're working together, we can accomplish something. And I'm feeling really optimistic about what we can do together. Um, well, thank you for that. I take it we're cut down to two questions? Yep, that's uh, okay. that's your limit. Thanks, Councillor Hutchison. Okay. Are there any other questions from Council? Okay, seeing none, Mr. Charette, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll move to our next delegation, and we will invite uh, Matt Silburn to speak to council. Uh, Mr. Silburn, uh, welcome, welcome, and uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Matt Silburn. I'm a member of Mutual Aid Cataraqui Kingston. I've been an Inner Harbor resident since 1998. I work in the neighborhood. I spend a lot of time in Doug Floor Park and Bell Park. I've been employed to work with people who use drugs for more than 10 years and have been a community organizer for more than 25 years. I'm disappointed and angry with proposals staff are submitting to council tonight. Many of them are not only punitive without addressing the underlying issues of homelessness or drug toxicity, but actually will endanger people's lives. I'll start with the dangerous proposals. From page three of the report, the $209,000 price tag attached to the proposed encampment site at ICH seems clearly designed to get council to vote to move people to the parking lot at Bell Park, despite the delegations that we've heard previously about the very real risk to life if they're moved away from the staff at ICH. The long-term potential risk of sleeping on toxic soil is nothing compared to the very acute risk of death from the toxic drug supply. Not only is the city not moving forward with decriminalization and safe supply programs, which could save lives, moving people away from the ICH will actively endanger them. The $175,000 soil testing is unnecessary. That money should be used to address the housing crisis. We can't let the threat of liability keep us from doing what everyone who's familiar with the risk of the drug poisoning crisis is telling us. They need to stay where they are. More broadly, I believe the encampment protocol should be paused until there's adequate support of housing for everyone. The idea that people or children are at risk or at any more risk because of unhoused people in camping in parks is absurd and insulting. We need to differentiate between being uncomfortable and being unsafe. Is it possible that kids are unsafe in parks? Yes, but that risk is just as likely to come from uncles, family friends, estranged parents, or strangers with homes. Almost certainly the risk is from men and there are no attempts to keep men from city parks. Targeting unhoused people is discriminatory and shameful. If you wanna keep people from camping in parks, develop the supportive geared to income housing necessary to house them. Trying to hide them from tourists and neighbors who complain is not an adequate strategy. I urge you not to reinstate the encampment protocols to find adequate housing and to provide supports needed in the meantime and allow people to stay beside the ICH. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions from Council? 
Okay. Uh, seeing none, Mr. Silburn, thank you very much. Uh, next, we will move to our next delegation. We will invite Sophie LaChapelle to speak before council. Ms. LaChapelle, welcome, and you have the floor. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Sophie. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Criminology at the University of Ottawa. My research, all of which has been conducted in Kingston over the past six years, specializes in prison to community reintegration and homelessness in the Kingston area. I have also been a resident of Kingston for the past eight years. I'm speaking tonight because I'm concerned as a Kingston resident, but also as a critical researcher with several of the CAO's recommendations in the report that's been put before council today. And while I'm optimistic about some of the recommendations proposed in this report, as well as some of, some of the suggestions discussed here by my fellow delegations, this report includes a number of problematic policy suggestions. First, the reactivation of the encampment protocol, particularly with the newly proposed two-hour eviction notice, not only puts unhoused people at further risk of trauma, violence, and health complications regarding our drug poisoning crisis and COVID-19, but it also further marginalizes unhoused people, forcing them to move into densely wooded and or more polluted areas of the city. Second, as multiple studies have shown us, criminalizing poverty through the development of anti-loitering bylaws or public nuisance bylaws will not increase public safety. We may, increase, we may create the appearance of a livable city, but such a bylaw will only contribute to the unlivable conditions unhoused people are currently experiencing. Indeed, they will perpetuate poverty, not solve it. If this is about the well-being of our unhoused neighbors, we will reconsider developing an anti-loitering bylaw. Third, while it is important that the general public feel safe in public spaces, we must ask ourselves, ourselves who counts as the general public in discussions like these. If the general public is limited to property taxpaying residents, we are not creating an inclusive livable city, but one defined by exclusion, one where only the residents with enough money to pay exorbitant rent prices deserve to feel safe, dignified, and respected. Things that unhoused people in our community currently cannot enjoy due to increasing discrimination and criminalization in public spaces. Finally, the report ultimately feeds into a settler colonial narrative that abdicates responsibility for the well-being of dispossessed people in our community and instead places the blame on addictions and mental health issues many people push to the margins often experience. This is not to minimize the very visceral, complex mental health and addiction struggles that many unhoused people experience on a daily basis. However, to limit our discussion of the causes of homelessness to mental health and addictions is to ignore the ways that we, as housed propertyed citizens in Kingston, benefit from the continued dispossession and criminalization of our unhoused neighbors. We live in the prison capital of Canada, where nearly 20% of all federally incarcerated people are housed in eight prisons across the greater Kingston area. As a city, we experience immense economic benefits from the incarceration of criminalized people in prison, especially Indigenous peoples. Not only do we receive extensive payments from the federal government in lieu of taxes for hosting these prisons, but we also garner extensive revenue by exploiting our identity as the prison capital of Canada to thousands of tourists who visit Kingston Penitentiary, the Penitentiary Museum, and the Prison for Women. However, the concentration of prisons in Kingston has particular consequences for the city's housing crisis. Based on my research, more than 80% of people leaving federal prison in Kingston are at risk of homelessness. In 2018, 16% of unhoused people reported that they had been incarcerated in the last year, and 8% disclosed that their criminal record was a barrier to finding permanent housing. The number of federal prisons also helps to explain the high rate of homelessness amongst Kingston's Indigenous communities. As a result of decades of genocidal policies directed at Indigenous nations in Canada, um, Indigenous people make up more than 30% of all incarcerated people. Reflecting this trend, 31% of unhoused people in Kingston alone identify as Indigenous, despite representing only 3% of Kingston's total population. To reactivate the encampment protocol and develop an anti-loitering bylaw and a public nuisance bylaw is to perpetuate the criminalization of our unhoused neighbours, particularly Indigenous people, and continue to ignore our role as beneficiaries in these inequitable, oppressive settler colonial systems. 30 seconds. 
Thank you. Today, I implore you to reconsider the CAO's recommendations discussed herein. Today, you have a chance to build a more inclusive community. Each day we choose to criminalize unhoused people with these policies is yet another day we deny our role in the continued dispossession of people pushed to the margins. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Are there any questions from Council? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll move to our next delegation. We'll invite Susan Deschar to speak to Council. Hi there. Uh, can you hear me? Oh. Uh, we can hear you. Uh, so okay. you go go right ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, I haven't prepared much because I, I just came back from my son's graduation, um, but I felt I needed to say something. I'm a overdose prevention uh, support worker down at the CTS. Um, I'm gravely concerned about the idea that uh, uh, the potential for them moving uh, the unhoused and the people who use substances um, moving to um, Bell Park, it just kind of feels like Bell Park 2.0, but not any better. In fact, um, maybe a little worse. Um, you cited that uh, your concern is the contaminated land, um, and I don't really understand that um, because they've been there a long time, and as I understand it, Bell Park is also uh, contaminated, and so are the trails. Um, so if there is a concern for contaminated land, then why are the trails still open um, for other people to be walking through um, and and the unhoused need to move. Um, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, also, I am very, very concerned because if they move to Bell Park, um, they'll be further away from the um, amenities um, that the hub uh, provide for them, showers and food and whatnot, and also, um, them being able to get to the CTS um, easily. Uh, we're opening our doors from nine to nine um, starting July 4th. And we did that to give them more access uh, for longer periods of time, um, which we think is really wonderful. But if they move to Bell Park, then my concern and the concern of my, my other team members is that uh, they they won't uh, they won't as easily access the um, the CTS and may decide, especially in the morning and uh, later in the evening, to use at Bell Park. And if that's the case, then it makes us um, it makes it that much harder for us to be able to access them. Usually, if there are overdoses um, outside the CTS. Um, we're able to run with our gear and um, start, uh, you know, resuscitation or, or whatever we need to do. We can't, you know, race down to Bell Park, and that is really, really, really concerning to me. Um, we're we want to save lives. These people are our family. We care very much for them, and they are members of the community as well. Um, my other sort of question is why why would you spend any amount of, of money moving them when they're really not bothering anybody other than people who walk to trails and uh, <clears throat> complain about them being there, which I think is really un, unfounded. Um, also, uh, that $150,000 you say you need to clear, clean up the area could be better used to permanently house um, people or, you know, put into more funding for, for other things um, that involve the unhoused. Um, and the 220000 or actually it's the $220,000 you, you feel you're going to have to spend for um, Bell or uh, the, the land around where uh, our unhoused are um, camping, um, then it just doesn't make sense to me. And $150,000 is too much as well when they really need to stay put. Uh, it's the safest place for them. Um, and 
that's how I feel. I just think that it's a really horrible idea when we're trying very hard to help them survive um, and be safe by, by uh, opening our doors for a longer period of time. 30 um, seconds. So I kind of feel like you have some um, explaining to do as far as I'm concerned. Um, you, you, need to, you need to explain why you would want to spend $220,000 on cleaning a certain area of, of land when all of it is contaminated. It just doesn't make sense. It makes more sense to leave them where they are. We've cleaned the area. We make sure that it's, it's tidy and clean, and so do um, okay. the other Okay. Okay. Th thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, are there any questions from Council? Councilor Ostroff? Yes, um, thanks, Mayor Patterson. Um, thank you for your report. I'm just wondering, where, uh, where is your program located? I appreciate what you, everything it's you're that, saying. It's at the Integrated Care Hub. It's at oh. 661 okay. um, Montreal Street. That's where you are. Okay, thank you. I just need clarity. Yeah. I, I really appreciate everything you're saying. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and with that, we'll move to our next delegation. We will invite Crystal Wilson to speak to Council. Uh, Ms. Wilson, welcome, and you have the floor. Good evening. I, um, you've, you've heard from me a lot, and I think what's more important is that you hear from people who are currently, currently experiencing the traumas that we're talking about tonight. So I have with me a graduate of our cabin community at 7 or 70, and I would like you to listen to him. Hello, my name is Corey. I'm wearing a mask because we're traveling and I just don't trust uh, all that yet. But um, I was brought up in a normal family, mom and dad. I was taught right from wrong and I ended up on the streets. I never did stay at a shelter because I didn't want to be robbed. I didn't want to be involved in the drug scene, beat up, all that good stuff. So I ended up in the woods and I was there for three years. I have 30 years experience driving trucks and I've never had an accident and I couldn't get a job because I couldn't pay my cell phone bill. Every place I called gave me a job on the phone until they realized I didn't have a cell phone. So I resorted in order to survive with no income to, you know, getting scrap steel, turning it in for money, Oh, anything I could do to survive. I was starving. I have frozen to death. I have starved. And excuse my language, it was hell, literally. Crystal found me last year in the woods and invited me to the cabin community. I did not want to go because I didn't want to be involved in anything that was going on there. So after spending a winter down there and having the tools I needed phones, food, all the things that I had to do to survive in the woods, I could now just put aside and use all that time to get back on my feet with all the tools that she made available to me, uh, a free, safe place to sleep at night, um, food whenever I wanted, a shower whenever I wanted, no one giving me a hard time about anything. I could relax. And that's what it took for me to get back on my feet. And I managed to do so. At first, <clears throat> I was married for 18 years. I have three beautiful daughters. One's a nurse, one's a paramedic, and one's 14. And I had a car when my wife and I split up that I lived in for a while. When I had no money, my insurance ran out. The police, you know, you can't sleep here. You can't sleep there. You can't be in the carpool. You can't be in the shopping mall parking lot. You can't, can't, can't. So there was no support. There was no help. There was no offering me help. No one told me that I could go to Martha's table and get a meal. Nobody told me of any resources of any sort. All I knew is there was a shelter I could go to and get robbed and beat up and whatever, which now that I know better, doesn't really happen that much. My concern tonight is the safety of the citizens of Kingston, the downtown core, and all this talk about the dangers that homeless people are creating for everyone. I have never seen a homeless person attack somebody or give them a hard time, maybe trying to get change off them or something like that. But the real people that are in danger 
out there in today's society are the people that are sleeping in tents in the woods, freezing to death, starving to death, getting robbed, getting attacked. How many cases do you hear of homeless people attacking the citizens of Kingston? I've not yet to hear of one, but I hear about it every day from people that stay at the hub. I have never stayed in a shelter. I am now housed. I'm starting a job this week, back trucking. I lost my license because I was being, I won't say harassed, but I was being pulled over twice a week once I was targeted for living in my car. And instead of trying to help me get back on my feet, fine after fine after fine, knowing I have no job, knowing I have no way to pay these fines, I ended up with no license, no job, no phone, no support. I spent three years in the woods. Thirty. And I wish my worst enemy. Thank you for letting me speak tonight, and I hope I make some kind of an impact for the homeless people out there. We're not all drug addicts. We're not all mental health people. There's a lot of people that need help, and they're suffering, and it is horrific. Thank you okay. very much. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Are there any questions from members of council? Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Worship. Uh, Corey, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, thank you for sharing your life experience with us. It's crucial that we hear from people that experience homelessness and, and the horrors of it, as you described. You described a cycle of permanently being moved along by the authorities, told you couldn't sleep in your car, all that stuff. It, recently, you got to stay in the cabin community, and as you know, there was 10 cabins at, at start, and they were all filled up fairly quickly, so you probably feel fairly lucky with that. Do you think it would make sense, in the report it talks about adding five cabins to the system to go to 15, do you think that's a good idea? And also, do you think that maybe we could even go higher than that? I think it is a good idea for sure, but I also believe that putting all those people together in one setting is just a feeding frenzy for drugs and fighting and robbing and stealing. I think 10 cabins or 15 is maximum on different sites across the city, not near downtown, not near where there's a lot of houses because of the going ons and stuff that happens at these places. But I think small encampments across the outskirts of the city would be the answer, a good start. Because when you put a whole bunch of people together like the hub, it's just a feeding frenzy for every kind of activity there is. Okay. Right, so I guess, uh, so what you're saying is 10 or 15 max in one spot, but we could have theoretically five or 10, 10 cabin camps, right? Like 10 different, 10 times 10, 100 cabins if in different locations, and that would be, that would probably work, you're saying? Well, I, I think it would work a lot better than putting, you know, 200 people in one spot. Okay, sure. thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, next is Councillor Neal. Thank you. A uh, quick question for Crystal, if I might. Um, it's my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, that, um, that your current 10, in fact, were not taxpayer funded. They came from uh, a, unite, uh, a donation to the United Way by concerned citizens here in Kingston. Is that accurate? Um, I, mean, I think city staff can, can handle the finance question because I didn't actually pay for the cabins or we didn't pay for it through OLS, but there was in total $250,000 donated towards the pilot projects um, yeah. and those were, I believe, used to purchase the cabins. Thank, and then, thank you very did, much. We're not allowed to ask staff questions during that okay. period, but, so I, but I okay. think you gave the correct answer. Thank okay. you. The, with, oh. the, with the recommendation that coming forward, um, would you be able to incorporate those five or even potentially a few more into your current uh, setting or your current plans? 
<laughs> so um, I think, you know, it's really working with the city of Kingston staff and facility staff to figure out a site plan for the locations. Um, I think 15 is the maximum that we should have at any one site, just like Corey said. Um, but 15 is doable. We just need to make sure we have additional staff on site. We currently operate with one and sometimes two staff on site because Center 70 is so large. Um, but with 15 um, residents, we would definitely have to have two staff on site at any time. Plus, we use the, uh, we, you know, encourage the support from addiction, mental health services and home-based housing and any other service agencies that we need to engage with our residents. Thank you, and thanks okay. for all you d you've done. Thank you. Okay. If there are no other questions, uh, Ms. Wilson and Corey, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll move to our next delegation. We will invite Jamie Swift to speak to council. Mr. Swift, welcome, and I will hand the floor over to you. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks for listening to my two cents worth about such important complex issues. I've written this week to council about encampments, including my brief to the city's recent housing task force. So you have that. Uh, it argues housing is a human right, not a market commodity. I'm not sure how the uh, corrosive anti-loitering sentiments somehow got mixed in with the encampment issue. Um, from the initial delegations, it could well be that the full course court press by some members of the business community uh, was involved, but there you have it. Um, I lived downtown in Kingston for 33 years and I've been supporting local merchants consistently and enthusiastically. After the SNR closed and a bunch of us organized a party for the store and its workers, a group of us initiated DARN, the Downtown Action and Revitalization Network. And DARN spent years at Valentine's Day offering merchants posters supporting downtown merchants. I love seeking, seeing people I know. I love independent businesses. Some of these remain on doors years later. So against that background, it would be good to know exactly which businesses want to sweep the streets of poor people, not vulnerable people. Uh, that's the uh, discourse used by uh, many people in the business community, apparently, but poor and destitute people, deprived and excluded people. So panhandlers and shopping carts, these are two distinct issues because not all of our fellow citizens who use shopping carts for their few paltry belongings actually panhandle. And I appreciate Ms. Varma's insights into the issue of shopping carts as something that you know, reflects just how destitute people are. And of course, not all panhandlers have shopping carts. Subtle distinctions, but important. Are we alarmed about seeing poverty in our faces when we go downtown? Yes, so we should be. Are we offended? Yes, we should be. Is our reaction one of empathy and solidarity, offering everything we can do to help, as so many agencies and citizens do here in Kingston? Or do we regard people as a problem to be managed? Managed, that was the term used by one of the early delegations. As a downtown resident and a patron of independent businesses, I know many of my neighbors, how many of our, my neighbors feel about these questions. So I'll just leave it by talking a little bit about upstream. Seven years ago, council unanimously supported a guaranteed livable basic income. It's an idea that crosses the political spectrum I know that Councillor Bohm and Councillor Kiley have been strongly in support. Kingston was the first city in Canada to adopt unanimously support for universal livable basic income. And this week, the Halifax Regional Council did the same thing. So why don't we pay renewed attention to the causes of destitution in one of the world's richest places and stop wondering about how we're going to shuffle the deck of, of our poor people and people who are suffering from poverty. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions from council? I can just see the screen. Okay, seeing none, uh, Mr. Swift, thank you very much. Uh, and with that, we will move to our next delegation. We will invite uh, Sieta Jaffer to speak to council. 
Ms. Jaffer, welcome, and uh, you have the floor. Uh, good evening. Thanks for allowing me to speak tonight. Um, my name is Seda, and I'm a resident on Rideau Street. I live about 10 minutes to the hub. I want to, I just have some aspirational things I wanted to share, which kind of inter or interact with the report that we saw tonight. I want to live in a city where everyone has housing that's affordable, accessible to their needs, and that they consider acceptable. And while we're on our way to that city, I want a city where people who are unhoused are not perceived as problems, but instead people who have needs that deserve to be met and on their terms. I'm glad that more low barrier options might get funded tonight because they will provide people who are unhoused with more choice. Plus helping nonprofits purchase housing in the community helps, pe helps keep housing affordable instead of being purchased for investment purposes that often lead to rent evictions and more gentrification. And while it may be helpful that some shelters can increase their capacity, shelters are not housing and where housing people who are unhoused in shelters is not a solution, which we all know nor is it a meaningful alternative for everyone who is living outside. There simply aren't enough low barrier shelter or housing options being provided, even with the additional plans. So how can we reinstate the encampment protocol when there aren't enough appropriate alternatives? It's a human desire to want to feel free, to feel some power and agency over our own lives. I don't believe in absolute freedom. I think freedom must always be in conversation with responsibility to other people and the earth. Um, and I'm also concerned about how some of the proposals tonight will limit the freedoms of people who are unhoused, people who struggle with their mental health and more. I think there's a lot of fear in our community and people of people we don't understand. It seems that there are lots of people judging, people who are struggling with lots of factors in their lives. Um, and I think sometimes we could be spending more time focusing on the systems that are complicit in producing inequality in our city. Homelessness is a manufactured problem. It's true that the municipality didn't create this problem and has made some progress with committing to building more housing units than past councils, though there's always more we can do. And if we can do things like find a lot of money to build the third crossing, I think we can find a way to house all our local residents in ways that are acceptable to them. I wanna live in a city that doesn't try to push or hide a problem through anti-loitering or removing shopping carts or evicting tents from parks. This pushes marginalized people to further margins. And in some cases, it increases the risk of people moving into places that need to be protected like Bell Island, a place that deserves more respect from all residents of Kingston. I like downtown Kingston because it's still mixed in terms of who's on the street. The folks who are asking for money to me are part of the downtown experience. And when I'm down there, I like visiting them. Public space is for everyone and even more so for people who lack a home or have limited access to private space. I wanna live in a city where resources and time is put towards building healthy and connected neighborhoods where people know their neighbors across class and other differences and where people solve problems together. I think the ICH is doing great work right now with the local neighborhood to build connections between neighbors and people living in the park. I wanna live in a city where decisions are reviewed through a lens of power, who has power and who is marginalized and lacks power. And how do we make sure that people who are most marginalized are not left out of decision-making that, and that their needs are prioritized? People who struggle are part of this city. They deserve spaces to be. And if you live near a park with people living in the park, I encourage you to think about going there with a friend or a neighbor, bring some bottled water or a snack and say hi. Introduce yourself and ask how they're doing. This might make you nervous, though um, it also feels good to make new connections and to give it a try. You might uh, surprise yourself with how easy it is once you try. And if you want someone to go with you, contact me, I will. <laughs> um, likewise, um, I, I want to also flag that I think it would be helpful if the city put resources into educating the public about homelessness and mental health stigma and discrimination against people who are unhoused and facing other challenges. I think we might be having a very different conversation if uh, there was more education that was kind of um, supported and resourced through the city. I also just want to talk a bit about the anti-loitering bylaw now to be called the nuisance bylaw. I appreciate the staff addendum that was released later today, though I don't agree that the public had been consulted. Where are the survey results or summary of meetings um, and or conversations with people who would be directly affected by this change in approach, um, being the people who are spending time on the street? I think we allocate a lot of public space to things like patios, so I'm not sure why um, shopping carts on streets are a problem. I think that that also can be part of our public space because it's really critical infrastructure and resources for people who are unhoused. 30 seconds. Um, thanks. I have compassion for downtown workers who are facing challenges. And I also think criminalizing and surveilling our way out of this isn't a solution. 
downtown needs to continue to be for everyone. And I just want to ask you to please center the needs of people who are unhoused and show compassion towards their needs when you're making your decisions tonight. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from council? Okay. Seeing none, Ms. Jaffer, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll move to our final delegation. We will invite Matthew Gaventer to speak to council. Mr. Gaventer, welcome. And I will hand the floor over to you. Thank you. I'm not sure you can see me. That's fine. Um, can you hear me? We can hear you fine. Hey, thank you. Thanks for allowing me to appear. I didn't expect to be last, and uh, there's so many wonderful comments made. It's been a while since I appeared before you, and it's an honor, privilege to be here with you. Uh, I was thinking what I've heard and after I had read the report. And I was thinking, what would I do if I was a counselor? I think the first thing I would do is say, whoops, I think I made a mistake in my uh, directions on this uh, task. Because I seem to have said, uh, find a low-cost way of doing this. And what's clear is there's no low-cost way of doing this. $220,000 would buy one unit. So it's not going to solve the housing price. So we have to find other ways of deal, getting a, affordable housing into this city. And, you, and that would help. So what else would I do? Number one, I would not vote for the loitering bylaw. Now, as was said, there was no discussion on it. There was, there was no, uh, in general, in the public, it, it's, it's been plopped in the middle, and it doesn't necessarily reflect the, uh, the real, how people uh, feel about it or what other options there are. I think that Ms. Varna uh, made a wonderful uh, point about this. You know, what's the underlying problem? The underlying problem is people have effects and have nowhere to put them. So they carry them around on their backs and on their, in their shopping carts. And I think the city has to find a way of, of addressing that. I mean, even when you talk about, oh, well, we'll uh, take control of their effects and we'll keep them for 60 days, and then if they can't deal with them, we'll throw them out. It's like uh, impersonal and uncaring. And so I think that whole, that's the first thing I would do. It's clear. It's simple. No to that. Let's look at that problem further and see, or that issue further, and see what needs to be done to address it. The second thing is, I would, I would not vote for the encampment, not because I'm convinced that there isn't a place for it. Some people wanted to be in Bell Island, some didn't. But the problem is, it was there was no provision of resources, a minimal resources. And it's clear if you provide that kind of a setting for people with who have a, many who have a serious uh, social challenges, the, the social, they, even have, they have the first social challenge of nowhere to live, which is the first problem that has to be solved. And then they have all kinds of other possible, possibly other social challenges, and you're not providing the resources to, to address them. Well, redesign the whole thing, rethink it, and provide the adequate resources uh, to help people make a go of it. Uh, that's, uh, and to make it, uh, that seems to be what, where, what I would do. I have not, not, much more, not, not much more to say, except this. I remember when the, when the psychiatric hospitals were decommissioned or, closed, or, or population were dumped on the street. Do you remember what, when, on what, what the promise was? The promise was we'll provide resources for them in the community. We'll make their community lives better. Was it provided? No. And, that, and so that's where we are now. We've been doing that for 40 years. And now we're doing it again. I hope I don't have much more to say. I hope that was useful. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gventer. Are there any questions from Council? Councillor Strad? Thank you, Mr. Gventer. Uh, you, you, as always, your passion is, is very important on these files uh, to help the less fortunate in, in our city. 
What do you think of the suggestion in the report of adding more sleeping cabins? Is that a good idea? And, and if so, why? And if not, why not? Anything that works and that helps is useful. It needs to be implemented. We're in a crisis. Apparently, for some people, it works and it works well. So, yeah, add them. So, yeah. I, I, I'm not an expert on, on that area. You know, my experience was in prison, 26 years working in prison. I've run into these issues, but in a controlled, rigid setting. And uh, people are different, need different things. And that was a big part of what we had to, what we needed to do, and maybe didn't do, was address the problem, the, the, the styles and needs of people from where they're at. Okay, thank you. Uh, if there are no other questions from council, Mr. Venter, thank you very much. Thank you for letting me speak. Okay. I hope it was a useful uh, Thank you. Uh, so we have no further delegations. Um, we do have a briefing which will come uh, shortly. Are there any petitions to present? Uh, if not, then at this time I will, um, we will look at the motion to resolve into Committee of the Whole, uh, which has been moved by Deputy Mayor Hill, uh, seconded by Councillor Kiley. Uh, it says that in accordance with section 6.6 .6 of the City of Kingston Council Procedural Bylaw, Council resolve itself into Committee of the Whole to consider the following report, staff reports and related items, uh, and they are the reports with respect to the Encampment Pilot Project and Homelessness Services Options, uh, 805 Ridley Drive, West Wing, Interim Use and Development Plan, and the Supplemental Report as well. Uh, so we will call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, and that's carried. Okay, so um, what I will propose at this point, just looking at our time, it's 8.03. Uh, I propose we'll take a 10 minute break and then we will, uh, so at 8.13 we will reconvene uh, with the presentation from staff.
Okay, folks, it is uh, 8.15, so uh, we will reconvene. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Deputy Clerk, first up, I will ask for, uh, find my place here. So we'll move to reports, and I will ask for report number 66 from the CAO. Moved by Councillor Oosterhoff, seconded by Councillor Holland, that report number 66 from the Chief Administrative Officer recommend be received and adopted clause by clause. Okay, so first we have Clause 1A. We have a briefing from uh, Lanny Hurdle, CAO, uh, to brief us on Clause 1B of Report Number 66 with respect to the Encampment Pilot Project and Homelessness Services Options. Uh, CAO Hurdle, you have the floor. Hear me? Okay. Now you can. Um, so Jenna Morley will also assist me with this presentation because she does have some very valuable information around liability that she'll be able to brief you on. Um, so before I get started, I, I just want to say that I've been working with the City of Kingston since 2006, and I think this has to be probably the most challenging file, and God knows I've had my share of controversial files. <laughs> But this is probably the most challenging file that I had to, uh, to lead. And part of the reason for that is because this is not something that we can solve alone. And I appreciate the community partnership, but I mean, we do need support from other levels of government. Um, we can make a small difference alone, but it's not going to get to the root cause of some of the issues that we're trying to address. So first of all, the we're here tonight, obviously, because there were two motions that were passed by City Council on May 12. One was to ask staff to not proceed with evictions of individuals that were in encampments and to bring back some um, housing options, which we are going to be proposing tonight. So we do have a number of housing options that are being proposed. The second one was to um, consult with a number of key stakeholders, with people in encampments, and to bring back information on this consultation and options for encampments, which could include Bell Park uh, next to the ICH and possibly other locations. And um, that again, we report back because we didn't have any budget to implement anything and staff would never act without any budget approvals from council. So to report back with these options, which we are also gonna be discussing uh, tonight. So what the, the report tries to address are those two motions, but we've also added certain things to, uh, to the report. Uh, the first one is to support our partners and operators of the ICH to try to find a location that can increase capacity. We know that there are individuals that are camping near the ICH that do want to access the ICH. They would like to be in the building, but the ICH is constantly since August 2020 at capacity. You've heard from multiple people tonight that we need more low barrier um, type of service. The ICH was established to do exactly just that. I remember when we were dealing with the Bell Park encampment back in 2020, and that's what people were demanding. They were demanding for low barrier service which is what was provided in the, C in the ICH, but obviously is not currently sufficient to meet the need and demand. It also recommends that we proceed with the donation of a vehicle to street outreach. This is something that we've done in the past. Actually, that's part of how we did establish the street outreach program. The city did donate a vehicle at that time. And I do need to, to speak to this because I know it came up um, quite a few times. We've heard a lot of community concerns in the last engagement, but also in the last couple of years. And yes, some of them are business, but a number of them are not necessarily here tonight, but I'm sure you've received emails from individuals in your districts, because I've also received some. Their concerns with behavior, their concerns with what has been happening in their parks, and in some cases, very real situations have recently taken place in one of our parks downtown involving a child. So to think that there are no issues or concerns, um, I think is not, is not accurate. There are some, and this is why when we look at 
the two things that are in front of council. One is we currently have a, an existing streets bylaw. So just to be clear, people are thinking we're bringing a streets bylaw. We are not. It exists. It was discussed during the process of the downtown improvement plan, which included a number of social services provider, and it was recommended by the group, and this was brought to council in March of 2022, that we amend the streets bylaw to have stronger provisions to enable basically access, proper access and safe um, access on our sidewalks. So the recommendation to make the changes tonight to the streets bylaw is a follow up from the downtown improvement plan to look at ways to provide more accessibility on the sidewalks. The other one is a change in recommendation to the public nuisance bylaw. Council does not have a bylaw in front of you tonight to consider. It's strictly a direction to staff to work on developing a public nuisance bylaw, which would include engagement before anything is brought back to council for consideration. There are a number of municipalities in Ontario of similar size that have those types of bylaw already in place. One thing that the report does not address, and I want to be clear about that because we've heard quite a lot about this tonight, that we need to do something about addiction mental health. I agree. People need help. There's no question about that. But from a municipal perspective, we have limitations in terms of what we can afford to support. We know that the province collects income tax, and income tax goes to fund health care. Municipalities are not structured, although we have been in some ways funding programs like Family Physicians or ICH, we're not structured to be able to sustain healthcare programs. So no, this report does not address this particular issue or the opioid crisis. We do need the province to step up and provide better service across the board. This is not just Kingston. So I want to provide you with a bit of information. I know you have the numbers for the people that are unhoused in our community as of basically the end of May. You do see a decrease in the numbers from January until uh, the end of May, which is a good sign and I would say that's in part because of some of the programs that City Council has decided to fund and support. I also want to bring to your attention the amount of investment that this council has made. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be investing. I'm just saying people are saying that the city is not investing enough, not doing enough. And I understand the need is greater, most likely, than what the municipality can afford. Because, again, health care is very expensive. But just to put it in perspective, in the last two years, Council has approved and supported um, over $17 million. Actually, one piece that is missing here is the um, street outreach program. That's about $250,000. So that amount is, is higher than what you're seeing actually on the screen tonight. And I want to bring to your attention that these programs are all intended to serve people that are homeless. So the people on the by name list, so you think of 200 people, give or take, and this is what these programs and this funding have been going towards trying to support and help around 200 people. So I think the city has done a lot. It doesn't mean we can't do more. Actually, tonight you have recommendations that are proposing almost another $700,000 in investment so I think there's a recognition that the city is doing even more to help these 200 individuals that we have that are currently on our by name list. But I want to make sure that you also recognize that you have also collectively made decisions that have led to significant investment in the last two years. I will also point out that <clears throat> You'll probably recall when we were dealing with the Bell Park encampment in 2020, we had about 40 to 50 people in the encampment. And at the time, we had 68 shelter beds. And our shelters were not at capacity. And what we heard, of course, is we need low barrier. And, and we did provide that. 
but even with all of these additional spaces that we've funded and provided, we're still seeing the number of, of homeless individual that need support and need to be housed are around the same as what they were. At that time, I think we were around 235 individuals that were on the by name list, and even after these investments and in new services being introduced, we're at 203. So we've made some progress, but like I said, it is a limited progress because there are other services that do need to be supported and funded. So out of the by name list, we have about 30% that reside with family and friends. We would usually encourage people to reside with family and friends if they can. Unless a situation is unsafe, then we would recommend that they actually seek other type of accommodation. But if they have a safe space with family and friends, we would never recommend to people that they should leave that space and go to shelters, for example. So looking at our current spaces in shelters, and we have a variety of different shelters, so it's not just one location. We have different locations, different programs. We're at about 135 spaces. We were at 68 prior to the pandemic two years or three years ago. This uh, report proposes an additional eight beds in the overflow, which you heard from Addictions Mental Health. It's more stabilization bed that deals with detox, which are critical again, but they're a critical part of the healthcare system as well. Um, in from the cold, I think you had a report at the last council meeting. There was a question that was asked, I believe, by Councillor Osanic about capacity. Yes, that needs to increase, and we're looking at up to seven beds in terms of increase. Sleeping cabins, you've heard over and over again that the program is working well, but you also heard that it shouldn't be too big of a program in one location. And this is why we're recommending five sleeping cabins. We are working right now on another location or a more permanent location for sleeping cabins, and we will be bringing that back to City Council most likely by August. Um, Don House Transitional Housing, 29 units, and you heard from the ED from Don House tonight that uh, spoke about Ridley, 805 Ridley. And we have also a proposal to redirect the home ownership funding program that the municipality has put in place a number of years ago, redirect that and make that available to non-for-profit so they can actually put some down payments and purchase some housing which can serve as transitional housing. So we are looking at about 20 uh, units there. In total, looking at about 204 um, spaces. So some of the challenges, and I've talked about this, we do have a responsibility to provide housing, no question there. But housing is only part of the solution. So, and what we're seeing, and I'm gonna be speaking frankly tonight, what we're seeing is sometimes we're seeing people that we've housed multiple times that are still homeless. Because the issue is not just about finding housing, it's about finding the right support services. We do know that some individuals do need support services in order to remain successfully housed. This is why transitional housing is so important. So again, finding housing, yes, critical, but only part of the solution. Um, during the, uh, the process that, uh, that we undertook in terms of engagement, we have heard from individuals that are staying in some of the encampments. Some of them were quite clear that it doesn't matter which services are available, they want to stay in encampments. And some of them have been in encampments for, for years and years. So it's not necessarily a new way of living for some people, and some people are not don't necessarily have a desire to change that lifestyle at this point. So I do want to point that out because even if we provided more housing, it doesn't mean that individuals would want to access the, hou the housing. Um, again, the healthcare piece, it's very complex and we know that uh, a number of people, I'm not saying all, but we know that a number of people do need that support, which is why the ICH is in such high demand and we can't obviously keep up with the demand inside the building. Part of it too that I wanna point out is we do have, from a city perspective, we do have a responsibility in terms of our 
overall residents. So tonight you actually had a delegation about someone that's looking at possibly being evicted. We have a number of situations where we have people on low income. They may not be in a camp, but there are low income individuals that are struggling to maintain their housing. While I appreciate the $18 million to support the 200 individuals that we have that are homeless, very important, and another six or 700,000 tonight, and I'm sure more to come with more sleeping cabins. I also think that from a municipal perspective, we need to start to look at investing more in prevention. So how do we increase our rent supplements to make sure that people don't get in, evicted? How do we put these mechanisms in place? But doing that may also mean looking at shifting some of our funding because I think that's where we can make a significant difference from a municipal perspective. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jenna at this point. So nice to see you all in person for the first time ever, I think. So through the council motion, staff were directed to report back on the municipal bylaws that would need to be waived in order to permit a temporary encampment. So in addition to waiving the encampment protocol itself, council would be required to waive section 11 of the city's parks and recreation facilities bylaw, which prohibits the use of camping equipment and camping itself in any city park unless expressly permitted in the bylaw. The purpose of the no camping provision is twofold. First, when read as a whole, the objective of the Parks and Recreation Facilities Bylaw is to ensure that all residents in the city can make use of this common resource. It balances the different uses that might be made of parks, and it ensures that all residents can enjoy the park without having an adverse impact on surrounding properties. The second purpose behind the no camping restriction is to mitigate the risk of liability to the city. Under the Occupier's Liability Act, the city has a statutory duty to ensure that all persons entering on city property and their belongings are reasonably safe, having regard to all the circumstances. If the city fails to meet that statutory duty, the city can and will be liable for damages. A central reason for prohibiting camping in city parks is that in most cases, the city is simply unable to meet its statutory duty to keep people safe, particularly during the overnight hours when the risk of harm is inherently greater. When the city permits camping or residential uses in a city park, the city will be subject to a higher statutory duty of care under the legislation to keep people safe and is obligated to provide reasonable precautions to protect individuals on city property. The standard is one of reasonableness. It's not perfection, but we are obligated to protect against known and foreseeable dangers. In this situation, there are very clear known dangers associated with encampments, including sexual assault, theft, violence, overdose, and other health and safety concerns. We've seen instances of these events on a regular basis. If council elects to authorize an encampment on city property, the city will have a duty to address these issues and implement a reasonable system to keep people safe. As staff have been directed to provide low cost options for a temporary encampment, the measures being proposed include things like signage and intermittent daytime patrols by city bylaw officers. Dedicated 24-hour security for the encampment is not being prescribed under these proposed low-cost solution. I want to be frank that having regard to all of the circumstances and the very real and known dangers associated with encampments, I'm of the opinion that an authorized encampment, particularly one that lacks 24-hour dedicated security, would pose a very real risk of liability to the city and perpetuate what is already a very unsafe situation. Turn it back over to CAO Hurdle. Thank you. So I actually pass it over at the wrong slide, but that's okay. You've already covered the one later. Um, the report also includes information on um, other jurisdiction and what's being done. And I think what we found is that there is nowhere else in Canada where they're providing uh, sanctioned encampment. Now in the US, it's a little bit different, but again, to uh, the points made earlier, 
security is critical um, in terms of any encampments that are provided, and that's what we're seeing in terms of the examples in, in the US. Um, there was some engagement, I will say, though limited because of the limited time that, that we had to figure out some options, figure out how it could work, and then work with the partners and the public. So we did uh, engage with people that are on house, the partners, members of the public, and uh, housing and homelessness committee as well. So the recommendations, I talked a little bit about this already in terms of housing options that are being proposed and recommended to council. So those are clear recommendations in your report from staff. And then what we have provided for council's consideration are options for encampment. Because what we wanted to do was to provide you with a list of different options and then council can choose what they would like to do if they'd like to mix these different options. So the first one is to provide an encampment close to the ICH, where there are currently tents that are located. This one would start a little bit later because there does need to be some soil, soil remediation. You're aware of the property next door at 661 Montreal, where the record of site condition is clear that people are not to be uh, residing on the ground floor. Um, there are some things that were found as well when we did the environmental sample for uh, this particular property. And that's also why you see the cost is higher because the remediation cost would, would be included in this uh, almost $210,000. Option two is uh, location at Bell Park. And this one could start earlier, so mid-July and the cost is estimated slightly over $74,000. Option three would be another location that hasn't yet been determined or confirmed. We have put together a list of uh, potential criteria and some potential option, actually one that was mentioned in the report, but it is not recommended at this point unless council wanted to have a third option. And that one would be, again, estimated at slightly over $74,000. Option four is one where council can pick and choose any of the number two, one, two, three, in combination. And option five, I'm gonna be clear, is there because if council was not to choose op between option one and four, city staff needs some kind of direction of what you would like to do. So, this is for clarity purpose. In terms of low cost amenity facilities, what does that include? It include a garbage dumpster, some porta potties with end washing stations, sharp containers. Uh, we looked at whether or not there were amenities in walking distance and monitoring only uh, by bylaw on a daily basis during regular uh, working hours of city bylaw. So again, that's the cost that you have in your report is based on those services. What well, would it cost to provide additional services? And I, again, will say staff did not include those costs in the options because, to be frank, we were concerned that it would be perceived by the community and possibly some members of council of trying to inflate the numbers so that council would not approve an encampment. So it's kind, of, it's kind of a situation where there's no win, you don't include it, and then people are asking you why you didn't. So you do have the information, but we did not include it. Security would be about $170,000, 24-7 for four months. Electrical services, depending on location, um, could be up to 50,000 per site. Water, up to 10,000. Showers. 10,000 per site, kitchen, those would be mobile, of course, 16,000, and storage, if we want to have storage on site, about $1,000. Um, so depending on selection, depending on the site, it could be up to an additional $257,000 per site, above and beyond the costs that are in your options. Those would, of course, not be low-cost amenities. They would be uh, pretty well-serviced, similar to basically the sleeping cabin model. 
So we were also tasked to look at some encampment rules. Um, the list doesn't include all the rules that are in your report, but I do want to mention a few of them. Uh, the size, for example, the area is bigger than what we have at Lake Ontario Park because we want to make sure people would have space for tent, but also a sitting area, those types of things. The campers um, to be uh, registered. And the reason for that is because a couple of things. One is we have experienced people leaving their housing situation to go live in encampments. So we've seen that in the last little while. Uh, this is not something we want to encourage. Actually, we're trying to do the opposite. We're trying to find housing for people that are living in encampments. We have also seen situations and have been told by individuals that they're coming here for the weekend to attend the parties in the encampments that are from other communities. So again, those are the things that by registering people and being able to know who is residing where, we would be able to have a better sense of who's supposed to be there and who's not supposed to be there. Um, of course, garbage disposal, things like uh, people keeping their area clean, no motorized vehicles. We've seen that also happening recently in the Bell Park area where there have been motorized vehicle, one that we had to get removed. Um, no other structures other than tents, uh, obviously campfires, cooking stove. We want to make sure that we're following proper open air fire guidelines there. Um, the consumption in terms of alcohol, smoking, vaping, that not be allowed elsewhere in the park area. Quiet hours that are in accordance with the noise bylaw, uh, violence not being tolerated. And of course, if we have a non-supervised uh, encampment location, we would need to identify that. Jenna's already covered this one, thank you. And uh, just to wrap up um, some of the other changes you're seeing, again, the donation encampment protocol, the change from 48 hours to two hours. So this is something that, that we, we did look at other, other jurisdiction. Uh, one in particular has gone in that direction, which is uh, Peterborough. And for those of you who followed the last number of years in Peterborough, they've had a number of challenges with encampments. Um, I do want to point out one thing, though. Bylaw only responds to complaints. So we don't send bylaws through our parks or other properties to try to find people that are camping. We know that there are people that are camping either on public property or on private property that are not disturbing anyone, and, and that's fine. And that's the approach that we've taken since the beginning of you know, the implementation of, of the bylaw and the encampment protocol. Um, we respond when there are public complaints. Um, again, changes to the existing street bylaw uh, as per the downtown improvement plan. And again, this is about the structures and the carts, and we do have free storage. So I heard the comment earlier, we have two locations for free storage where people can put their belongings if they would like to do that. Um, it's not about the individuals. We're not talking about removing people from the streets, but we're talking about making sure the sidewalks are clear and safe for people to be able to walk um, on the sidewalks. And the last one is direction to develop and report back to committee, because I'm sure it would go to committee and council on a potential draft public nuisance bylaw. And that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so what we'll do now is we'll do a, a question period. We are in Committee of the Whole, so it doesn't preclude you from asking questions later on. There will be multiple rounds, but maybe what I'll do first. So are there any questions just directly related to that presentation that we want to hit first? Councillor Strutt. This may be a question for Ms. Morley, but it's regarding the encampment protocol. So. Currently, this and as it relates directly to citizen uh, emails and complaints that we've had about encampments all over the city. So uh, it's not clear from the options in the recommendation what happens to the pause on evictions uh, and the resumption of the encampment protocol. So maybe uh, could have that clarified uh, uh, based on what's in the options before us, what happens to the encampment protocol and the timing of the, of the pause on evictions. 
Ms. Morley. Thank you, and through you, Your Worship. So what was being proposed was a resumption of the encampment protocol for all other sites other than an approved encampment site. And if it is resumed, the notice period is proposed to be two hours. So what would happen is that bylaw officers would issue trespass notices to campers in the parks requiring them to leave within two hours. If they failed to vacate the park as required, then Kingston Police would be engaged to assist in removing the individuals. And if uh, council does not approve the change to the encampment protocol from 48 to two hours, it would just be the timing of the action of the eviction would be at 48 hours like it was before. Through your worship, that's correct. Okay, and uh, just hold on one second. CEO Hurdle, do you want to add anything? Thank you, uh, and through you. So yeah, just to add to that, so I you know, completely agree with what Ms. Morley is saying. The only thing I want to add is that we would hope for maybe a gradual approach in terms of trying to relocate individuals. So if council was to reactivate the protocol, we wouldn't be going in and trying to relocate everybody all at once. We would, we would try, we would hope anyways for a gradual approach. Well, I assume you'd be, you'd be responding to complaints as they came in about, about existing encampments, wherever they may be as well. Is that correct? Yeah. So another further clarification is if, uh, if, we, if option five is chosen, which does not have a sanctioned encampment area, that's, uh, you said, that's if we don't pass any of one, one through four, uh, then what happens with the encampment protocol with option five in play? Ms. Morley? Through your worship, one of the additional recommendations, recommendations that is before you tonight is to reinstate the encampment protocol. So if no authorized encampments were permitted, we'd be looking to council to approve the recommendation to reinstate the encampment protocol in its entirety. So that would if, uh, effectively mean on the, on the ground that those camped uh, outside the property of the ICH uh, in that little area uh, by uh, Montreal Street would be subject to the evictions that sort of started this whole process back in May. Through your worship, that's correct. Okay, next is Councillor McLaren. Thank you, it's just something that I heard in your presentation, Ms. Hurdle. Um, you said 17 million was spent so far by council. Um, over what period of time? I missed that part. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So it's a, it's a little bit over 17 million. It was during a period of about two years. Um, that uh, council committed. Now I do want to point out, and it was listed in my presentation, that some of it were grant dollars, but council still made the decision to reallocate those grant dollars in that direction rather than on other services. And in that case, may I ask about what proportion of that was tax dollars and what was about grant dollars? Just even a high, a high level estimate. Thank you, through. I'm, I'm going to give it a try. I'm also relying on my colleagues here. I would say probably about 50-50 would be um, city funding and grant dollars. So eight and a half million dollars of tax dollars over the last two years. Approximately. Wow. <laughs> we, we just, let's just say, just a guesstimate. Yeah. Okay, next is Councillor Osterhoff. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Just a quick question. Um, can you explain when you said shifting funding? Can, can, can you help me understand shifting funding would enable us to uh, do what? That was a term you used, and I just wanted to be more familiar with it. CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and, um, and through you. So, uh, Councillor Wusteroff, I'm assuming you're making reference to my comment about looking at ways to better support uh, prevention? Yes. Yeah. So that would include when we're looking at things like when we're pulling dollars from reserve funds or other social services funds that right. we have. Uh, right now, I would say the majority of those dollars are going to support um, programs that, that are in front of you tonight, for example, to try to address the immediate homelessness that we're seeing um, that's very much present. In the meantime, we're not obviously redirecting some of these dollars into prevention, which could lead other people eventually to homelessness as well. Thank you for that one. And um, the next question was sort of related to the 
presentation tonight um, of the um, the one couple that was nearing homelessness. And um, I hope it's okay, appropriate to ask that question. Is that something that that we are engaged in? Um, is that something, an example of what the city wants to or is equipped to handle in the homelessness scope? See you, Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. I don't have all the details, but I believe that our city bylaw and property standards have been involved in this particular situation. Having said that, for example, if this couple had to relocate, chances are apartments would be more expensive than the one they currently occupy. This is where our ability to provide maybe higher rent supplements and those types of programs could be helpful to rehouse rather than have this couple be homeless. Yeah, that was a kind of a new term for me tonight, Mayor Patterson. Um, you know, when we talked about the, the soon to be homeless and uh, uh, having been on, uh, serving on uh, the um, uh, Kingston Frontenac Housing Board, and you know, I, was, I learned this week that, you know, there's a considerable increase in, in arrears and rents and they have no choice. I think there's 50 could be wrong before before the landlord tenant board and um, you know it's very upsetting to hear that and um, but that's something else you know there's another <laughs> it's, you know storm clouds on the horizon that way as well for us to think about as we consider all that we are tonight thank you okay thank you next is councillor Neal Th thank you we all received a number of emails council did in regards to some of the issues that are being proposed. Uh, one of them was the two out going from 48 hours to two hours notice. And a lot of people in the community, I think rightfully, found that very troubling. Uh, and I'm just wondering, what was the rationale for such a drastic change in the, in the protocol? if any of us were being told, okay, in two hours, your life will be upside down, you won't have. Uh, and I appreciate that we store uh, people's belongings. They aren't getting tossed as they were several years ago. But how is two hours a kind of feasible uh, a change in protocol? CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through Mr. Mayor, I'll get started, and if my colleagues want to jump in, they can do that um, as well. So um, you're right, Councillor Neal, it is a big change, um, and, and I have heard also the concern about people having even sufficient time to, to gather their belongings and be able to, uh, to move on to other service or other location. Um, Part of the rationale was around some of the input that we got from, uh, from the general public. So we did get a lot of input, not necessarily in delegations, but I know you've also received emails of individuals that were concerned about uh, encampments and parks and wanting the city to move or act fairly quickly and the concern of having individuals that would spend a couple of days there, in some cases, maybe too long from I know people have this perception of safety and security, but in some cases it can be real. Um, so that's where that reduction of two hours. Is two hours a magic number? Maybe not. Um, but the 48 hours was definitely a two-day period, and, and there were some concerns about that amount of time being way too long. i sure I will either amend that the number of hours uh, or... I'll vote against it as a, to leave okay. the status quo. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Um, Deputy Mayor Hill. Thank you, Worship. I got a couple of questions. I'm trying to sort of looking at the two hour uh, uh, suggestion, trying to differentiate between encampments and sort of structures that might be located in the downtown. So uh, if we implemented the two hour um, eviction notice, 
would the same, or, or if we change it, would that same thing apply to someone who was living in a structure on, say, on Princess Street or in Market Square, as would apply to, to uh, people in, in encampments, or would that be immediate based on the bylaw? CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayors. So that, uh, Councillor Hill, that's a very good point, and that's something that, that could be actually implemented if, if Council wanted to look at that. So basically, it would provide um, less time for somebody who's, let's say, building a structure on Princess Street um, with a two hour to, to remove the structure. And we could look at a different time frame for an encampment situation if there was somebody in, in a park, for example. That, that's something that council could ask us to implement. Okay. So uh, just in terms of the total cost of options one through three, so basically using number four, assuming we used all the, the other three options, what would the total, what, what's the total amount of funding allocated to that? Through you, Mr. Mayor, the, um, based on low, uh, the low cost amenities, so those are the ones that we've included in the council report, I believe it's $358,000. Um, that, of course, does not include, like I said, security or other amenities that uh, council could choose to, to provide. And, and I'm just wondering, just as a follow up to that, how much do we pay out currently, and you may not know this because I'm sorry to drop this one on you, but how much do we pay out currently in rent, rent subsidies? Do you know? Thank you to you, Mayor Patterson. Um, I do not have that number uh, handy. We have a lot of different rent supplements programs, but we certainly have, um, uh, we can certainly get that information to you. What, would it be more than a million dollars? It would be more. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, any other questions? Councillor Strutt? I have a fairly simple technical question. Um, I'm not sure if anyone here can answer it, but it's regarding the nature of the land so, and, and the bylaws. So do, are any of the bylaws or is the encampment protocol specific to city parks or is it all generally municipal property of any kind? In other words, if someone was camped in the PUC yard or behind city hall or that kind of thing, is, is there a difference uh, in any of the language in that sense? And also, what is the nature of the land uh, near the ICH that's municipal, but that isn't in Bell Park? CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So um, the encampment protocol applies to all city uh, municipally owned property. So whether it's a park or the land that you referred to, Councillor Strout, next to the ICH would, would be a municipally owned property. The bylaw, the parks uh, bylaw applies specifically just to parks and not to other type of, so it wouldn't apply to the Britishwick building, for example, um, because it's not a park. So, but the encampment protocol would essentially apply to all municipally owned properties. Okay, so in the way those two bylaws uh, interact then, and this, I'm not sure whether this is how um, this can be framed, but is there something in the parks bylaw that's more restrictive than the encampment protocol, meaning that uh, complaints about anyone uh, in parks would be dealt with by the parks bylaw and not by the encampment protocol? CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, I, I see that Ms. Morley is also looking at information. She may have more to add, um, but the, the way that I understand the two documents is the parks bylaw provides basically a general uh, prohibition. So it says you're not allowed to camp. It does not get into the details of time frame. The encampment protocol was established to provide more details to try to have a process around do we provide people notice. So currently it's 48 hours, and then there's a process that's listed that, you know, bylaw will attend with street outreach, the following steps will be followed. So the encampment protocol really was there to build out what is in the bylaw that's really high level. Right, uh, so the parks bylaw might say, uh, it does say camping in parks not, permi not permitted. The encampment protocol tells a, a staff what to do about that. The, uh, if someone is camped in a non-park area, it, they're still subject to the encampment protocol because its language is broader. It says any municipal property. So really, it doesn't need to be triggered by the parks bylaw for it to come into effect. 
through you, that's correct, uh, Mr. Mayor. It, it can operate on its own on other municipally owned properties. Okay, next is Councillor Kiley. Thank you, and through you, I have the chart in mind of the number of people on the buy list name versus the spaces available. And I'm wondering if we pursue some of the additional options in the report in option five, if those numbers would uh, become closer. In other words, if essentially everyone that we have on our list would be able to have an option uh, in some type of shelter or supportive housing or whatever is uh, represented in that chart. Ms. Nordegraf. Thank you, and through you, Mayor Patterson. Um, I just wanted to um, remind Council that the by name list is both an, is, is an in and out flow, so it's not a static number at any given time. So even though we, you know, we obviously have seen a number slightly increase and, and now slightly decrease, it also continues to have people flowing in. And I know we've talked a lot about prevention and trying to get people not to actually become um, homeless. Um, uh, we have been housing uh, almost 300 people over the last two years as well. So there is really that kind of ongoing piece there. Regardless though, um, and I think we've tried to kind of clarify that in the report, is that we're really trying to get close to that number, um, uh, knowing that not everybody will accept exactly, you know, every type of service, but it is really trying to kind of get as close as possible to that number. And because we now have that ability to have a more of a real-time number, uh, we can actually also be more nimble. Um, obviously, over the next, um, you know, we, we will need some time to kind of stabilize as, as, you know, any community, I think, in, in, in Canada. But it really will allow us to get a better sense of, of need. I hope that helps. Uh, very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? Councillor Senek? Thank you, Your Worship. Through you, um, just a question to staff about the free storage. So there's two facilities that offer the storage right now to the unhoused. Where are they? And um, like, is it locked up? How does that work? Uh, thank you, and to you, Mayor Patterson. So there are two locations. One is um, uh, at um, Cook's, uh, and the other one is at Home Base Housing. So there are two kind of C containers. Street Outreach is, is helping manage that program. And actually with the approval uh, tonight of the vehicle that uh, we recommend to, to donate to Street Outreach, they will actually be able to have more uh, ability to move, uh, move items around. Um, so so there are, they are basically really managed by the Street Outreach team. Thank you. And um, is it locked storage? Like, do they get a key or every time they go there, they have to get a worker to um, open it up for them? Thank you. Through you, Mayor Patterson. It is, again, managed by staff um, with street outreach. So um, it, it is, um, um, you know, obviously used by uh, or our clients that utilize that service will, will liaise with the street outreach worker and have access at specific times. And it, it's been working quite well. It's not a, a, not every individual have their own space. It is a, a, a C container. So it is managed by staff. Thank you. And through you, your worship, um, I can't find the page number right now, but about banning the uh, grocery carts. Uh, like the shopping carts and whatnot. I saw something that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong since I can't find it right now in the document, but if a shopping cart um, uh, is found, then uh, say it's a grocery store, the grocery store will be contacted, but they'll be fined. Did, did it say something like that, they'll be fined? And, and then so it's, it's like the grocery store would be blamed for having their cart stolen or, you know, someone taking off with it. How does that work? Ms. Morley? Thank you. And through you, Your Worship, no, the grocery store wouldn't be fined. Essentially, if the city impounded a cor uh, shopping cart, it would take it to a storage facility, notify the grocery store that we have located their shopping cart, and they pay a $50 fee for retrieval of the shopping cart to offset some of the storage costs, but it's not perceived as a fine. CEO Hurdle. Thank you. I just want to add, um, Mr. Mayor, that uh, when grocery uh, stores obviously uh, have carts taken away at some point, they do need to replace them anyways. So they do have to pay a fee for replacement. So I have no doubt that the $50 would probably be cheaper than the replacement fee. 
Thank you, and through your worship, one more question, is that okay? <laughs> okay, great. So if we go, for instance, um, with option five, that is no encampment, and then if we approve um, like the updated encampment protocol as per exhibit H and reactivate the encampment protocol as of June 30th, 2022, so what happens on July 1st? Like we just heard that um, bylaw is complaint basis, and I think all of us on council knows that no matter what bylaw it is. But does that mean that then residents have to start complaining about um, particular uh, campers in order for bylaw to go there? And if it's something like Bell Park, would residents have to say, you know, like uh, in this certain area, or can they just say Bell Park, or do they have to actually give a description of what the tent looks like? How, how would that work? CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So we, we already have documented complaints, obviously, that we've received in the last month um, that are across the city, different locations and different size. I think because of the number of locations and the number of individuals that we're talking about, Councillor Senek, we would want to do this gradually. That's why I said we, we wouldn't go in there the next day and start to, to clear everything because and everybody. It's just... I don't think it's practical, and, and I don't think it would be beneficial for individuals as well that we're trying to work with. So we would probably look at areas where we have smaller numbers as a starting point of individuals and try to support the relocation and, and work our way through some of the areas that we've also received complaints but probably need more planning with our partners. So, for example, when we get to a location like Bell Park or ICH, there is no question that we would need a lot more support uh, from our partners in terms of trying to relocate people because the numbers are much larger. So it would be gradual. Thank you. And then just to finish that, um, so it kind of looks like for the entire summer, if this were to pass, staff would do a gradual thing. Um, no one in Kingston has to worry about it. And then if things pick up again or particular situations in the fall, that's when they could start co contacting the city just to make sure that the city's aware and could start to look at that. So definitely through you, Mr. Mayor, they, uh, the public can always contact city bylaw, even if let's say there's a location where, and I'm gonna use an example, Calvin Park, where we've received complaints and we went and worked with individuals that are there to relocate them. Let's say two months later, we have an encampment that's starting again. Uh, the public can contact city bylaw and we would, um, we would activate uh, the protocol the same way that we would any other location. Okay, any other questions? Councillor Neal? And if this, if I'm dumping the gun, if this is something you were gonna talk about later, that's fine. Uh, but um, loitering and nuisance bylaw, were you gonna speak about that or can I ask questions regarding that now? Yeah, great, I see some nods. Um, a couple of things. Um, the definition of loitering is standing or walking aimlessly without purpose. So I'm guilty of loitering every time I go downtown uh, because I'm going downtown without a specific purpose. And so, so I'm, I'm always troubled by loitering bylaws. Um, and I shared this with both the CAO and our city solicitor earlier today, um, in my, my family came from Chatham. I spent my teenage years in Chatham. There was a community called Wallsburg, just north of Chatham, uh, that had a loitering bylaw, uh, and I was given, and some friends were given a number of hours to leave the town, or we would be charged with loitering. It was a bylaw that took over after they were told they couldn't have uh, nobody from out of town can be in town after dark. That bylaw actually was because there was 
uh, a native reserve just north of Wallaceburg. There was a black community in Dresden. And so basically it was racism under the name of loitering. And so, so I'm a little troubled by the aspects of what loitering is because usually it's complaint driven and often it has to do with, uh, with uh, either people in poverty or people of an identifiable minority that end up getting greater enforcement. And that's why loitering, so, and I, I so know. Yeah, I'm, giving you, I'm giving you an extended, because I thought you were getting to a question, but now I'm not so sure. Yeah, I'm sure. So, uh, so <laughs> yeah, it's so been a long there, day. I apologize. Okay. But um, could you address some of those concerns that I have made? Thank you, and Ms. I apologize. Ms. Morley? Thank you, and through you, Your Worship. As CAO Hurdle pointed out earlier, you, you do not yet have a loitering bylaw or a public nuisance bylaw before you, and I do agree with many of the concerns that you've raised. I think it's going to be critical to frame the bylaw and enforce the bylaw very narrowly to ensure that it's being enacted for a valid municipal purpose, like maintenance of public safety or ensuring the efficient and safe use of public sidewalks. So when, if we come back to council with a draft bylaw, the intention is to ensure that it applies consistently and to ensure that it's serving a valid municipal purpose and not simply just to remove people who are sitting idly. Thank you. So I can safely continue to loiter on Princess Street. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Councillor Hutchison. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. The um, I've got a lot of questions about this because um, under option five, and this came up indirectly, but I, I'm not quite sure that I see what's going to happen. That is, um, under option five, there's... Um, the, 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 the encampment protocol is reinstated. And um, so my main question is, where are those people going to go? We're talking about engaging them and offering alternatives on that, but we know that a certain number of them are not going to take it. So what are we expecting to happen after that? See you, Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through Mr. Mayor. So I'll get started. My, my colleagues may want to jump in. So there, there are a couple of things. The option five in the consideration, Councillor um, Hutchison strictly basically tells um, staff or direct staff not to implement a sanction uh, encampment. The reactivation of the protocol is actually a separate recommendation in the report. Um, I don't know which line exactly, but it's at the bottom of page four of the report. So it is a, a separate one. In terms of your question about where would people go, um, this is why when the presentation went up, we identified options that would start earlier and some that would be a little bit later. So for example, we had some options that we anticipate would start in July, some in August, and we are working on additional options too that um, have come up recently and we didn't have time to include them in the report. Um, and this is also part of the reason why we would want to approach this gradually so that we can consult with people and provide or offer services. But I will be quite clear that even if we offer services, that doesn't mean people will want to take those services. For example, we know that a number of people that are around the ICH will not want to relocate somewhere else that is not close to the ICH or be able to access services at the ICH. So even if we were to offer more space at 218 concession, some individuals would say, well, I don't want to go there. So 
we would do that gradually. The options are being added gradually as well. The transitional housing options are also being added gradually. So that's what we, how we would proceed. But just to clarify, there are two separate recommendations or sections in the report. Okay, that's, that's good to know because it appeared that they were linked. The, um, I grant you there are different clauses. Um, Okay, I'll leave it that at that for the moment. Thanks. Okay. So, if there are no other questions, uh, we will move to to clause one B. Um, we are in committee of the whole, so there is a lot in front of us. So, what I'm going to propose to council is that we chunk this out. So, first, we will deal with the consider portion of clause one B. So, that is only to deal with. Uh, options one through five and then on the next page and I agree it's confusing the way it's laid out in the agenda so and I staff can correct me if I'm wrong but after option five there are several clauses that do relate to a choice of one of the previous options but once we get to the clause that council approve up to one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars from the housing and homelessness reserve to purchase five additional sleeping cabins for example that is not conditional on the other options. Those, those are separate recommendations. So what I propose is that first we will deal with the, the consider option, and then we will work our way through each of the subsequent staff recommendation clauses where we will do separate votes and council can at any time, we can have a debate and discussion on that. We are in committee of the whole. So is everyone clear on process? Okay, questions on process. Questions on process, Councillor yeah. Chad? So essentially, options one, two, three, four, five, and the four clauses uh, attached to them and then, uh, that are in order there, ending with before you get to the 125,000 for the cabins. So yep. everything above that is the consider portion. That's right. That we'll do all as one block because we have to choose between the options. Yep. And everything else is clause by clause. That's right. That's right. Everyone's clear on process, Councillor Holland? Thank you. Um, so the, I'm just, the, the, if there, option five were to pass, so say there was no encampment on public property, no sanctioned encampment, then there's a clause further down that talks about the 358,000 from the reserve to support the encampment. Is that still, we'll still discuss yes. that? Yes, so, so to be clear, so, um, so the first, so after option five that says no sanction encampment be allowed on property, there is another clause. The next clause says that should council direct staff to implement options one, two, three, four, that council approve the following recommendations to facilitate implementation. And so then you have to look at the next three clauses after that. So all the next three, which include the council approve up to $358,200 from the housing homelessness reserve to support the establishment maintenance of encampments. So that does relate to options one through four. So all I'm proposing is that we will first have the discussion on which option we're going to do. It doesn't, it doesn't preclude reintroduction of examination of, of money, but all it's, it's saying is that if we're gonna do an encampment that we have to fund it. Is that okay? Deputy Mary Hill, question on process? Process. So, um, just to follow up on, on that question, if we approved option five, uh, we would then have to introduce an amendment if we wanted to include that money for for a purpose or. or oh not. yes, if we wanted to in, to include it for a purpose, yes. Okay, that's right. right. Thank you. That's right. Any other questions on process, Councillor Strout? Uh, option option five is just that one. Clause, right? right? That no sanction of can be allowed for public properties. This is a question for the clerk. I sent him an email earlier. Uh, would that require reconsideration of the motion I wrote that passed on May 12th? Mr. Clerk? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, no, it would not. Can uh, you give me an explanation so that I know uh, when I chair a committee why it would not? Absolutely. Uh, through you, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Um, while the motion that you referred to from May doesn't expressly instruct staff to come back with an option of no encampment, 
Um, option five effectively is the end result of the council voting against the other options one through four. So even if you remove option five, if council votes against options one through four, the insinuation is that no encampments would be permitted. At least with the inclusion of option five, uh, staff has a clear direction from council rather than having to infer that council's refusal of options one through four means that council does not want to sanction any encampments at all. As the CEO mentioned as part of her presentation, it's for clarification purposes. Thank you. Okay, any other questions on process? Councilor Neal. Yes, um, if I could ask the clerks just to find uh, the two hour recommendation for notice, uh, because I wanted to amend that and it's much too much for me to find <laughs> right now. Okay, so, so yeah, so we've got some time before we get to that okay. anyways. Like I said, appreciate we're gonna, that. by that point, we're going clause by clause. Oh, okay. So you're not gonna accidentally, that. yeah, go over Miss that it. one. So. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so at this point, on the consider portion, I will ask for a councillor to move one of the options. Uh, Councillor McLaren. I would like to move option five, please. Okay, is there a seconder for option five? Deputy Mayor Hill. Okay, Councilor McLaren, you have moved option five. You have the floor. Thank you. So we heard from the presentation just a few minutes ago that we cannot solve all the problems ourselves. We have needs that are greater than the property tax base can support. And so if we were to be able to solve all of this, we would need a, a piece of the income tax pie because, and we don't have that. So um, the, I guess the biggest concern I have I have here is, I guess it's a, there's a little philosophical thing here. There's an absolute solution. You find housing, supportive housing and affordable housing for people, or you don't. That's an absolute, yes or no, either or. But what we've uh, fallen into or slid into is more of a spectrum of management where any improvement in managing or uh, or managing homelessness becomes a good news story for higher levels of government that have granted us some money, but have not decided to solve the problem. So part of what I have a problem here is that we have been making higher level or upper levels of government look good for not actually doing or solving the problem, but by setting up a situation where they can look good by granting us um, money. And in some cases, they don't even grant us enough. So we have to like, you know, put in gap funding to keep the, I, the uh, integrated care hub growing or going. So I think it's time that uh, Mr. Trudeau and Mr. Ford actually step up and solve the problems or give us the tools to do it ourselves. Um, but what's before us is what we can do. And since we have been, um, you know, covering for upper levels of government, we now have a choice to evict a small number of people from squatting on public land or to evict everyone else from those public lands as a result of the increased risk threats and dangers. And uh, one of the um, presenters said that he didn't feel that they were real. But as we know, there was a murder near one. There was a hand that was lost. There was an, uh, well, there was, we're not entirely sure what it was, but a child was involved in one case. This, this sounds to me like it's colonizing the commons by a small group against the majority. And that doesn't seem right either. So I have to say that societies tend to rule themselves um, by their own social contract. It's codified through law, and law is, in fact, the manifestation of all the rules, conventions, norms, and expectations in our society. And we've heard that violence and altercations against downtown businesses and their employees are increasing. Aggressive behavior is increasing. The degradation of the quality of life was also mentioned. This is incredibly worrying for a lot of people, and uh, rightly so. So the general perception is, as was mentioned in one of the presentations, that Kingston is an unsafe destination, and this is not something that we should be tolerating or allowing to happen. And so in that sense, it's time to respect the social contract again. Some of the actions and behaviors that we temporarily allowed are not right for our society, and that is the reason why option five seems to me to be the very best one. 
There's a lot of other stuff in here that I think we can do that is also good. And actually, if I may also say um, to Principal Patrick Dean, if you want to solve the affordable housing crisis, you really need to house all your students. That's it for now. I refer reserve the right to speak last again since I moved it. Thank you. Uh, yes, you do have that right. Uh, Deputy Mayor, would you take the chair? I take the chair and I recognize you. Thank you. So um, there's lots to say. Uh, so, so I certainly don't want to, uh, to preclude debate on option five, but I think right off the bat, uh, I would like to propose an amendment to option five that I think hits on a couple of pieces that have already been raised about uh, what is the best move forward. We've, we've heard very clearly from a number of, of the agencies themselves about the problems with sanctioned encampments, right? About the, the challenges with security and safety, not only for neighborhoods, but also for the people that are living there. Uh, I have certainly have heard more than enough that convinces me that option five is the right way to go. We should not be sanctioning encampment. That being said, I think there are a couple of additional steps that we can take to try to, again, take the approach that we've tried to take throughout, which is to be empathetic to everyone involved. So I'm gonna ask if the, um, uh, if uh, Deputy Clerk could put up the, um, the amendment. Uh, Deputy Mayor, if you want to, uh, to, to read it, you, you can, and then I, I can speak to it, but I am list looking for a seconder. So perhaps we should start with that. Do we have a seconder for this motion? Seconded by Councillor Osanek. That clause 1B of report number 66 be amended by adding the following clauses after the first clause of option five. That council direct staff to reallocate potential encampment funding of $358,200 to support other forms of housing to support the vulnerable population and that council direct staff to develop a plan with social services partners and Kingston police that will provide for a gradual reallocation of unhoused individuals currently residing on public property. Your Worship, you have the, f the first word. Uh, thank you. So this essentially takes option five, but adds two components to it. So the first, which we heard from a number of delegations, is rather than spending that money on a sanctioning encampment with all the problems that come with it, it would be better to use those funds to be able to advance other better housing options. So that's what the first clause does. The second clause basically speaks to the approach of what option five would look like on the ground. Uh, it's, a, it's a coordinated approach with a plan to gradually house people. To me, it's a more, it's a practical uh, approach that is also compassionate and empathetic as we move forward with option five. So option, it's really about how option five is going to be implemented. I think it's in the spirit of what we want to do as a community. So for those reasons, I am asking council to, to support the amendment. Uh, and then obviously we can return to the discussion on option five itself. Thank you. Speaking to the amendment, Councillor Holland. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, yes, I support this. I wish we had had a conversation earlier today since I spent half the day trying to do something similar. Um, but um, the, the main reason, of course, as was mentioned, having to do with the fact that that amount of money, I think everyone recognizes, um, can do a lot. And we, we heard from partners that they're ready to go to, to get started on those options uh, very, very quickly. I, I'd want to make sure that um, we weren't precluding the ability to spend some money to assist individuals who are currently camping. If that, I guess I'll, I'll phrase that as a question to staff, given that the part of the amendment that I was working on had tried to leave it open to make it flexible. So anyone, any funds that needed to be spent between now and when folks are moved into housing um, could be spent still. Director Nordergraf. Uh, through you, um, uh, um, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, yeah, so we would um, we would be able to utilize. And sorry, if I if I understand your question correctly, we would be able to utilize that funding for a variety of options. I know we continue to have conversations with our with providers. We've already provided some options in the report, but we would be able to look at that amount and and look at, for instance, additional shelter beds or, or other solutions uh, that, that we've been working on um, uh, with our partners and continue to do so. I hope that answers your question. 
Yeah, it does. I mean, I guess what I'm the distinction I'm trying to make is that the the funding having the funding support other options is is the I, I do believe is a good way to go. But I want to make sure that we do have a budget for those who are camping if we need to spend more money. I know I mean staff have been spend have been doing that over the past number of months anyway. Um, but just to affirm that. Right, and thank you for that clarification. Yes, uh, so I think it, it, how, how I think staff would interpret this is that we would be able to utilize the funding for solutions to get some of these individuals that are um, able to access certain solutions to actually support them. So either, you know, let's say we, we have additional uh, capacity or additional funding that we can utilize to support the folks in encampments to, to get some housing solutions. Okay, so sorry, just I'll, I'll use some other examples. So maybe though that part, that part is good, but I'm concerned about things like amenities for camping. So if people are camping in the short term and require something, you know, require the city to spend money to help with that, um, we can do that. It, not necessarily services related to a new housing option, but keeping them in there in, camp, in the camp in the short term. Thank you. I will, I will try to answer your question here. Um, we certainly would work with, uh, and, and again, depending on what council decides tonight, our, our intent would be to work with our service providers uh, to determine what, what we do as kind of gradual kind of process to, to stabilize and also to, to find solutions. Again, that will be a very, you know, tailor-made, um, you know, uh, solution uh, depending on on the individual um, but yes that's our interpretation that we would be able to utilize that funding to work towards a solution which which may be different uh, depending on the on the individual in the encampment but it also really would be in partnership with our providers um, and, um, and and obviously we will have to uh, try to find some creative solutions I know Sierra Hurdle is probably going to jump in as well to, to add something through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, Councillor Holland, is your question related to um, the city providing services within the encampments themselves? So amenities and things like that, that that we would provide in a sanctioned encampment? Yeah, it is, it is in that I, I'm just envisioning that this transition, I mean, everyone's recognizing that it's gonna be individual, like individually focused and therefore require, in some cases, significant time. Um, and so, so yes, really it is about making sure that people who are, um, who are still camping, if they are, you know, no matter what the case, that, that we are able to support them if they have any needs uh, on site. CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, Deputy Mayor. So we will offer alternatives, but it, based on the council direction, it will come a time where we will need to, otherwise, I mean, might as well not have this conversation and just let people continue to stay there. And council could direct us to do that, but I don't think that's what we're being directed to do. So we will provide and offer options, services, but like I said earlier, there is no doubt that a number of people will not want to access those services. And there is no doubt that a number of people will want to continue to camp. So that's the point where, from a city staff, we will need to relocate people. Um, and if council wants to go in a different direction, then they can direct us to do that and continue to maintain people in encampments at that point. But unless we have a different direction, that's, that's how we would approach it. Okay, thanks. Um, I just wanted to, yeah, I did want to flag that because, I mean, we, we are talking about um, definitely trying to do what's best um, and providing the, this funding for longer-term solutions seems to be what everybody is suggesting is the best course of action. So, you know, recognizing all that, I support the amendment. I just really want us to be aware of the fact that it's 
the reality of implementing something like this is very different than saying we're going to provide this amount of funding and we're going to have other housing options. If it were that simple, the money that we spent that we've already heard about tonight, we would have already done that. So I just don't want us to think that if, if we're not have, having a sanctioned encampment, that we're no longer dealing with encampments. Um, and I think there are other aspects to discuss on that, and I do have a, an amendment to hopefully resolve some of those issues. Thank you. Councillor Kiley. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and through you, I was wondering when we talk about public property in the amendment, does that include the grounds of the ICH directly outside of their doors? Uh, CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, uh, Deputy Mayor. So the, um, the grounds of the ICH at 661 Montreal is privately owned, and the lease is actually um, officially moving from the city uh, on July 1st to addictions and mental health. So at that point, the city will have no say or authority in terms of that particular property. Perfect. Thank you. Happy to support the amendment. Councillor Stroud. Mr. Clerk, can we have the amendment back up on the screen for a second? Okay, so regarding the first clause of the amendment, the first actionable clause, I guess, not the introductory clause, uh, about the 358,200 funding. Question to staff. It says your potential encampment funding, it was in, the originally it was, uh, it was tied to other costs, the costs to support uh, sanctioned encampment. Where, what is the source of that funding and uh, you know, like what's the nature of this funding that, that's just being discussed in this amendment? CEO Hurdle. Thank you and through you, uh, Deputy Mayor. So the source of the funding is the Housing and Homelessness Reserve. Um, there's, I think, slightly over 1.5, it was closer to 1.6 million. Okay, so to further clarify, and, I, and this is an obvious answer, it's kind of rhetorical. Uh, there is a related uh, uh, cost uh, to, to add housing uh, in the form of sleeping cabins in a later clause that also is uh, proposed to be drawn from the Housing and Homelessness Reserve. So it's the same pool as the 358000 here, which, as you just said, it contains over a million. Uh, but it's the same pool of money, so uh, there's no distinction between the source of those two. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. I... Uh, like the previous speakers, think that this is an appropriate amount of money to spend on the problem. I mean, we'll, we, if option five passes, we may, we may never know how far that money would have gone in a sanctioned encampment setting because we didn't try it if we go for option five. The rationale behind my earlier motion that brought this all about was that an encampment is a low-cost option for temporary housing, not meant to be permanent, uh, as a, used as a t kind of low-cost transitional housing, very similar to the, the, what they're already choosing because they're already camping. The difference between a sanctioned encampment and an unsanctioned one is, of course, the, the supports, the security, and the... Uh, the uh, the risks to the community involved. We heard from the solicitor there's also liability risk if it's sanctioned, so that kind of counterbalances quite significantly the value of a sanctioned encampment. Uh, if option five, as amended, passes, and I'll keep this brief because I'm not speaking to option five, I'm speaking to the amendment, uh, we'll, we'll never really know how far this money would have gone in, in, a, in a sanctioned encampment. But it won't, it won't uh, we're, if we don't pass this amendment, we're not adding those funds to fight the problem. And therefore, I think I, I, I do support this amendment, although I'd like to know a little bit more about where exactly that money would end up, because this amendment does not say anything other than to support other forms of housing, to support the vulnerable population. That's quite... Uh, unspecific and could go any number of ways. So maybe one more question to staff. Will we get a report about where the, if, the, if this amendment passes, where that money is applied? CEO Hurdle. Thank you and uh, through you Mr. Um, Deputy Mayor. <clears throat> so absolutely, Councillor Strout, I indicated earlier we're working on a few other options um, that weren't captured in the report because they've 
come uh, forward quite recently, um, but to, to increase capacity in some of our existing services, that will most likely require additional funding. So we will report that back to council. How much time do I have left, Mr. Deputy Mayor? I have no idea. <laughs> But we are in committee of the whole, so we okay. uh, yeah, have some unlimited time. So I had prepared an amendment that applies to that clause I just mentioned about the sleeping cabins, but I think it is actually appropriate to insert it here because it, it would direct some of, the, of those funds if passed. So I'm going to propose an amendment to an amendment. Uh, I sent it to the Deputy Clerk earlier, but Mr. Deputy Clerk, obviously now it's an amendment to the amendment by Mayor Patterson and not an amendment to the clause that I had mentioned, the sixth clause of uh, option five. So if you're able to make that uh, wording change, the wording of the amendment would simply be the original that I sent you, not the one I just sent you, but the first one, because it's from the Housing and Homelessness Reserve, it's the same source. Are we able to put that up on the screen? The, yeah, okay. yeah, no, I just, I just wondered if we Once it's okay. up on the screen, I reserve the right to withdraw it if it, if, it, if it might make more sense to wait till that clause comes up. We'll see what it looks like. Okay, so, so there it is. Um, just bear, hang bear, on one, one second, uh, Councillor Strauss. So let's, I'll just read it out. You're talking, uh, the, in the bolded wording is the change? So the, yeah, the, the, it's not moved by Mayor Patterson and seconded by Councillor Sanic, though. No, That was no, no. the original amendment. It's moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Holland. So I, I, I do think that that actually should be included as part of the discussion at the time that we approve or, or as part of the discussions around um, option five, the original motion. So I, I think that that's where we should discuss that because that I, I, I don't know that that was intended to be directed without the report coming back from staff. So. I would say that, that we should discuss that as part of the original motion. If you want to introduce that amendment. Oh, okay. Um, okay, I will just say this. The reason why I decided to introduce it at this point in the debate is because we're talking about an amendment that has a funding attached, but the, sort of the direction of that funding is not clear. We heard from staff that it would come back in a report where, uh, where they, after they explored the options. I'm suggesting one place we could put it, which would be into the sleeping cabins. It wouldn't use up all the money, but it would use up some of the money. But we could also um, have that as a separate issue because it's already a, a, a future clause. So I will withdraw the amendment at this time. Thank you. And uh, introduce it later when we come to the clause about the sleeping cabins. Thank you. Any other discussion regarding the amendment? Oh, there you are, Councillor Hutchison. Thank you, Chair Hill. The, um, the, um, I have just a question about that. It wasn't clear in the report, I didn't think. And that is, um, I think it belongs here because it has to do with the first clause. Um, when, um, 
people when agencies are are uh, money is going towards uh, housing the clients of agencies um, have we got protocols in place to ensure that those clients are homeless and not someone that is just flowing through their system anyway who may well need help but director Nord right here is Oops. we're trying to trim down the number of homeless people on the streets right? I want to be sure that that is actually where the money is going to go. And will we have a tracking system for that? Director? Much like Councillor Straub was talking about. Director Nordegraf? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, so just so if I understand your question correctly, Councillor Hutchison, um, for the scattered housing option uh, and, and also the other housing solutions that, that we are working on, we will utilize the by name list. So, so basically the, the process of, um, you know, um, the kind of coordinated intake with our providers and the intent would be to, to dedicate those um, solutions towards people that are on the by name list. So we could continue that in an, well, ideally only outflow of the by name list. Um, uh, and, and get people housed. Again, I think we, we do need to keep in mind that it, it will really be based on people's individual situations and, and what would be the best solution for those individuals. Some people have different acuity levels or different needs, but we will definitely continue to utilize our by name list and try to um, uh, get people through the pathway of, of stabilization and housing. Okay, that's... Uh that's reassuring. I have an, another question, and it has to do with the second uh, clause there, if I hopefully remember it correctly. And um, as you know, there have been many challenges and problems in the neighborhood with the institution of the, um, the flowing from circumstances surrounding the ICH and other homeless issues. So. I'm wondering, in the option one and two, and I'm not resurrecting those, okay? The, um, I was wondering if people, I realize that the people at the ICH would want to be close to the ICH, but neither uh, proposal um, to do with an, an, um, a sanction encampment is very far away. There's one right next to it, and that's one option. And then there's another one, which is uh, suggested, which is uh, between the um, between the um, golf club house and the um, maintenance yard. So I'm wondering if it's possible. I don't think that's a particularly good location because there's no tree cover. And, but, uh, so we are just going to bake there. So, Councillor Hutchison, just sorry to interrupt, but we are focused right now on, on the amendment I mean, to option is, five? Yep, this is the second one. I just want to know if, uh, if you have an unsanctioned encampment, can be, I mean, introducing an extra idea, okay? It can be because it comes up under clause two. So I'm wondering if they're going to be the unsanctioned encampment can be switched to um, behind the maintenance yard. I, I, I don't think, sir, do sorry, Councillor Hutchison, that hasn't, doesn't have anything to do with the uh, amendment that's, that's been put forward here. So I think that would be a discussion that would come if we, if we turn down option five, right? So that's not part of the provisions of this amendment. So I no, no, it, not, it, not yeah, I understand what you how you're understanding it, but uh, perhaps I'm not expressing it properly. The the thing is, uh, they uh, staff have to approach st uh, people for uh, campers in order to redirect them. What I'm trying to do is get some relief for the neighborhood by just switching where the campers are going to be during the interim period. Well, that would have to come, though, as part of the original motion. So I'd, I'd have, I don't think that can be allowed as part of the discussion around the amendment. Okay. Okay. I'll bring it up later. Thanks. Any other questions related to the amendment? Seeing none, Your Worship, you have the last word. Um, I think the only thing that I will say, uh, Deputy Mayor, is um, to the comment about the money. So to be clear, 
all this amendment does is take that 358,000 that was going to be prescribed for running a sanctioned encampment and say, ask staff to go and use those dollars to find better housing options. I, I, un I understand Councillor Stroud's point earlier and I don't necessarily disagree with the idea of maybe another a sleeping cabin option. I just think that at this point, we should allow staff to explore what those options so it's are. So it's vague for a reason at this point. Um, obviously, I think that that would be one use, but there might be other things as well. And I just wouldn't want to preclude using that money for other purposes. So that's why it's vague. Um, so if council can support that now, and we can look forward to seeing what other those options or recommendations are from staff, which might include more sleeping cabins or it might be something else, I would just encourage staff to be open-minded at this point. Council. Thank you. We'll uh, call the question. Those in favor of the amendment only? And that passes unanimously. And I return the chair. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Mayor. So I think at this point, uh, I will move on my speaker's list. So this is now option five as amended. And next on my list is Deputy Mayor Hill. Thank you, Worship. So you know, this is such a, uh, a vexing uh, discussion because I think as CAO Hurdle has indicated, this is so complicated and so difficult to resolve. It's, it has been the most frustrating file by far that, that I've seen in my, in my term here on council. But what we're doing, you know, is not working. And I think it was done with all good intention, but it's not working because we're, we're, we're in a situation where we are uh, effectively endorsing or being asked to endorse in, in the other options uh, a situation that's not safe and not healthy. So I, I have a real concern about, about council doing that. And we certainly heard already about, uh, about the liability that related to that. Uh, and certainly we didn't hear from one of our partner organizations uh, who supported continuing the encampments, at least in the long term. It, it, it is clearly not a long term solution. And because we've been through it before, we know how incredibly difficult it is when the time comes to shut these camps down. So it's not really a short-term solution either, and it creates such animosity in the community uh, between you know, different, different groups who are advocating for, for, for homeless people as they rightfully should, as we rightfully should, and people who are, are saying, look, this is really having an impact on our lives, on the lives of people who live near the ICH, on the lives of business people primarily in the downtown, on the lives of people who use the parks on a regular basis. So it's, it's, it's really a, a, a difficult uh, situation. I think though that uh, what, what we heard was, you know, we need to use funding, and now that we've approved some funding, to look at things like stabilization housing, uh, low barrier housing opportunities, transitional uh, accommodation, rent subsidies, there's just so many options that we can, can take a look at. But really we're abrogating our responsibility if we don't say that we can house all of our citizens. And you know, 100%, uh, I think it was Councillor McLaren who said this, 100%, where is the federal government? Where is the provincial government on these issues? We need the support of that, those levels of government. You know, we cannot do this alone. As, as CEO Hurdle said, we spent nearly $18 million in, in two years trying to address this problem. That's a substantial contribution from the local community. We need more of a contribution from the federal government and the provincial government because it's way too easy for them to say, well, we gave them some money. We, you know, they make the announcement, the same announcement three or four times, right, as if it's new money. And in reality, it isn't new money. And, uh, and then they walk away and say, well, you know, the cities have been given money and... They're obviously able to accommodate them because they're, you know, people can sleep in tents. Well, I just don't think that's a reasonable option for any city, any community, and it certainly isn't a reasonable option for this community. We have an obligation to house our citizens. We have an obligation to do the very best that we can to, to, to manage that, to provide the support services that are required. All of those things uh, cost money. Mental health support is a health issue, and that's a provincial issue. 
we have to force, along with other municipalities across the province of Ontario, we have to force people at the next level of government to make the appropriate contribution to support us to do what needs to be done. But, we can, but, but, but a solution to that is not having people live in encampments. That is not a solution. So I will be supporting uh, option five. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Anybody else? Councillor Strutt? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, well, obviously, I wrote uh, a motion suggesting we try a pilot of a, of a regulated encampment, is what I called it. Uh, and, and I'm going to explain that rationale one more time uh, before we, we vote here so that we know what we're turning down. So right now we have an unregulated encampment near the ICH. We have a, a, a multiple uh, other campers throughout the city, uh, including Bell Park, the Tannery Lands, the KMP Trail, uh, uh, City Park, other parks in Kingston. The numbers are growing, and uh, it, it, you, can, you can point to the eviction pause that occurred on May 12th as one of the contributing factors, but surely you, you have to acknowledge that the, the root cause is homelessness itself and the post-pandemic economic crisis combined with the opioid crisis, the drug poisoning crisis, and the, and the housing affordability crisis. Those are the root causes, and I'm not going to beat a dead horse and, and, and keep talking about the other levels of government as has been done, but I agree 100% with those comments. The idea of the regulated encampment was to try to improve the situation of those that are already camping, knowing that they have chosen the camping lifestyle, and as we heard, some have done so for years. That was my original intent, and I still contend that adding services, supports, and regulations, and a, a kind of social contract with the, those who voluntarily participate in a regulated encampment would be an improvement to the unregulated encampment that we have, encampments that we have today. Uh, it, what, the primary reason it would be helpful would be it would uh, give us a humanitarian option when we enact the encampment protocol. It, we know we're headed that way. We paused it on May 12th. We know it's coming back. City staff, bylaw officers are going to be shutting down camps. And if you do that and you don't have a destination for them, that's not humanitarian option. If you say, well, you can go to the shelter, and the person says, I just left the shelter, that's why I'm in the park. That's not, an, you can't, it's, it's a, well, you gotta go back to the shelter. That's not really a humanitarian option. If we had a safe encampment uh, pilot running with, that was adequately staffed, we, that would be a, a, like, you know, more like a refugee camp, that would be a humanitarian option we could offer. It would make the eviction uh, a positive uh, or a less negative experience. However, having heard uh, all the testimony from the various uh, agencies about the problems with sanctioned encampments that other uh, communities have experienced, I uh, think I'm happy to admit that it might be biting off more than we can chew. And it, it, it certainly isn't possible with, with the low cost options presented to us tonight by say a hurdle, which basically brings us to the point of option five. So do we add money to option one or option two? And I think that really we should ought to be only trying one encampment if we try it at all, not two or three. Um, do we add money to option one or two, or do we, uh, do we do no encampments and add the money somewhere else? If we, if we do choose option five, it's very clear we are left with a residual, very uh, troublesome reality, and that is the people that are currently camping in the city of Kingston. They will all, one by one, be subject to traumatic eviction. Okay, you can't hide from that fact. And uh, I think that as we go through the rest of the clauses that follow, uh, that are not tied to option five, that are in the in the next section of the of the of the report, we need to maintain the compassion for those those unfortunate individuals uh, that are experiencing the worst living conditions of any of our citizens in the city. So I would ask uh, you all that if you are thinking of supporting option five, that you not forget that the purpose 
uh, that the, the greatest good that we can do in this whole um, very seconds. difficult file is to help to give the helping hand to those that need it and not fall into the dangerous rhetoric of you dirty, rotten bum, you get out of here. Because if we go there, it spirals to a very dark place. We've had that in our history. It's been, that approach has been. Did I just get cut off? I didn't turn off your mic. Uh, <laughs> and it's been tried in the past and it leads us that to being, a, That being said, you are at five minutes. Yeah. It leads to a very dark place. <laughs> so do not lose your compassion as we work through the clauses. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else on option five as amended? Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, I've uh, stayed relatively quiet this evening as uh, it's been great to kind of hear where everybody else is coming from. And I think one of the key things is uh, recognizing as a community, we all want to do more. Um, one of the other key things is recognizing that we're probably at the limit of what we can actually afford as a city. Um, it's been said multiple times tonight, uh, these are city problems because we face them every day, but these are beyond the responsibility and the capability of a city to manage on their own. So I'm gonna echo the call outs on the provincial and federal government that have come this evening. And uh, I'm gonna ask, I guess, staff in a sense, what more can, can we do as a council or as a city to bring light to, to these issues and appeal for enhanced funding from the, the province or the feds, simply because the problems seem to always rest with us because we're the closest level of government to the people. But these are problems that we are, we're not equipped and or funded to actually deal with. So I'm gonna take a prerogative as the chair to jump in and answer that question, Councillor Bohm. I appreciate that. So, um, so I'm a member of the Ontario Big City Mayor Caucus. So it's the mayors of the 29 largest cities in Ontario. We had a meeting two weeks ago. This was the number one issue in all 29 cities. We have all sorts of other priorities and we all agreed this is number one. So we have asked for an emergency meeting with the Premier to discuss this issue because as we have said around this table, this is not just a housing issue, this is primarily a healthcare issue that is not being managed by the province. And here we are spending millions of dollars and it's not fixing the problem. It's not efficient, it's not sustainable. So to your point, Councillor Bohm, we agreed as municipalities that we would all do what we can to elevate this to be a provincial issue. So that means every single one of us around this table and every single mayor and councillor at all the other cities in Ontario, all elevating this, all with one voice saying, we need the province to move on this issue. We need funding. We need a strategy. We need transitional and supportive housing. We need more mental health uh, care services. We need these pieces and we cannot solve this issue alone as municipalities. So Councillor Bohm, on your social media, as you're talking to residents, this is something that we have to push all together. I'm meeting with our new um, uh, MPP later this month. I've already expressed to him this is the number one issue for, for the city, and so we have to keep the heat on the province. Councillor Bohm, I hope that that answers your question. My rant is over, but I just uh, appreciate the opportunity to answer that question. Thank you, Your Worship, and, and that definitely does answer my question. It's uh, it's somewhat nice to hear that this is being elevated uh, through AMO uh, with, with one voice and that every municipality is facing the same challenges. Uh, as such, I, I think it would be um, somewhat, um, I guess, with good intentions, would we, you know, try the encampment uh, protocol, but it would simply yield uh, unsustainable results and, and in turn probably actually exasperate the issue. Uh, so that's one of the reasons I'm going to support option five with the amendment is simply because we need a longer term solution here. And we have to be honest with ourselves. There are many things, I, I, I praise Kingston all the time, there are many things where we punch far above our weight um, and staff come up with 
creative solutions, but this is one of those files that you can tell just by the number of times it's come back before us that we can't solve on our own. That that much is evident at this point. It, it's not just a money thing. It's it's simply uh, the supports are not there. It's it's a provincial issue, and we are one medium sized city. However great, and in my mind, one of the best cities in the province, however great we may be, we cannot solve this on our own. And we have to, at times, humble ourselves and accept the fact that we're going to have to appeal to the higher levels and, and need support from them. And, and rightfully, you know, this, this does fall under their jurisdiction and their purview. And so they should be coming to the table with options and solutions. So I, I know it will seem to, to some in the community that we're shirking our responsibility here, but I think what we're doing is we're saying we can't do this on our own. And when we try to do it, we can only do it in a failing way. So to be honest with ourselves and with the community, we have to say that we have to come up with a better plan and we're going to need those other levels of government to kick in because it's recognizing that at the end of the day, you know, we're a city of, you know, less than 150,000 people and we have limited resources that have been strained under a two year pandemic that are literally coming to the point where I think it's going to, the day is coming soon where we're going to reach into those reserve funds and there's going to be no dollars there. And I don't think we're far away from that day. So we have to be very, very careful uh, reallocating those those funds, um, you know, to, to create some more long-term solution, solutions like the sleeping cabins and everything. I think that's money that's going to pay dividends in the future. But uh, at some point, we have to realize, you know, we're, we're kind of we're running out of options at this point of what we can solve on our own. So option five is going to allow us to kind of have a greater plan going forward and look at more long-term housing solutions, which really is the way out of this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else on option five as amended? Okay. So we will call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carries by a vote of nine to two. Councillor Stroud and Neil opposed. Okay, so just so that we're clear, so we are now, uh, our next clause will be um, that council approve up to $125,000 from the Housing and Homelessness Reserve to purchase five additional sleeping cabins. So just, just to note that the previous uh, three or four clauses rather have basically become moot. So just, just before I go to you, Councillor Stroud, I just want to make sure everyone knows where we are. It is 10.06. So I'm going to propose that we take a 10-minute recess. However, I just want to make this point. If you have in mind any amendments or anything else that you want to introduce later on, can you please take the next 10 minutes to make sure you connect with the clerks, have that in writing, uh, so that anything else we want to deal with, we can deal with quickly and efficiently. Okay, so it is uh, 10.07. We will reconvene at 10.17.
Okay, folks, it is uh, 10.17, so I'm going to ask if uh, people can grab their seats. We will uh, reconvene. Okay, uh, so we are at, uh, we are now at the clause... The council approve up to $125,000 from the Housing and Homelessness Reserve to purchase five additional sleeping cabins to be located at Portsmouth Olympic Harbor starting in October 2022. Councillor Strout. Yes. Yes. Um, okay, so I on, on this issue, I'll start with a question to staff. Let me first pull up where we are here. Right, so first of all, is this uh, recommendation, now that we've had the amended, uh, the amended option five and that 358,000 is, is already in, uh, has already been passed, so this would be another 125,000 from the Housing and Homelessness Reserve, is that correct? Okay, so I've sent an, an amendment to the clerk, uh, because of what we, when we heard from Ms. Wilson and her friend Corey there, that 15 would be really the maximum that can be managed at one location. So we, so we, if we add these five, it would, it would be at the max for the Portsmouth location. Um, and I had, I had misgivings about that original location and the, the capacity and close to the water in the, in the winter and all that. And I, I really think at some point we do need to expand the program. So I'm in favor of expanding the program, but my, my amendment just adds basically a, a whole nother uh, location of 10. So just doubling the program from its current thing with a second location. Because we heard that she would have to, ha have, to have a second staff member for the 15. So perhaps if there's one staff member right now for 10, that they can have another staff member for the other 10 and you're getting 20 cabins with two staff instead of 15 cabins with two staff, which is what would happen if we just passed the five. That, uh, the second staff, that isn't under our purview because that would be the agency that handles that. So what I'm saying is it, let's think a little bit bigger than five and let's uh, have, have staff a look and come back with a report about a possible location for a, a possible second location for another uh, cabin community as, as you see here, we'd get that answer Q3 2022, and the cost would be 250,000 instead of 125,000. And I, I think those 10 cabins will definitely be in use if, if offered, and, I, and I'd like to ask for council's support for this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, so this is the motion to amend, moved by Councillor Stroud, seconded by Councillor Holland to amend the clause so that it reads the council approve up to $250,000 from the Housing and Homelessness Reserve to purchase 10 additional sleeping cabins to be located at a second cabin community location to be determined after consultation with OLS and staff research and reported to council by Q3 2022, starting in October 2022. Okay, so on the amendment only, Deputy Mayor Hill. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I, I'm just, I'm not sure that the uh, organizers of the uh, cabin community have the capacity to operate 10 additional cabins. So I'm just wondering if uh, staff could could assist with that. I, I, my understanding was they were only hoping for five. See you, Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So they, um, not currently, uh, Councillor Hill, in terms of capacity, but they could hire additional staff. So there, there is no question that a second location would also require operating funds because they would need different and additional staff to cover that second location. So the, the purchase of the cabin is one thing, but then we would need to come back to Council anyways with a request for additional funding to operate the second site. Uh, Deputy Mayor, will you take the chair? I take the chair and recognize you. So I'm just gonna follow up on that. So, so just before the break, we directed staff to allocate the $358,000 that we were looking at to put to an encampment instead towards other housing options. Could that include a second 
second sleeping cabin community with potential operation operational dollars and whatever else might be required. CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So it could in part, um, but I would be hesitant to say that it would include that and many other things, for example. So if we are thinking of different programs, the purchase of the cabins alone would be about $250,000 for 10. Um, and then if you look at operating funding based on our past experience, I think 100,000 would not get us through um, through a very long uh, period of time. So we could easily allocate the entire amount to the sleeping cabin programs, but we wouldn't be able to support other initiatives. What, what we could do is if the direction is to purchase additional cabins, we can report back in August, which we were planning on doing anyways for a second location for cabins. So we could purchase the cabins and come back to council with the proposed location and proposed operating funding. But I would suggest that the two be separated in terms of the funding. So we we draw 358 plus 250 from the reserve fund. Okay, so um, I like where Council Strat is going. I do think the sleeping cabin program has been a success. I just think that it would be better to wait. So I think what I'm proposing is, my understanding is that the initial recommendation is to expand the existing site so just buy additional cabins and add them to the existing site. What Council Strat is talking about is another site, which I think is great, but I would le like to know a little bit more information about where it is, what does it look like, what other funds or costs may be required. So I'm gonna vote against the amendment, not because I don't think it's a good idea, but I would just like more of that information from staff a little bit later on. And I don't think it would be a reconsideration for us. Uh, I think staff come back to us. They've already said that they're going to do that. I think I would prefer to support it at that time. In this particular case, I just don't know exactly all the other details that might be required to be able to support this. So that's the only reason why I won't support the amendment. Uh, I just think that it's premature, but it's definitely something that we should look at in a couple of months. Thank you. I, I return the chair. Okay, anybody else on the amendment? Councillor Halt. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Um, so the, I think... I understand what has been said and the rationale for waiting, but I'm gonna make the argument that really the reason we need to be doing this is because we're not supporting an encampment and we are or having a sanctioned encampment uh, and for, for lots of good reasons and some of the reasons have to do with the fact that it's a very sort of substandard form of housing uh, and, and expensive. And so here, this is another example of a form of housing that's not what we want ultimately, but, and also expensive, but there is this reality that we will have people who will need urgently a place to live, and this has proven to be successful under those circumstances. Uh, so I think it's actually really important, even if it means doing what CO Hurdle has mentioned as far as uh, earmarking funding this evening for sleeping cabins and still revisiting the question of uh, another location, et cetera. So um, I'll be supporting it because I think it's the, it's the, it's a direction we're likely to go in anyway. And I just don't want to see us wait much longer given that, that we're changing options for people who are currently living um, in, in a situation where, you know, as we've heard earlier, as part of the discussion, they're gonna be asked to move from that situation. And I think we need more options. Uh, thank you, Dexas. Councillor Neal. Thank you. And I'll be supporting the, the, the amendment as well. We all received dozens of letters uh, from people who had a variety of concerns, but the vast majority of them said, these are the good things. And one of the things that most of them said is a good thing was increasing the number of, of sleeping cabins. Um, this is, we, and some of those same people wanted to continue the encampments as well, but we've taken that money out of the encampments and now I think what this, amendment would do is show people that we're still committed 
to, to finding a solution, however temporary, for, for that. So I, I think this is a good amendment. It, it, uh, it does uh, what many of those letters suggested that we do, which is improve the number of, of sleeping cabins, which seems like a, a, a great success. I, I'd like to remind people that the, the original location for those sleeping cabins was with lots of community support was uh, at the Olympic Harbor site. Now clearly they can't be there during the time when Cork is happening, but they could be there from the, this, this fall after the sailing season and if we couldn't find a more immediate permanent uh, location. So, so I, think, I think this is a good amendment. Thank you. Okay, next is Councillor Osterhoff. Thanks, Mayor Patterson. Um, I, I think that uh, it's a good motion uh, amendment or a, a m amendment, but I, I, I'm not sure I can support it though. If it, I'm happy to lose in the in the vote and, and see uh, it go ahead, but um, I think uh, as as Mayor Patterson has advised us, it's a bit premature. I think that we need to respect the process, and we're still going to probably have this evolve and. And we just heard that. And but I, I for one, don't like the cabins. Still, <laughs> I wish that we could have them like, a, you know, like a trailer with a, a washroom in it. And I'd like to see these cabins evolve. And uh, that might just happen. We haven't even heard back on the evolution of these cabins and where we might put them and how they might be different and what we're learning. So, though I really, really respect the motion and the intention behind it, we 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 have the funding already. We. We, I, I, I don't think we should do it because it symbolizes our commitment and we're all doing the gut check here of knowing what we're doing tonight. It's hard, but um, I just think that we just, just hold off on this. Let staff do, let's not force staff to go to the next level so quickly, but let them make the right, right decisions at the right time, knowing that they're hearing us, they're part of this, and we won't, we, if there's another location. So I, I think that we might be asking them to do something before it needs to be done and, um, and not always knowing everything that's going on. So I would say not to support this at this time and know that's coming right away soon. Okay, thank you. Next is Councillor McLaren. Thank you. So this motion or the amendment came as a surprise to me, so I wasn't quite prepared and I wasn't really sure what to do. So I decided to text Crystal Wilson and uh, see what she's thinking. And um, what she revealed to me was that uh, we do in fact need two sites to move to to move people to when they choose sobrer, sober, <laughs> to be sober. She claims also that they have capacity to run both, but they need a way to transition people when they detox, which is not currently possible in the current system. And furthermore, they're actually working with Hamilton, Peterborough, Woodstock to standardize cabin communities based on the pilot project here in Kingston um, and to develop exchange programs for staff and residents. So we're leading, in fact, the world here and she's ready to go. And considering that she's probably done more for homeless life, for the homeless than anyone else in Kingston, uh, she's actually taken somebody into a room. If we had like a 150 people like her, we would hear homelessness in Kingston, right? Um, I trust her opinion on this um, when honestly I don't know what else to do. So I'm going to support this uh, for those reasons. Thank you. Point of order. Could we Point have the amendment on the board, please? Mm -hmm. Okay, next is uh, Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. I, I just need to hear from staff, I guess, again. Uh, what, what's left in the reserve fund with the money we've just approved, and then on top of this, like, what, what would we be sitting at, roughly, in that reserve fund if this was approved? See you, Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So the, the amount in the reserve fund without any of the expenditures in the report is 1.6 million. 
So if you look at uh, the sleeping cabins is one at 125, then we have um, other options, 182 for um, the, um, the project with addictions mental health to increase the beds there. So we also have the home ownership program. Okay, thank you. Um, at, at what point would, I don't know. would more money flow into that fund? See you, Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So um, we would usually have money coming back to the fund at the end of the year. So when we have surpluses, uh, we repl replenish some of our reserve funds. Um, this one would is one that we repl replenish. Um, there are other funds that we could also look to to try to help and support some of these initiatives if um, we felt that we were getting pretty tight on the housing and homelessness reserves. Okay, thank you. What what number would we kind of aim to have in there as an ideal number for a reserve fund if, if all things were, you know, great, let's say? What would be a, a number we would normally keep? CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, three, Mr. Mayor. So we, we've never had a specific target uh, for this reserve fund, and it's fluctuated, to be completely frank, over the years, depending on the needs in the community. I, I would say, Councillor Bohm, we've never had a time as well where we've needed this funding as much as we do now in terms of support to the most vulnerable. So, um, you know, this is, this is why looking to reserve funds in times like this is is one way to go, but to your point earlier, we do have to make sure that we get other supports in the long term of other levels of government to make some of these programs more sustainable. Okay, thank you for that answer. I, I guess at what point would, would we consider the fund to be, I guess, at risk in a sense, like under, un, if, we, if it was under a million or well, at what point would we be getting concerned that we can't maintain the existing initiatives and, and and have supplemental money in that fund for it. I know that's kind of a, a tough question. I'm just trying to rationalize if the expense of the additional cabins puts our existing services uh, at, at risk if, if unforeseen things were to happen. Thank you and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So we, we've we been in situations where we've had a lot less in our ha housing and homelessness reserve fund. Um, based on the amount that we have, based on the needs that we have, I would say if we got below 500,000, we would start to maybe flag that. But I do want to point out that um, we do also have a human services reserve that we created that were funds that basically we had put aside when uh, the province had downloaded Ontario Works payments to municipalities when it was uploaded. Um, this particular reserve is also available for us to utilize and support our most vulnerable, which we are doing on a yearly basis, for example, for the dental, um, dental and health program for low-income workers. So we can also look at tapping into that reserve um, if we need to. Okay, thank you. Appreciate all those answers. It does help uh, influence my decision. I, I was sort of wavering on this simply as I was trying to understand what the actual impact it was and, and what it put existing services uh, at risk. I believe I am going to support it, but under the caveat that I really hope that these sleeping cabins are an interim solution. I know they're short term. I know there's a, a need in the community. Um, with the removal of, of the encampments, uh, I hope that the public would look at this as a way in which we're trying to bridge the gap and, and with the recognition that that's about all we can do as a municipality without support from, from other levels of government. So uh, I understand what Councillor Stroud is, is trying to do here and, and it's nothing, you know, it's not move a mountain, it's, it's to try to just alleviate some of those concerns um, that the community has. And I think this sends a signal that we're serious about it, but at the same time, we're able to send the, the signal to, to the higher levels of government that you know, we need that support and, and these are not sustainable. These, these are not 
permanent houses in, in my mind. These are simply just ways to get people in from the cold and give them four walls and, and a small place to stay. So in, in, in no means is this my support for these as, as permanent housing solutions, uh, not, not by any stretch of the word, but it is a, a, a bridge, if you will, or, or, or sort of a stopgap measure in, in the meantime, which seems to have worked relatively well. And unfortunately, we'll never have enough for, for all the need that's out there. But uh, I, I will support this under the caveat that I think the reserve fund can, can handle it based on what we've heard, but there, there's a risk. And, and I mean, we can always revisit it uh, in, in the interim if that money starts to kind of dry up and existing services become threatened. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nexus Councillor Senek. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I have a question to staff, and it's uh, CAO Hurdle. A couple of hours ago in our meeting, um, you mentioned in August that a report was coming um, <laughs> mentioning, I think, the sleeping cabins and a possible pilot for another location. Um, what was that again? CAO Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through Mr. Mayor. So you might recall that the last time that we brought a report to Council about Sleeping Cabin to suggest that Centre 70 be the location over the summer and then POH in the fall, we also had a number of, of recommendations in terms of reporting back to Council about um, other potential sites and potential permanent sites as well. So we are currently working on that. We're looking at these options. and. We know that um, basically based on the information that we're collecting, we're aiming for the council August meeting. Thank you. Then hearing that, um, even though this motion is with a good intention, I'd rather wait for the August report because it's just six weeks away really and, and see what's in that and then maybe go back to this um, that night depending on what's in that report in August. Thank you. Point of order, I'd like to Point move that we extend the meeting to the end of the agenda. Uh, sure, I was going to do that in another six minutes, but good job, Councillor Neal. Sure, we can do that right now. So I'll ask for a motion to uh, extend the meeting to finish the agenda. Moved by Councillor Osanic, seconded by Councillor Kiley. All those in favour? Opposed? No idea what Councillor Hutchison and Councillor Bohm voted, but... I think everybody else voted in favor. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, uh, thank you. Next is Councillor Kiley. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Through you, I want to pick up on what Councillor Osanic said, not to be too procedural here, but if we were to vote this down and then another staff report with a motion to approve more cabins comes in six weeks or whenever it is, is there any problem there procedurally? No. So I'll jump in on that because this is an amendment. Right. Uh, if the amendment fails, then it's just the original Not staff in. recommendation, and so there's no problem with additional support or approving something else that staff bring forward in August. Okay, um, so for the reasons like Councillor Sandick said, I love it, I don't want to obstruct it, but let's wait and see how it fits into the bigger picture, and I think we're willing to spend the money, we want to, we know the program works, but uh, a few more weeks will actually probably make it better. So I'll vote against it, um, but not against the intent at all. Okay, next is Councillor Hutchison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I guess the way I'm thinking about this with the, the, respect to everybody is do we need the cabins? And the answer is pretty clearly yes. As we heard earlier when uh, the trellis spokesman was speaking, for the, the amount of the investment we're doing here, we are not going to you know, we're going to help some situations, but we're not going to solve any situations. And so I'd see the amendment as simply making it somewhat better. And then what's proposed, we've heard the money is there. The other thing is, last time we ordered uh, um, sleeping cabins, they took a very long time to arrive. So if we give permission now for something we know we're going to need, I think now would be the time to do it because then it will be useful in October, November, whenever we um, utilize them for the, I mean, they're only there for four or five months, right? So um, wherever the location happens to be. So I think in practical terms, if we want the cabins to be effective, then we should probably vote for this. I do understand the other hesitation about wanting to know all the details 
but the bottom line is we need these cabins. We need transitional and supportive housing. We're gonna be talking about some other, um, you know, purchases by agencies. It takes time to buy houses. It takes time to renovate them or make them useful for clients. So this is something we can do immediately. And hopefully we'll uh, put people on a different path. So I think it's a good amendment. Thank you. Thank you. That was everybody on my first round. Uh, second round, uh, Deputy Mayor Hill. Thanks. And just to, I, I want to just preface this by saying the cabins are now uh, up by Centre 70 and it has worked very well. And uh, the clients have been very, very uh, uh, cooperative. The neighbourhood has been supportive. And, and, and I've been pleased with how it's, how it's gone. However, there's a couple of caveats here. One of them is that this was established largely because of the donations that we received the first time. So, so this is not a cost-effective uh, um, uh, initiative. And I did speak to uh, Dr. Marshall about, about this, and, and she was very clear that this is one of the least um, efficacious ways to spend your money on homeless. Uh, I, I'm sure there are people who would disagree with that, but that, that was certainly her opinion. We are awaiting this study, and it's going to come soon. Uh, and the study is going to tell us whether this is, not, is an effective means of spending our money. We have $250,000 in play, which is great. Uh, and if the study comes back and says, you know what, there's a, there's a, there, are, this is a, there are ways to support homelessness in a much better and more uh, efficient, economically efficient way than this, uh, then we can consider that at that time. The clients that go into the cabin program are, are, are really screened candidates. They are, they're, they're looking to uh, exit uh, homelessness. Everybody's looking to exit homelessness, but they're close to being able to exit homelessness, to be employed, to be sober, all those kinds of things. And so it's, it's you know, it's a, it's a small group of a large group, and, and, and you have to be a little bit cautious about that. So I, I agree with uh, Mayor Patterson. I think you know I, I really appreciate seeing this money in play. I think it's and and if and if and if the study comes back saying this is a good way to spend the money, I, I will back this 100 percent because I have seen the successful results at Center 70. But I don't think that we're at that point yet. And why wouldn't we wait the six weeks to find out for sure? Uh, um, so I, I won't support the amendment. But I, and I really think it's just it's you know again. Going back to some points that we made earlier, we educate ourselves about the issues before we make the decisions. We have an opportunity to be better educated about this issue. I think we should wait until the study comes out. Okay, anybody else on the amendment? Councillor Shrutt? Yeah, just to uh, highlight a few key points before we vote. Um, as I said when we were discussing option five, which was saying no to uh, uh, the humanitarian option when you evict someone from their camp, and we are inevitably going in that direction, uh, as Councillor Hutchinson said, we're gonna need these cabins. Uh, we, heard, we heard the urgent need for transitional housing, especially with these looming evictions from camps. We heard direct feedback from Crystal Wilson through Council McLaren that she favors a two camp option uh, for the same reason that we have the uh, other agencies have mentioned, you know, for, uh, de for detox, right? You need to have a, a specific location for detox that's separate from the regular community. So that's, you, you, when you have a lot, the, 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 I'm sure the program will function better with two locations. And uh, it's inevitable that we're going to have other locations suggested by staff because they're already working on it. This is really just, in the end, just accelerating a little bit and tying it to the decision we already made to not have sanctioned encampments. Because that means evictions, and evictions means more housing need. Therefore, we need more cabins. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we will call the vote then on the motion to amend. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, and that carries by a vote of seven to four. Myself, Councillor Osanic, Councillor Kiley, and Deputy Mayor Hill opposed. Okay, so now we are on the uh, recommendation as amended. 
All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, um, the, next, the next three clauses uh, relate to the home ownership program. Is there any discussion? If not, then I will propose that we call the next vote on those next, uh, those next three clauses. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Next, the council approve up to $182,000 from the Housing and Homelessness Reserve to support overflow hotel costs for an additional eight individuals for the next five months as part of the KFLNA Addictions Mental Health Services Oak Stabilization Program. Excuse me. Uh, any discussion? Councilor Kiley? Thank you. Through you, I'm wondering what happens after five months because that will be December, which is maybe not a great time to end a program like that. Ms. Nordograf? Uh, thank you, Mr. You, Mayor, Mayor Patterson. So, um, as the delegation mentioned, there is um, a, a very strong application and, and some good, um, um, you know, indication that there will be more sustainable funding. We are also looking at other options. So, I know this is still like a kind of a hotel model, or we are also looking at how we can actually uh, look at more of a. Um, uh, you know, a building option. Um, so, so there's there's definitely some time to to look at this in a in a longer time. But it, you know, again, it will um, ideally be through healthcare funding. Okay, perfect. And follow up through you. Worst case, if the funding doesn't come through or there's a delay or something to that effect, could we revisit extending the program again, recognizing the seasonality, especially um, five months from now being winter? Mr. Regreff. Thank you, and through you, Mayor Patterson. Yeah, we will continue to work with our partners to try to to um, uh, be creative with our operating budget. Um, but certainly, we, we do see, as you can see in the report, that this has been quite successful and has really been able to get people stabilized and housed. So, so that's what we like to fund. Excellent. Very good. Thank you. OK, any other discussion? May we call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Next, the council approved the updated encampment protocol included in Exhibit H of report number 22-183. Councillor Holland. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Uh, and through you, I, I'm not sure. I think this is the one I'm amending. It's the next one. But actually, I think I want to amend this one as well. OK, so, so here's what I'm going to propose. Um, we're in Committee of the Whole, so Councillor Holland, if you have something that you want to craft, I'm just going to ask you to do that, and we can always come back to you in a later round. Well, actually, I'm so sorry. It's more of a question at this point because, so I'm amending the next, if I'm amending the next one, uh, the, the amendment that I have actually involves the content of the encampment protocol. Um... Okay, so I think what I would propose then is that we deal with the two clauses together. Okay. So that council approved the updated encampment protocol included in Exhibit H, report number 22-183, and the council directs staff to reactivate the encampment protocol as of June 30th, 2022. So put those two clauses on the floor together, uh, and then we can go from there. So, uh, Councillor Holland? Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'm just pulling up. My amendment, I've provided it in writing. Uh, so the amendment is, should I wait? Okay. So do we, if we have an amendment, if we can just put that up. Okay, so this is a, mo a motion to amend, moved by Councillor Holland, seconded by Councillor Neal. Uh, okay, so just, just give me a moment. Okay, 
Uh, sorry, I just need to, to read it. So essentially it says that the recommendation clause nine, which is the second of the two clauses to deal with the encampment protocol be deleted and replaced with the following. Then enforcement of the updated encampment protocol be deferred until November 10th, 2022 to allow staff time to further consult with stakeholders and develop educational resources for the public to help reduce fear and stigma associated with vulnerable populations who are unhoused in the community. Councillor Holland. All right, sorry, I know this is confusing, but the part that I said was left out actually references the 48 hours, references the protocol itself. It was, it, there, sorry, there was, okay. Okay, so, so what I'm going to do, um, okay, so I'll take a five minute recess and then we'll reconvene. So we will reconvene at um, 10.57.
Okay, folks, it's uh, it's 10:57. <clears throat> okay, if I can uh, ask people to grab their, um, <clears throat> if I can ask people to grab their seats. <clears throat> okay, so in the interest of time, uh, Councillor Holland, if you have an amendment ready to go, you can present it. If not, then I'm going to move on, and then you can vote against any other amendments in order to allow more time, just because I am aware we still have a lot of material to go through. It's almost 11 o'clock. So, uh, Councillor Holland? Yeah, okay. I think this might clarify something that we were just speaking about. So, there is an amendment um, on, the, on the clause that talks about changes to the encampment protocol. And... Okay, so you have an amendment then to the first clause? Yes. Okay. Can we see that? Same one. No, it's, sorry, it was the original one. Okay, I'm going to come back. If we, if. Okay, so no, I'm, so I'm going to, if it's not ready, I'm going to move on. Okay, so... Uh, we can always come back. Again, we're in Committee of the Whole, so it doesn't preclude us from, from coming back. So, Councillor Holland, I will come back to you if needed. Is there anybody else that wants to speak to, to this clause? Councillor Stroud? I don't have an amendment to propose, but I do want to help clarify what we're discussing before we vote on it. So, I guess the question is staff. Exhibit H, I believe, contains a new language for the encampment protocol that we've already uh, referenced earlier in the discussion regarding the notice, the 48-hour notice, is that correct? And, and, and so uh, if we wanted to change the length of time uh, from the two hours, where would we do that? CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. That's correct, Councillor Stroud. The um, proposed changes in Exhibit H are from 42 hours to two hours, and that would be under the clause where we, we um, recommend that council approves the updated encampment protocol included in exhibit H. That's where you would want to, if you wanted to make an amendment, that's where it would be most appropriate. Okay, I'm just gonna speak to the, to the change that's in the report. So 48 hours, uh, it's a complaint based system, right? So you've got someone camped in your local park that is, whose behavior is, of that, of that individual's behavior is disruptive as, to your children, say, or whatever and uh, you make a complaint to city staff, bylaw says, well, uh, under the current encampment protocol, bylaw would say, well, in 48 hours, uh, we can serve them notice now, and in 48 hours, we can evict them. Uh, if, they are be if their behavior is, is uh, harassment, then that would actually continue for 48 hours. If it's two hours, it's the, kind of like the other end of the spectrum. That's a, that's a huge, it's a drastic change, and members of the public have pointed this out. That would be your complaint goes in, and literally the clock starts ticking, and 120 minutes later that person is evicted. There's no way that's ever going to go smoothly. So I don't have the amendment because I'm not sure the, the length of time that's appropriate, but I would like to hear from colleagues about what length of time is appropriate between 2 and 48 hours. I think there is probably a correct number in there somewhere. I think 48 hours is too long. I think two hours is too short, and I'll just leave it at that for now. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else? Councillor McLaren? So in answer to your question to all of us, I feel uh, that shorter is better, but eight hours would be about my maximum. I think that uh, that's a tip. I should check with staff first. What's the typical um, length of shift for a bylaw enforcement officer? CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, I'm, I'm actually pro probably going to ask either uh, Commissioner Agnew or uh, Manager Compo to jump into this question to answer the um, length of shift for bylaw officers. Commissioner Agnew. Uh, thank you, and through you, Mayor Patterson. Our staff typically work 10-hour shifts. 10-hour shifts, okay, so maybe not eight hours. So if, is it reasonable in that shift for them to say in the morning, 
go out to uh, address complaints, contact the individual involved, and then in the evening come back and um, address the issue if it hasn't been resolved automatically. Is that a reasonable um, task to apply to a bylaw enforcement officer in this case? Perspective? Thank you, and through you. Um, yeah, I think that's something that our staff could manage, certainly, and we do have staff that are staggered throughout shifts um, over a longer than a 10-hour day, so certainly if it's something that spanned a length of time uh, that was longer than an individual shift, it, it could uh, be transferred over to another staff that's working. Okay, so although that's possible, uh, it strikes me that the person who initiated the um, first contact may be the one to finish the task. Um, if 10 hours is the typical shift, uh, I say no more than 10 hours, but I would suspect that somewhere in between a little less so that they can actually, you know, finish the paperwork would be ideal. That's what I'm thinking. So um, if we have to choose this, 10 is the outer limit, but I would think that maybe six or eight would be reasonable because they may take longer. And six is what I'm hearing from my colleague and two colleagues. So I would suggest six, Mr. or Councillor Stroud. Is, is that a suggestion or an amendment? Okay, I'm being told that that would be uh, an amendment. Okay, Please. Just, okay, just, give me, just give me one sec. Uh, Mr. Deputy Clerk, or Mr. Clerk, or whoever. <laughs> Okay, our very efficient deputy clerk says that he can get that amendment prepared in 30 seconds. Okay, point of order. Okay. Councillor Holland? So I had an amendment that was about to address that and you were gonna come back to me when that amendment was ready. Well, <laughs> I know, <laughs> so because yours wasn't ready, I, I, no, I went like, to somebody else. Just okay, to, okay. It, 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 So, Your Worship? Yes, Councillor McLeod. Um, if Councillor um, Holland would like to add six hours to her amendment, I would be happy to let her do it um, and second her amendment, or as you see fit. Okay. I, um, I, can I raise a point of order? Point of order. I think right now the Deputy Clerk has three different amendments that have been passed his way about these hours. Yep. And so here's, so, so here's what I'm gonna rule. So we do this in order. Because we're in Committee of the Whole, uh, I did go to Councillor Holland, it wasn't ready, so I moved on. So all I'm saying is, if Councillor Holland, if you don't like the amendment that's being put forward by, by Councillor McLaren, you can vote, you can argue against it, convince Council to vote against it, and then it can come to, to your amendment. It's the only way to be fair. I have to be consistent. And especially at this time of night, I have to be a little bit more ruthless in, in how, how I run the meeting. So, and, and got, point of order, if I Point can, of order. If it's a, since it's the number of hours, it would be perfectly in order to move an amendment to the amendment to, to put in the hours that, that you wish. Is that accurate? No. You would have to vote, if you don't like it, the amendment, you'd have to vote against the amendment and then propose another amendment. But you can amend, we can always amend an amendment. Not if it's contrary, not if the amendment is contrary to, hold on, one sec.
Okay. Uh, so I think I've addressed the point of order. So Councilor McLaren has the floor. You can do with the floor what you want. So are you put, <laughs> so just to be clear, have you put forward an amendment? Thank you, and based on your suggestion, yes, I put an amendment forward to change the two hours to six hours. Okay, Mr. Clerk, Mr. Deputy Clerk, we're good with that? Okay, so we have a motion to amend, moved by Councilor McLaren, seconded by Councilor Kiley, that Exhibit H be amended to change the two-hour notice of trespass to six hours. Is everyone clear on what this amendment is? Any discussion on the amendment only? This is only talking about going from two to six. Councilor Holt. Thank you, uh, and through you, so I, I, I do appreciate that there was some thought process put into this amount, this, this new number. Um, however, that this is not an arbitrary process and requires a lot more than um, understanding the nature of, of bylaw uh, enforcement. I think really what we're missing a little bit is that we've heard a lot from members of the public on this subject and uh, many thought there was no reason to, to change from 48 at all. Um, so the, not only that, we've heard from people who work with individuals who, the, the people we're actually speaking about tonight who are unhoused, who require um, services in the community and uh, who've experienced trauma. So to, to make a decision like this, when really what we need to do is understand what the reality is for people who are living, um, who are unhoused in the community, and start to develop a way of assisting them um, through this encampment protocol that we have. And so I won't be supporting this, and obviously I have a, a, an amendment that has to do with timing as well, thanks. Okay, anybody else on the motion to amend? Councillor Straub. Okay, so it's, it, it, we need some more nuance uh, clarified here and I may have to get some more clarification from staff. Uh, so we have a complaint-based system. We have uh, a function, the, one of the functions of the encampment protocol is actually needed. It's needed right now and it's needed, uh, but not everywhere. It's needed in focused locations. We've all received emails of uh, people camped in places, in public places that is disturbing to residents. Some, and it's up to each, uh, each time we get a complaint, it would be up to staff to determine whether those complaints are valid, whether those uh, individuals pose a risk, whether those individuals are obstructing or uh, you know, preventing others from the safe or enjoyable use of the public space or what have you. As per the bylaws, it's all written in the bylaws. And the encampment protocol is an important tool that may need to be activated, but it, it doesn't apply to all the homeless in Kingston suddenly as soon as it is in place. When the uh, eviction pause is ended, we've already heard from Councilor, or from CAO Hurdle, that there will be a gradual implementation and a gentle transition to the housing options that are available. So that's when I'm gonna to go to staff now for further clarification that should this amendment pass and the number is now six hours, that would be the minimum amount of time that legally by law could return and move someone. But what is the spectrum, what is the range and what would be some different scenarios that may happen with some of our unhoused individuals as we transition them to more stable housing options. Would it always be six hours? Would there be some situations where they would get longer notice? CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So just to be clear, the bylaw and the encampment protocol would apply to everybody everywhere, unless council says, we do not want the bylaw and the encampment protocol to apply to locations A, B, and C. What I indicated is that we respond, one, to complaints, and two, that we would be looking at, yes, a gradual transition because in areas such as ICH and Bell Park, we have 40 to 50 people. 
that is going to take time to transition. It's not going to happen right away. There are other areas that are going to be easier to start with, such as some of the other parks, Calvin Parks, McBurney Park, where the number of people isn't as great. So it's easier to transition those individuals. But it doesn't mean that staff decide not to apply it. It still applies, unless council gives us the direction not to apply it. We have to respond in some way or another. The six hours would be the six hours, and that's what we would work with. Again, we, we, can't, we can't pick and choose when we're going to apply six hours and when we might apply 24 hours, because then protocol doesn't mean a whole lot. It just means staff to do whatever they want uh, when they want. So six hours would apply. There are situations that may be more complicated. And I talked about the ICH in Bell Park. There's no question that one will be more complicated. And we will need to do this gradually, that one in particular. OK, then I just have one other clarification needed. Uh, it's a complaint-based system. Uh, that's pre everything is pre prefaced by that. It's a complaint-based system. So uh, uh, under what circumstances would the encampment protocol apply when there has been no complaint and an individual has not caused any resident to complain or any disruption? CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and through you. So if there are no complaints that are coming forward, obviously we would somehow need to be made aware of a situation. The only time that we would then intervene is if there was a health and safety issue. If there is a complaint, it doesn't matter if there is an, a health and safety issue because the bylaw is pretty clear. You're not allowed to camp. It doesn't say if you don't cause any health and safety issues, then you're allowed to camp. It says you're not. So that's the only time. But like I said, we don't we don't go looking for those situations. We, we don't go through parks looking for those situations. Usually, we're notified by residents. OK, so just one more painful clarification. If a park employee, a city worker, uh, who, is, who is working in a park, sees a tent, are they able to make the complaint and, and uh, trigger the encampment protocol. See you, Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So, if a city employee notices a tent, um, and obviously it's not authorized, yes, they can actually notify bylaw that they were working in part A, B, or C, and to let bylaw know that there is someone staying in a tent, and to have bylaw reach out to that person. Okay. So, to summarize, uh, with this change. Any time bylaw is notified of someone, and they will all be illegally camped in, in public space uh, once we resume the encampment protocol, and you, any of, any, if bylaw is made aware in any fashion, whether it be from an employee or a resident or a counselor, of any illegal encampment, it triggers the six hour uh, encampment protocol. Once the notice is served, six hours later, they will be evicted. However, if nobody brings it to bylaws attention, then that camper does not trigger the encampment uh, protocol. That's a fair summary. Um, as for whether the six hours is an appropriate amount, I'm not sure. I'd like to hear some other opinions. Okay. Is there anybody else on the amendment to move two hours to six hours? Councillor Neal. Yeah. Yes, I'll be voting against it. Um, I did just receive an email from Ms. Varma, uh, and I'll read it out. I worry about the loitering bylaw would target racialized people. Not convinced a bylaw, however well uh, it's crafted, would so, avoid bias, racialized, and so we're not talking about targeting. The, we're not talking about the loitering bylaw. Are you getting to the point? Are you getting to the discussion on the camp protocol? I'm talking about the number of hours that. OK. So uh, I'm not convinced this is wise. Sorry, my opinion, but this frightens so many of us. I think we need a greater time frame than six hours uh, for the camping. Uh, I know that. Uh, Councillor Hill was concerned about a longer time frame 
for, for the downtown, I think those things could be separated within, within a motion. But I can't support uh, only six hours. Okay, anybody else on the motion to amend? Okay, we will call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries by a vote of eight to three. Councillor Neal, Holland, and Hutchison opposed. So now we are on, uh, so the first, the first clause that council approved the updated encampment protocol, that's with the amendment from two hours to six hours. Any discussion? Okay, we will call the vote. So this is, so this is that council approved the updated encampment protocol included in exhibit H, report number 22-183, where we have now amended the two hour to six hour. All those in favor? Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Holland. Okay, okay. I'm not trying to rush, just uh, anybody else? So we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carries by a vote of 10 to one. Councilor Neal opposed. Next clause, that council directs staff to reactivate the encampment protocol as of June 30th, 2022. Councilor Holland? I think it was, I think I got them mixed up. I think it was actually the other one that I was trying to speak to after all that. Um, okay. I guess what I, wanted, I, what I really wanted to say in general is that the um, encampment protocol uh, requires some work and, just one sec. Uh, I think that the amendment that I was going to propose is relevant to this clause as well. Oh, okay. Okay, so is this, is this what you're looking to put forward? Yeah. Okay, so, okay. This is a motion to defer. So you're exactly. putting forward a motion to defer? Yeah. Okay. So the following clause be deferred to allow staff time to further consult with stakeholders and develop education and resources for the public to help reduce fear and stigma associated with vulnerable populations who are unhoused in the community. With staff to report back at the November 10th, 2022 council meeting. Uh, okay. So does everyone, does everyone understand what this motion to defer is? I have a point of order. Point of order. So we just voted. Uh, that and it was unequivocal that no sanctioned encampment be allowed on public property. So now we're going to debate, and we're, well, we were debating a supporting document to that policy. Six month deferral effectively sub subverts the will of council. I don't think we can, I think this is out of order. Uh, CEO Hurdle, you have a comment? Thank you, and through Ms. Samira. I'm just trying to understand, but if I understand correctly, this means that we would leave everybody in the parks the way they currently are, all parks, and we would not respond to complaints because, yeah. so, because we're deferring the reactivation of the encampment protocol. So yes, yeah, so that's exactly what my interpretation of this is, and I do agree that's contrary to our decision earlier with option five. So I think for that reason, I'd have to rule the deferral out of order so that puts it back. That point of back order? Yes, point of order. Councillor Strip. Okay, so op option five was simply that a sanctioned encampment not be established in Kingston, a sanctioned encampment. What we have is unsanctioned ad hoc encampments all over the city. And the question is when do we, the question is the timing, that when do we enact the encampment protocol that we just amended, right? The question is the timing. And so to me, this is simply a deferral 
of enacting it, changing the date from June 30th to November 10th. Yes, but in practice, it effectively makes all encampments in the city sanctioned. Right, so, so that would be a reason to vote against the deferral. It's contrary to the earlier direction of council. But the earlier direction of council was, was silent on the encampment protocol. It was just talking about a sanctioned so encampment. So option five says that no sanctioned encampment be allowed on public property. That's what option five says. Right, and it isn't. There aren't any sanctioned encampments on public property. That was, that was my, my motion had proposed one, but it didn't, it didn't pass. That was, right. that was a different issue. This is the encampment protocol. So my ruling is that a six month deferral of the encampment protocol effectively, effectively in practice, then sanctions all encampments on all public property. So that is contrary to option five. Okay, well, my point of order was to say that that is a rationale for voting against the deferral, but not a reason to call it out of work. I hear you, and I, listen, there's many times where I do rule that, that it's a motion to, to vote against. I'm, I'm very careful when I rule something out of order, but in this case, I think it is. So that's, that's my ruling. Um, someone can challenge the chair if they want, but that's just my... My ruling is that effectively in practice, this actually reverses in practice the decision of option five. So. Councillor Holland, you still have the floor. Okay, this is just an explanation. So um, because this is actually not what I wanted to have happen and it has to do with a number of things, most of which are spontaneous and some are my, my fault and uh, I'll leave it at that. But the, what I was trying to accomplish here was not to defer the beginning of, these two items got connected um, because they both involved the encampment protocol. And so the, the, my, what I was trying to do was not to def defer the, the in entire encampment pr protocol, but the changes to the protocol that were being proposed. And the rationale for that had to do with giving us the months over the summer where all these housing initiatives that we spoke about tonight are being implemented, all the new programs and plans are being implemented, get some information, and then come back and decide if 48 hours is appropriate or what number would be appropriate, et cetera, because the encampment protocol has to do with those kinds of things, and it seems as though we need more consultation on that, which was why I wanted to move that part of it. Um, so just so everyone's clear, that's what I was trying to do. Thanks. Okay. So I can withdraw this uh, deferral. Okay. Thanks. Councillor Kiley. Thank you, through you. I was just going to ask if we could see it again, because if it speaks only to the changes, I understand the argument just made. So, so the issue is we've already made the decision on the changes. We already did that vote. Right, the updated can't. Okay, right, got so, it. so we mm -hmm. amended it and then we voted to confirm Fair it. Fair enough. So, so now we really are only on the, the debate. Again, I'm not... Right, and then... Uh, kind of my, my job is just to kind of just, just remind council where we're at in the process, sure. that's all. So no, I'm that's fair. And then just it. a small clarification then. Yeah. Um, the reactivation of the encampment protocol has essentially been agreed upon through option five. Because if it effectively means that it can't go one way, it's gone the other way. I think in practice that's true. Yeah. Yes. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. It would be different if we had chosen one of the other options, mm -hmm. but I think in choosing option five, to, that's basically sure. what's been put in place. Okay, thank you. Anybody else on this clause? Okay, all those, I'm sorry, Councillor Stroud? I would like to suggest to my colleagues that this is the opportunity to speak up if we want the uh, encampment near the ICH, which the agency itself and one of its workers and some of the campers have uh, communicated to us that they don't want, wish evictions to begin. If we pass this, evictions at the ICH can happen as of tomorrow. We've heard from CAO that it will be a gradual process, but that is not a timeline that is a, that is sort of a reassurance. So if we pass this, uh, people at the ICH could start being evicted tomorrow. And if that, if we want to uh, heed the uh, the request from 
the agency, the ICH agency, and one of the workers and some of the campers, that we not move them far away from the ICH uh, at this time. We will need a targeted amendment to not enact the protocol at the ICH before we pass it. And that will probably require a recess for someone to write up an amendment. But if we don't, we, we're about to pass uh, we're about to pass a blanket uh, enactment of the protocol as of tomorrow in all locations, including the ICH. Okay, is there anybody else that wishes to speak? We will call the vote on the clause. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carries by a vote of 10 to 3. Councillor Stroud, Neil, and Holland opposed. Councillor Hutchison is no longer in the meeting or he's no longer in my screen. What did I say? Did I say 10 to 3? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I meant 7 to 3. Thank you. <laughs> 7 to 3. Okay, it's 11.30. Sorry, I'm trying to keep it together up here. Okay. Um, so moving on, uh, next clause, the Council Support Addictions and Mental Health, Kingston Community Health Centers and Trellis, in identifying an alternative location for the integrated care hub that can extend its client capacity and that is designed with the ability to improve the health care services. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. The Council waive the vehicle operating policy and approve the donation of a 2013 Chevrolet Silverado pickup truck to home base housing for the purpose of assisting with program delivery of housing first and street outreach. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Next, the council directs staff to develop, and I'm just looking at the supplemental report. Uh, so with, with council's consent, uh, it would not, it would read, uh, I just need to find it here. I've got it here somewhere. Oh yes, so the council directs staff to develop a public nuisance bylaw as described in report number 22-205. Any discussion? Uh, Councilor Kiley? Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. I confess that I didn't get to read the, the amendment. Can we just get a bit of rationale from staff on why we're dealing with this now? Perhaps Ms. Morley or Ms. Hurdle, I'm not sure. So just, just before we do go to staff, yeah. I've just been advised by the clerk that because this amendment came in a supplemental report, I will ask for a mover and a seconder first for the, the amendment from loitering to public nuisance. Moved by Deputy Mayor Hill, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff. Okay, so this is just to delete anti-loitering and to go to public nuisance instead. Is there, any, is there any debate on, on that, that move? If there is, well, well, maybe we should deal with that first. Well, maybe it's a similar question. Could I just get clarification on the difference between the two? Yeah, yeah. fair. Ms. Morley. Thank you, and through you, Your Worship. So, as stated in the original report that's before Council tonight, staff did receive a number of complaints from members of the public who were concerned about safety due to behaviors exhibited um, by certain individuals in public spaces, including on public sidewalks. Uh, staff and Kingston Police have also received numerous reports of unprovoked, aggressive, and threatening behavior um, resulting from incidents in the downtown core and in city parks. Initially, the recommendation that was before Council was to develop an anti-loitering bylaw, but in consultation with other members of staff, uh, council and members of the public, it was determined that a general public nuisance bylaw might be more, a more effective tool to deal with some of these behaviors. And as Councillor Neal pointed out previously, we understand that a general standalone anti-loitering bylaw can be perceived as discriminatory and can be applied in a discriminatory manner. A number of municipalities in Ontario have enacted general public nuisance bylaws that cover a wide range of nuisance behaviors. And it would target some of these aggressive and threatening behaviors that we're seeing. It would also target more general nuisance behaviors, things like construction noise and mud that we, and dust that we see a lot of, things like nuisance feeding of wildlife. So we would be looking at a general public nuisance bylaw that would be targeted at some of these aggressive and threatening behaviors, but also nuisance behaviors more generally. 
I'm glad I asked. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm fine with that. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So again, so just, just to clarify where we're at, right now we're, we have on the floor a motion to amend the staff recommendation from anti-loitering to public nuisance. So I'm just going to ask if comments and questions are just related to that. Then depending on whether that passes or fails, then we can have a debate on whatever's in front of us. Uh, Councilor Neal. I'm happy with the decision uh, to drop the whole notion of lo loitering. I'm just wondering if all we're doing is changing a word. Uh, will the, the, will the uh, new bylaw try to encompass the whole idea of loitering, uh, but just under different language? Ms. Morley? Thank you, Mr. Your Worship. As I mentioned earlier, the intention would be to craft a very narrow uh, restriction. It, it would, to be frank, include a provision related to loitering, but with the legitimate objective of protecting public safety and ensuring safe use of sidewalks. So we would tailor an anti-loitering provision to those legitimate objectives and not simply have a broad restriction on hanging out, if you will. CEO Hurdle. Thank you. I, through you, Mr. Mayor, I just want to add that we would be obviously doing a lot of engagement before a bylaw is brought forward to committee. So, so it will come back to council for final approval. I appreciate that. So you're Through, absolutely. We, we do not have a bylaw ready at all tonight. Thank you. <laughs> okay, anybody else on the motion to amend? Okay, so we'll call the vote. All those in. So this is to change it from anti loitering to public nuisance. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carries by a vote of um, eight to two. Councillor Osanek and Holland opposed. Okay, so now what we have in front of us is now that council directs staff to develop a public nuisance bylaw. Any discussion? Councillor Stroud? I understand uh, and I believe uh, staff's comments about having received numerous complaints uh, about behavior in parks in the downtown. I, I understand the logic behind the rationale, but I, I really object to this having been inserted into a discussion about encampments. Uh, it is not related to encampments. It is, it is related to uh, behaviors in our public spaces. Uh, it's a separate topic, it's a separate issue, and when you conflate, conflate the two, you inevitably, as some of our delegations did, cast stigma on our least fortunate citizens just by conflating the issue. That's what's been done here. We've conflated an issue. We're guilty of conflation. It's not a deadly sin or anything, but it is, uh, it is I object that it happened because it happened for uh, reasons of uh, specific advocacy from certain groups that we heard from tonight. They have a reason for this advocacy. It is uh, targeted to help their members. That is also logical. But by conflating it with the discussion on encampments, they perpetuate the stigma against our least fortunate citizens. Therefore, I think it's crucial that we not, though it, though it not come back, it's, we're not deciding on it tonight, I don't even think we should endorse the concept at this time. I think the optics are terrible, and I hope that we will vote this down. Thank you. Okay, anybody else that wishes to speak? Councillor Senek. Thank you, Your Worship. I also won't be supporting this. I think that just the fact that we have evictions going again, um, you know, or in, in our eviction protocol, um, that that's heavy handed enough for right now. Um, I think if this was next year at this time, that's when we could see, you know, uh, next steps, and this could be the next step. But for right now, um, no, I just don't feel comfortable doing a public nuisance bylaw with loitering, anti-loitering in there. I just don't want to do it. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Hill. Thank you, Worship. And I, and I, I absolutely agree with uh, Councillor Stroud's comments on, on conflating these two. The, they are different issues. But... 
it doesn't deny the fact that there are significant problems happening in the downtown and they have to be addressed and and we you know the sooner that we can get at this the better we're not debating the bylaw tonight we're simply saying that we would like to, to staff to develop it to bring it forward so that we can debate it and discuss it but we have to get on with addressing some of these very very significant issues and they're issues of safety they're issues of health and cleanliness in the downtown they're impacting on businesses they're impacting on tourism but they're also impacting on the people that are that are uh, affected by it. So, so um, I guess so it's it, it's a major major issue for our our business community. It's a major issue for our tourism community. But it also impacts on the folks that are that are engaging in this activity downtown. Again, a lot of it's a health related issues. But we 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 need to have a tool uh, in order to address it. So the sooner we can get this in front of council, the better. Okay, thank you. Next is Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship. And through you, I was just curious if, if uh, staff have looked into what other cities have uh, a bylaw such as this, and if we have comparables. Like, I mean, it doesn't seem like we're reinventing the wheel here. It's more just trying to create tools to allow for, you know, additional tools for for bylaw officers to deal with uh whatever they come across i i'm not even sure could this apply potentially to you know even students or, or anybody across the city is how i take it but uh i mean if staff could comment on you know what are other cities doing do they have something similar if they know miss morley Thank you, and through you, Your Worship. A general public nuisance bylaw is certainly not a novel concept. There's a specific provision of the Municipal Act that allows municipalities to regulate and prohibit public nuisances. The City of Kingston does have a nuisance party bylaw that addresses the negative effects of nuisance parties, but we don't have a standalone general nuisance bylaw. Many municipalities have these. Um, off the top of my head, today I reviewed the uh, Brampton, Brantford, uh, Markham, Newmarket, all of them have public nuisance bylaws. Um, some have public nuisance provisions embedded within other bylaws, and many municipalities also have standalone shopping cart bylaws to deal with the issue of shopping carts on public property. Okay, thank you for that. So, so currently, if I guess ten people from any group, whether it was you know students or just a, a group of friends, decided to stand out front of any business on a downtown street and just hang out there all day. Um, for no reason, let's say, and, and just basically, I guess, you know, take up that sidewalk, um, we would really not have any tools at our disposal right now to actually walk in and say, hey, you know what, like you're affecting the business, uh, you know, uh, that that's trying to survive right now after the pandemic, we, we would not currently have any tools to be able to go in and sort of, I guess, usher people along to say, could you find somewhere else to hang out? Is that correct? Ms. Morley? Thank you, and through you, Your Worship, that is correct. In the absence of a municipal bylaw governing these public nuisances, we'd be relying on Kingston Police uh, to the extent that the activities constitute a, a crime under the criminal code. Okay, I appreciate that. So I kind of see this from, from both sides as, you know, you ultimately don't want to attach a stigma to it. Uh, I, I agree with Councillor Stroud's comments in a sense that, you know, it it's it's attached this way but on the other hand i'm also cognizant of the fact that we need to be doing everything we can right now to support those small businesses downtown and and you know it may be people just hanging out in front of them because it's just a corner they've decided to meet at and they may have no ill will at all not realizing that they're having a negative impact on customers accessing that that building or that small business so this is something where you know it's another tool in the in the belt of our, of our of our bylaw officers and we have to have faith in them that they're they're going to use it when um you know it's needed and and obviously approach it from an education first point of view and we don't even know exactly sort of what it's going to look like i guess in the end and how how it will be used i'm assuming this will be you know used when only when needed so it, it is something where it does provide us another tool so I'll be supporting it, recognizing that, uh, you know, we have to have faith in the institutions that we have as a city. Thank you. Okay, next is uh, Councillor Ostroff. Yeah, thanks, Mayor Patterson. And um, I, I do appreciate what Councillor Bohm and um, uh, Hill have just said as well. I think the 
I don't wouldn't want to see something implemented uh, right away, but I do think that because we are asking staff to develop a pro public nuisance bylaw, that's reasonable. We understand the situation. It is, it isn't a little bit of a problem. It's a big problem. So um, I, I, I trust staff will 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 develop a, a, a proper bylaw and uh, and keep it narrow enough, and also that would be successful in eliminating the the in the concerns that we have. So it's it's a good idea to start now, and then we get to choose uh, in in the in the time ahead. I, I'm not sure how much time will be required to produce this, but you can ask that. And thank you. I'll support this. Okay. Thank you. Next is Councillor Hutchison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, to the city solicitor, do you have any parallels with the public nuisance bylaws and the begging laws? Because this came up about mm, more than a decade ago. Probably. Councilor Hutchison, we're having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. So I, I don't think that we heard what you said. You wanted to compare the, nuis the public nuisance bylaw with which? Right. I'm wondering why you can't. You heard me all the other times, so I'm kind of wondering. I'm, I'm trying to figure that out. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. It's just your volumes. It's just the volume is down a bit. Okay, let me try. Yeah, if you could, if you may put your microphone up a little bit. Can you put your microphone up a little bit closer to your mouth? Oh, that's what the problem is. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Sorry, I had to leave, and then when I put it on, I didn't put it back in place. Thanks. So, um, okay, so. These two things are often uh, connected, uh, and I'm wondering if the solicitor has any information on the begging, oh, begging. On public streets law. Okay, like so you're talking about like a panhandling bylaw. Is that yeah. what you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. uh, Miss Morley. Thank you, and through you, Your Worship. So there is uh, provincial legislation entitled the Safe Streets Act, which deals with specific forms of panhandling, uh, particularly aggressive panhandling and panhandling in specific locations. The city would not be looking at a ban on panhandling through a general public nuisance bylaw. Right. And is that not because it's particularly difficult to enforce? Thank you, and through your worship, correct. An outright ban on panhandling would certainly open the city up to constitutional challenges under the charter. That's what I thought. Okay, so I think it's difficult. Oh, there we are, back again. The, um, the We have to be really careful about public nuisance bylaws. I mean, really careful. This has a long, long history connected to vagrancy and... Um, and um, sidelining uh, different groups and social classes for that matter over time and going back oh, four or five hundred years at least and it's only being straightened out to some degree in the last century so um, I'm really reluctant to do this I think you know I can understand the concerns of the businesses and something needs to be done there but I think this is sort of the sledgehammer of all solutions. So we've had problems before and they come and they go. That's my experience. And, and uh, without impinging on people's uh, civil rights. So I, I'm, for those reasons, I'm not gonna vote for, not gonna vote for this, thanks. Okay, anybody else? Uh, Deputy Mayor Hill, will you take the chair? I take the chair and recognize you. Uh, thank you. A, a couple of questions of staff. Um, in developing a public nuisance bylaw, would there be public consultation involved in that process? CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and through, uh, through uh, Deputy Mayor, yes, absolutely. I anticipate that there would probably be months of engagement. This is going to be, uh, you know, a very uh, substantial uh, issue in the community. One way or another, people will have an opinion. So we would want to take the proper time. Okay. So I guess the way that I'm interpreting this, so, so I'm going to just be perfectly straight. First of all, I had real concerns with an anti-loitering bylaw as well. Because to me, that was targeting more an individual rather than, than behavior. So first of all, anything we looked at should be applied universally, 
right, to everybody. I think that's very, very important. Uh, the second of all is I think it depends on what are we targeting, right? There's lots of, some people might think that, you know, some behaviors are a nuisance, but they could create a stigma. They could create an unwelcoming environment. If we're talking about making an inclusive, welcoming downtown where everybody uh, feels comfortable, that should mean everybody. So in my view, I think, boy, if ever there was a case of the devil in the details, it's this one. So I think the consultation would be critical. I have no idea whether or not I would support this because I can't even say exactly what behaviors we would be looking at. I appreciate Councillor Stroud's comment about conflating the two issues. Well, quite frankly, that's up to us. So I think we should be on the record right now to say we are very, very, and I think I can speak for all council when I say this, very much in favor of an inclusive, compassionate community where everybody is welcome, where everybody uh, is welcome in and around the downtown. And so obviously we'd be very careful about what sort of things we're talking about targeting because if there's behaviors that make people feel unwelcome, then that's the sort of thing that we should obviously be able to have a conversation about. So what I see this is, this is not a recommendation to pass a uh, public nuisance bylaw. This is a recommendation to have a conversation as a community about what we can do to create that inclusive, welcoming environment. So only for that reason, I'm willing to support it. But I'm going to be on the record here. I'm open-minded. I'm not sure whether I will support it. But I think it's worth having the discussion, getting the feedback from the community, talking about what best practices are, and then seeing where we go from there. So for that reason and that reason only, I will vote to initiate that discussion, but reserve any judgment on what may come back. Thank you. I return the chair. Thank you. Councillor Neal. Just very quickly, I won't be voting in favor of this tonight. Uh, I have spoken to a couple of business people. I spend most of my disposable income downtown and I loiter there every day. So, so I spoke to a couple who basically said what the DBIA has presented is not representing our view or my view on this. So for that reason, um, I'm, I'm going to vote against. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Okay, uh, Councillor Hutchison, go ahead. I'm thinking, this, unfortunately, this is one of those times when you're in the room, you could read the room, but I'm not. So um, I'm wondering if uh, we, I'd like to amend this. That's what I want to do. And um, so that the sentence that says that council direct staff develop an anti lawyering lawyering bylaw is changed to and this is short so i think this clerk should be able to do this direct staff to consult with the public on the possibility of an anti lawyering loitering bylaw so Councillor Jason, do you mean public nuisance bylaw because we've but already changed that I'm, I'm just reading though what the text actually says but sure public nuisance Okay so, like. okay, so I'm just going to just summarize, and uh, the deputy clerk is typing very quickly here. So we're talking about an amendment that would say uh, that council directs staff to consult with the public on the, I'm, I'm sorry, what was the next word? On the, Possib on the possibility. Possibility. Mm -hmm. of a public nuisance bylaw. Okay, so I'm just going to let the I'm just going to let the deputy clerk uh, type it out and then we'll put it up on the put it up on the screen. Okay. So, so this is the motion to amend by Councillor Hutchison. Uh, so it would read, 
Instead, the council directs staff to consult with the public on the possible development of a public nuisance bylaw as described in report number 22-205. Okay. I need a seconder, so. Okay, is there a seconder? No seconder? Okay. Then, uh, sorry, Council Hutchison, uh, there's uh, nobody, uh, no, nobody that uh, wants to second your amendment. Okay. Somebody may be crying. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> I did what I could. Okay. All right. Is there is there anybody else that wishes to uh, to speak to this? Okay. So we'll we'll call the vote. All those in favor. Opposed. Okay, so that passes by a vote of six to five. If, if I can just get the five of you to just put up your hands. So Councillor Stroud, Councillor Osanic, Councillor Neal, Councillor Holland, and Councillor Hutchison opposed. Okay, now we've moved to the final two paragraphs which uh, we should deal with in tandem. So this is a recommendation to, um, to amend the streets bylaw. Councillor Holland. Hi, I am sorry. I thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have an amendment. Um, I think I can be quite brief with this one. Uh, so essentially it's replacing the previous clause that referenced the streets bylaw with this one. And the rationale for this is that uh, we have had a little bit of discussion about shopping carts this evening and we've heard from uh, and other structures, we've heard from members of the public as well that they thought, similar to the conversation we just had prior to this, that they thought that um, initiating something like this demonstrates a form of discrimination, a uh, form of criminalization, or um, at the very least just not not being um, sensitive to the needs of unhoused individuals in the, in the city. So the challenges that the downtown improvement plan did have uh, a recommendation to in, to have a bylaw that would restrict um, these structures and shopping carts and so that needs to happen that that uh, has been approved by council already uh, when it when the plan came forward in March however uh, this is essentially delaying the 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 decision or, or the, the final decision on that. Um, and the idea is that over the next few months, while I know that businesses uh, would, would really like to see action on this immediately, uh, I do think that taking the, the next few months to get more information uh, and to see what has, if there are any changes in the situation that have come about based on all of the the um, proposals that we've made tonight for new housing options and services. So I think a few months wait on this is, uh, is reasonable and uh, the benefit is that we get to um, just, you know, as we've moved along this evening, we've gone from um, having essentially conversations about a sanctioned encampment to having a protocol that is in place to really, you know, moving in this direction to remove people's property uh, or restrict their property on, in the public spaces, um, I think is, is going a little bit far and I would like to see us take some more time and have a, a longer conversation on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is Deputy Mayor Hill. Thank you, Worship. And just, uh, I, I can't support this and it's largely because this is such a huge issue with the Downtown Business Association. I think it's a huge issue across the city in terms of shopping carts being taken. I mean, it, this is private property. It, it, it makes no sense that council would, uh, in effect, endorse the theft of private property from businesses. But beyond that, you're also looking at a situation where uh, these are being used for uh, to, to create uh, structures, uh, to live in on 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 the main streets, I what I witnessed to uh, two two folks that were passing each other with these carts have a cart fight in front of Morrison's restaurant one day because there was they had so much stuff overflowing on them they couldn't get by each other. So you know that 
<clears throat> the, the downtown business uh, folks have really indicated that this is a significant problem. It's one of the more immediate solutions to some of the issues that they're dealing with. I think you did hear from the uh, chair of, or from the executive director of the Downtown Business Association that they would even look at other options to assist uh, with folks being able to get their belongings around, like two-wheel carts, that sort of thing. But that uh, the, 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 the shopping carts are a, a very significant issue for the business people in the downtown. So I, I don't think uh, I would be able to support this amendment. Thank you. Can, can we just uh, put it back on the sc screen for a moment? Because I apologize, I didn't actually read through it. So, so just so everyone's clear, so this is a motion to amend, moved by Councillor Hall and seconded by Councillor Neal, that would replace clauses 13 and 14 with that council directs staff to provide options to address shopping carts and other structures on public highways and to present the proposed bylaws to council for consideration on November 10th, 2022, concurrently with any data collected from new housing initiatives in the downtown improvement plan. Okay, so um, next on my list is Councillor Stroud. Okay, uh, we need some more clarity on this because uh, I agree with Councillor Hill. It's, uh, it's the circumstantial evidence certainly points to theft of, of a private property when someone is in possession of a shopping cart because I, to my knowledge, I don't think you can buy a shopping cart in a store anywhere, not even at Princess Auto. So I'm gonna go to Ms. Morley, our city solicitor with a question. If obviously, theoretically, uh, the individuals in possession of stolen property, if the owner of that property makes a complaint to the police and the police choose to investigate, it, they could theoretically be investigated for theft. Is that correct? Ms. Morley? Through your worship, theoretically, yes, that is correct. Okay. It's probably more like in practice, they've got bigger fish to fry, right? Uh, the second question is about a different law. Is there not in the Highway Traffic Act a law about obstruction of the right of way with any vehicle, whether it's a, a shopping cart or a trailer or a car or a motorcycle or anything like that? Ms. Morley? Thank you, and through your worship, the obstruction of, of sidewalks is generally dealt with in municipal streets bylaws as opposed to under the Highway Traffic Act where you're not actually impeding the flow of traffic in any way. Right, so it's not subject to the Highway Traffic Act because it's not a drivable surface, but it is in the municipal, it, it is in the right-of-way, it's in the municipal, I mean the roadway and the sidewalk is the same right-of-way, right? But it, the, the restrictions on like idled, idled or stalled vehicles and all that is just in, in the navigable section of the roadway, is that correct? Through your worship, yes, the, the sidewalk does comprise part of the public highway, but it is a provision of the Municipal Act that deals with the ability to remove or impound any prohibited objects or vehicles on or near a highway. Right, and so we don't have that provision in our municipal bylaw right now, uh, just a general provision without targeting shopping carts? Through your worship, the streets bylaw does currently have a provision that prohibits individuals from obstructing the use of the sidewalk. Uh, through our experience, enforcement officers have interpreted this as being quite vague in that obstruction uh, suggests a total blockage of the sidewalk as opposed to just merely impeding pedestrian flow or affecting mobility and safety. Right. I would say this is a very crucial point because if we want to avoid the stigmatization, again, of our least fortunate citizens, as was done by some of the delegations, inadvertently by targeting this preferred mode of transport of, of their belongings. We, ought, let's, let's, we gotta say it, we know why they have shopping carts. It's because all of their belongings in the whole world fit in that shopping cart. And if they leave them at their encampment site or wherever it is that they're staying outside, they will, they, they, the others will steal their belongings. Uh, every single one of them will have stories about this if you've ever talked to them. So, um, so that's the, the utilitarian purpose of the shopping cart. And by targeting that vehicle, that inanimate object for, uh, for you know, by a, by a targeted bylaw like this would do, um, and even if it's a, 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 coming back in a report as is suggested by this amendment, it still is by association stigmatizing these least vulnerable citizens. Uh, and I would suggest that what we ought to be doing is enforcing our streets bylaw that already pre uh, prevents, that already has language to prevent 
obstruction of the sidewalk. I, if I'm, if I can't, if I got my baby in a stroller and I'm going down the sidewalk and I can't get through because someone's there and they're always there and I can never get through, that's obstruction of the sidewalk and that should be enforced. We don't need a new bylaw to do that. We just need enforcement of the current bylaw. So uh, I would, I guess I would ask the solicitor one more time, what would it take short of actually amending the streets bylaw to get our bylaw enforcement to keep our sidewalks uh, clear for, the, for their intended use, which is uh, mobility by pedestrians. Ms. Morley. Thank you, and through your worship, if council was not amenable to a specific shopping cart bylaw, then I would propose a further amendment to the streets bylaw to clarify what is meant by obstruction, because right now it is being interpreted as requiring complete obstruction and the inability to pass through. Whereas there are safety and mobility issues that come out of interfering with use of the sidewalk, maybe not entirely, but limiting use of it. Okay, can we have the amendment back up on the screen, please? So as I was saying, the way that you avoid discrimination in a bylaw is by, is by not, uh, not going after a specific target with an outcome in mind, but rather by uh, trying to prevent a harmful behavior to which everyone objects. So everyone objects to obstructing the sidewalk because everyone uses the sidewalk. It doesn't matter whether it's a shopping cart, uh, a hurdy-gurdy by a busker, or a, you know, a temporary stall by a jewelry salesman. It doesn't matter what the obstruction is. If someone uh, can't get through, they can't get through, they can make a complaint. It should be enforceable. So I would say that if we don't target the shopping cart, we take that out of there, we, uh, all those uh, comments from the members of the public are dealt with, uh, that, we're, that we're unfairly stigmatizing those who choose the shopping cart to hold the, all the belongings that they have in the world. So, to address shopping carts and other structures on public highways, and to present the proposed bylaw to council for consideration, I would, I would like to amend the amendment uh, to insert the language uh, after present the proposed I would just say the simplest way to do this is to, to replace the words shopping carts and other structures with just a more general term to address obstructions on public, on, it's not even public highways, it's, so, it's sidewalks, right? Okay, so I don't, I don't think that this motion to amend is ready to go. It is ready to go. Well, I'd like to replace shopping carts and other structures with 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 the word obstructions. Take take out the reference to shopping carts and replace it with obstructions. Okay. With obstruction, seconded by Councillor Carley. Okay. And by doing so, we remove the stigmatization of the shopping cart, and we fairly apply a bylaw, or get a draft bylaw to consider that would fairly. Uh, address any obstruction of the, of the sidewalk, whether it's a shopping cart or anything else, uh, it would, that way we can't be accused of discrimination. Okay. Mr. Deputy Clerk, do you have that? You're just working on it? Okay. Well, it, it, it doesn't really make logical sense to say obstructions and other structures. So I would remove and other structures as well and just put obstructions. Okay. It should be uh, obstructions, plural. So, yeah. Okay, so if everyone's clear, so, so Councillor Stroud, uh, seconded by Councillor Kiley to replace shopping carts and other uh, obstacle, whatever it was, other stuff uh, with uh, obstructions. Okay, <laughs> so so only so only on the motion to amend the amendment. 
So this is only debate on going from shopping carts and whatever it was, other structures, thank you, to obstructions. Okay, uh, Councilor Holland. Thank you, I'm gonna to try to be really quick. So I support this. The, the reason I chose the other words, this was obviously the intention of the motion to begin with, uh, but the, the, I chose those words because I mentioned the downtown improvement plan um, specified certain, uh, I, I thought that the wording was specific in that and that we had to use those, but it, it turns out that it's not. Um, so I think there isn't any problem Thank you. Uh, thank you. Next is Councillor Neal. Just very quickly, all this debate about shopping carts may become mute. The Shoppers Drug Marts have these, if you get farther than 10 paces away from their store, the wheels lock. And, uh, and given the price of shopping carts, that may become uh, the new norm. Thank you. Councillor McLaren. Thank you to staff. With this new wording, how would you interpret um, businesses who have A-frame advertising, patios, and or work that the city might be doing on a sidewalk to fix a sidewalk? Ms. Morley. Thank you, and through you, Your Worship, we had actually addressed this in the proposed amendments to the streets bylaw because it did apply to all structures. We included specific carve-outs for patios that have been approved by the city, any obstructions placed by the city, um, as well as any permitted encroachments on the sidewalk that were authorized by the city. So in other words, those would not be affected by this change in wording? Correct. We would apply the same carve-outs to a general obstruction provision. Thank you. Councillor Carley. Thank you, and through you, it says public highways. Do we know that we mean sidewalks? Sorry, I missed that earlier. Thank you, and through you, Your Worship, I was being overly legal. Uh, the sidewalk forms part of the public okay, highway sorry. at law. Yeah. So Thank it you. would include sidewalks. Okay. Okay, anybody else on the amendment to the amendment? All those in favor? Opposed? That carries by a vote of uh, 10 to 1. Deputy Mayor Hill opposed. Okay, so now we're back to the motion to amend as amended, which now says obstructions. Uh, further discussion? Deputy Mayor, would... So now we're, we're back to the motion to amend with your amendment. Right, so just to the regular, to the amended amendment, do we have that to, for the screen? So that's uh, to come back in November, right? November, right. So, proposed by a lot of council for consideration November 10th. Okay, so that's our, that's our first meeting in November, uh, a draft bylaw about obstructions, yes. Okay, there's nothing more to say, thank you. Deputy Mayor, take the I chair. take the chair and recognize you. Thank you, so I guess first I have a question to the original mover of the motion to amend. It's very prescriptive. It says to present the proposed bylaws to council for consideration on November the 10th. And I'm just curious to know, like we don't normally do that. Normally we say like, you know, just have council report back. Like is there something that happens like on November the 10th or I'm just, I'm just asking, not to be funny, just is there some rationale for November 10th or? I'm really sorry, but it was, it was, um, I have to say that it wasn't my decision, actually. Uh, I first was thinking November because that was the, the date of the pilot, and then when it turned out that uh, we really just needed the information, we just needed, I was trying to align with the dates of the pilot, but now that we're not talking about the encampment pilot any longer, I don't, it's, it's sort of irrelevant, the date. Okay. Would you like to offer a friendly amendment, Your Worship? Well, I mean, I guess I guess I'd, I would ask staff, how long would it take to investigate this and then bring it back, bring it back to council for discussion? I mean, if it can happen sooner. Ms. Your Worship, I guess that's me because I'm the drafter and. Uh, I think we've done a lot of the work already as it relates specifically to shopping carts and to sort of scale it 
back to be more general wouldn't be that much more work. So November would be feasible for us. Okay. But potentially it could come back before November if you've already done most of, most of the work. I guess I'm just trying to allow for staff to bring it back to council earlier if, if that work is done, that's all. Through your worship, we would absolutely bring it back as soon as we felt like it was ready and I anticipate that that would be before November. Okay. So I scold people for doing this, but I guess, <laughs> what should I do? <laughs> should I say a motion to amend? Okay. Can I, can I see, can I see the amendment, please? Would you like to do a friendly amendment? Because I think the oh, mover would, would I would love to do that. a friendly amendment if, <laughs> if, if, if Councillor would like. Hold on one second. Okay, the clerk has offered a very, very helpful suggestion. My friendly amendment would be to change the word on to buy. Okay. The so mover of saying the mover accepts the amendment. The friendly <laughs> amendment. Okay, we'll take that as a friendly. So it would read to council for consideration by November tenth, twenty twenty-two. So it allows for something earlier. Okay. Thank you. I return the chair. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the motion to amend? Point of order, uh, point, point Deputy of Mayor. Order. Deputy Mayor, you still have the chair until we vote on the amendment to the amendment. Oh, it was a friendly, no, so we don't true. vote? Is that what? We don't vote. That's right. Yeah. Okay, it was sorry. a friendly That's amendment, right. yeah. That's right. Okay, so we'll call the vote then on the motion to amend. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, and that carries. Okay, so... All right, so we've effectively have replaced those two paragraphs with that additional paragraph. Okay, so now we'll move to clause two, um, 805 Ridley Drive, West Wing Interim Use and Development Plan. Councilor Carley. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Through you really quickly, I just wanna say as the district councilor, staff have done a tremendous job reaching out to residents on other uses for the site. And I trust that through that continued engagement, that the district will get behind it as they have for other projects. So I think that we should support it. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, uh, Mr. Clerk, can I see you for a moment? Okay, so uh, so now I will ask for a motion to rise from Committee of the Whole and, uh, and have the clerk report. So we'll, we'll need a mover and seconder. Okay, so moved by Councillor Stroud, seconded by Deputy Mayor Hill. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. So what we're moving is the uh, the first report with the recommendation as amended, and the second report with the recommendation as presented. Okay. So, so Mr. Kirk, I don't think that your mic microphone is working. So just so everyone heard that. So now we're going to call a vote on clause one as amended in committee of the whole. Now we are voting as council. Moon clear. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Now we will vote on clause two as approved by Committee of the Whole. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, uh, now we will move to new motions. We have one new motion. Um, actually, Deputy Mayor, could you take the chair and Yep. Moved by Mayor Patterson, seconded by Deputy Mayor Hill, whereas Canada Day 2022 is an opportunity to bring the community together in celebration, and whereas the City of Kingston will host Canada Day community events at the Kingston East Community Centre, Brito Heights Community Centre, and Woodbine Park, and whereas the City wants to remove barriers so that as many members of our community can participate in Canada Day events, 
Therefore, be it resolved that free Kingston Transit will be provided to all passengers at no charge on Friday, July 1st, 2022. Any discussion? Councillor Sani? Thank you. Um, I totally support this. I just want one question to the mayor. So there's no parade this year, but there is the civic ceremony at 12 o'clock in front of City Hall where the civic awards are given out. That's right. So there is a civic ceremony. There are three different Canada Day celebrations happening in different areas of the city. So Woodbine Park, Rideau Heights Community Centre and the Kingston East Community Centre. So certainly encourage everybody to come out and to, to, to celebrate. And then of course we'll have fireworks in the evening. So. And free transit. I support and free this. transit. <laughs> Any other discussion? We'll call the vote. All those in favour? And that's carried unanimously. Return the chair. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Uh, are there any notices of motion? Nothing else? Any other business? Uh, Mr. Deputy Clerk, ask for bylaws, please. Moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Osanic, that bylaw three be given its first and second reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Osanic, that bylaw three be given its third reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Motion to adjourn, please. Moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Neal. All those in favor? Opposed? And we're adjourned. Thanks very much, everybody.